What's up, guys? It's yo boy Omnisensei back with, Reborn as Thor in High School DXD. Record of Ragnarok XDXD. Part 3. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing to the channel. Like the video, share, and leave a comment. This really helps with the algorithm. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Also, I have set up a Patreon account, consider joining to support the channel. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Location. Nearby Yamhamela Albar Al Mayyid, Dead Sea. POV. Third person. The Dead Sea is well known to mortals due to the almost absence of life in its waters, which results from a large concentration of salt. About ten times higher than other oceans. But it wasn't just that the people who live close by obviously knew that the sea was not a good source of resources. However, there was a river that flowed into the Dead Sea, that had resources such as fish and drinking water. The river had its source on Mount Hermon, crosses Lake Hule, and then flows to the Sea of Galilee, only then to empty into the Dead Sea. That river was the Jordan River. For the people who lived nearby, this was one of the rivers that were essential for the existence and prosperity of settlements. Although the Dead Sea was still considered a place that should be avoided at all costs by mortals. But it wasn't just for lack of resources the reason was simple. This sea was home to a creature that ravaged the region. The creature was described as a mighty seven-headed serpent that issued fire from its mouth and brought chaos and death to everything around it. For the supernatural world, this creature was not classified as a simple serpent, for the other supernatural beings, this creature was feared for being something else a dragon. And not just a low-ranked dragon, but a dragon king. Although in the present time there were several dragons with the rank of king, it was more of a title of sorts. The reason for this was quite simple actually there was a consensus in the supernatural about the race of dragons. They were represented as one of the most powerful creatures, and they represented power, after all, they were created from large masses of energy, and acted freely and selfishly. Although they are considered free-spirited creatures and act according to their desires and ambitions, it is a fact that they have a sort of ranking within the species. After all, if they are creatures that represent power, then they are creatures that only respect one thing power. Officially, the ranking of dragons was divided into a few rankings, some of which were Low-class dragons are represented by dragons considered to be the weakest, and are strongly linked to the elements. The fenugreek species Earth dragons are a good example. High-class dragons are technically the strongest dragons among the lower class, but with more skills and raw power. The Earth dragon of the Gakia and Araba species are the most common examples. These two ranks are the lowest as well as the most common found in the supernatural world. And then there are the dragons of a certain rank that impose order and respect on both lower class and upper class dragons. King class. Currently, they are Tiamat, the Chaos Karma Dragon, and the strongest King class dragon. Even after her battle with Enlil, which split Tiamat's power in half forever, she was still considered the strongest dragon king. Yamada no Orochi. The Penance Dragon, the King class dragon that is about to belong to the other rank due to its habit of demanding sacrifices. Quetzalcoatl. The Dawn Dragon is also recognized as a deity by its pantheon, in addition to being a confrontational maniac and great defender of humans. And then there are the Dragon King Brothers of the Seas, who shared the same territory. Aoguang, the Eastern Sea Dragon. Aokin, the Sea Dragon of the South. Auron, the Sea Dragon of the West. Aoshun, the Sea Dragon of the North. And these brother dragons were living in a territory quite close to another Dragon King. Vritra. The Prison Dragon, and Indra's sworn enemy. There was also the youngest dragon to achieve King Class. Tannin, the Meteor Dragon. Another Dragon King would be the only dragon that lived in the far north of planet Earth. Jormungandr, the Sleeping Dragon, the biggest dragon in existence and called the Dragon of the End, as well as having as its greatest characteristic its personification the weight of the world. This king lived in peace and tranquility in the north of planet Earth, until something happened to make him disappear. In fact, no one knew where Jormungandr was now located. The supernatural world was alarmed that the king-class dragon that represented the weight of the world, seemed to be hiding from something or someone else's. And finally, the last known dragon king. Loden, the Dragon of Fury. Considered the most mysterious dragon of all. Besides the king class there was another class that was known as another title among dragons. Evil Dragon. A title that was reserved for those dragons who are considered the most vicious and brutal of all dragons, all being dangerous battle maniacs who want to destroy everything, including themselves. Nidhugur was one of the few dragons to hold that title. The king class dragon, Yamada no Arachi, was almost gaining the title of evil dragon, and losing the previous title of king class, due to recent actions of taking pleasure in mortal sacrifices. That was a brief summary of dragon rankings and titles. 
But then there was another thing this race had that almost threw the power ranking out the window the danger was due to the creation of the dragon race. One cannot simply concentrate large amounts of unstable energy and expect no side effects to occur. The dragon's wrath was one such effect. It is a serious mistake to enrage a dragon of any level, be it a lower rank or higher rank dragon, as it can cause destruction and mayhem. Loden was a king-class dragon. The dragon of fury. Easily irritable, and does not like to be disturbed. So it was common knowledge that Loden was hiding somewhere, and avoiding being bothered by anyone. The Dead Sea was their resting place. And no one in their right mind would be foolish to anger the fury dragon. Drown in worms and kill in time nothing too ambitious she ain't even thinking about what's really going on right now, but I guarantee this memory's a big un, and she thinks we're just fish and she's already hmm, what was the next part? Someone questioned, in a small canoe, with a fishing line. It was Thor. The Norse god had been there for some time, waiting for the hook of his fishing line to catch something. The thunder god was fishing in the Dead Sea due to legends from the people who lived in that place about the seven-headed serpent. But it was already getting tedious. And his songs were already running out due to memory loss. In fact, the memory loss itself was bothering Thor, for the simple reason that it was weird. Do not misunderstand it was not a strange thing for the gods to forget things, if they have no association with knowledge, it was considered normal. Even because the gods were like humans to a certain extent. The gods are hungry, they can be deceived, they are angry, they love, they hate, they have sexual desire, and just like a human being who forgets something in a short time, the gods forget things as the years pass. Thor still remembered much of his childhood in Asgard, not all of it, but just the important parts, like when he met Hel, Fenrir, and others, as well as his fun time on Utgard. It was the one from his previous life that was fading most quickly and completely. It was like a written sheet turning into a blank sheet. Someone was erasing his memory. Thor knew something was wrong. But, as Thor had some knowledge about runes, a temporary solution was made. A memory rune that was invisible and located on the back of his neck, which had a function similar to a pensive, to protect his remaining memories. But while it may have saved some parts of the memory of his previous life, not everything was saved. For Thor, this was no coincidence. Someone has erased his memories of his previous life. And if there was anyone that Thor was suspecting, it was the cycle of reincarnation. After all, reincarnation was something that occurred in the supernatural world with some beings, humans being an example. But gods? It wasn't necessarily considered reincarnation, but rather avatars, which was basically a weaker version of the original body. Avatars functioned as new bodies for the gods. Vishnu was well known for using avatars to interact with humans. When the avatar was born, the original body went into a kind of coma until the avatar's death. Although they are two different things, both processes were under the jurisdiction of a single being Samsara. When I find you, top 10 or not, you'll have some explaining to do with me, said Thor, whispering with a frown. As Thor thought about Samsara's possible action, time passed faster than expected. Until night came. You know what, I got tired of waiting. Shouted Thor. At no time did Loden take the bait. If Loden doesn't want to leave peacefully, Thor will force him to leave. The Norse god then raised his fist and pointed towards the sea and shot lightning. The seawater glowed blue until the glow disappeared. Splash roar a creature's roar resounded through the night on the Black Sea. It was without a doubt, Loden. Thor just looked at the creature and he remained silent, the Norse god seemed to be thinking about something as he faced the king-class dragon. That's when the seven-headed serpent looked in Thor's direction and stared at the Norse god. Are you a god who dares to awaken us? Are you not afraid of death? After all, I've killed many gods who dared to bother me, but you seem calm have you accepted your fate? Ask one of the heads, with a curious tone. Thor, however, gave an answer that sent a shiver down the king-class dragon's spine in fury. I may seem calm but in my mind I'm choosing the best way to kill you, too many options you know? Asked Thor, with a sarcastic smile. Loden was obviously infuriated by the arrogance shown by Thor. Little did the fury dragon know that it wasn't arrogance it was confidence. You will be just another god I will kill. Roared Loden, launching himself towards Thor. Thor took out Mjolnir, which was attached to his belt, and lifted it with just his right hand. Come to me loot. I will make a new purse out of your skin to give to Hell for her birthday. Ha 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 said Thor. For a brief moment Loden was confused. What is a purse? But that thought soon faded when the battle began, and then a shockwave followed, as well as an earthquake, scaring most of the people who lived nearby. The people who lived nearby didn't know what was happening, they just thought the some god was in a bad mood, and was taking out his wrath on the land. When in fact, Thor was just looting? Location. Uruk. POV. Third person. Only a day had passed since Thor's departure in search of Loden, and Gilgamesh and Enkidu's departure in search of the creature of the cedar forest, with the face of a lion. Huawa. It was not late in the morning that the city of Uruk saw its king, returning victorious from his journey. Gilgamesh. 
Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh, cried the people of Uruk, who received their king who carried the decapitated head of what looked like a lion. Phew ha ha ha. Can you see that in Kidu it's like I told you before, that's how men achieve immortality by glorious deeds. Said Gilgamesh, shouting at the end as he raised the monster's head for the people of Uruk to see. Enkidu, however, looked uncertain. I don't know Gilgamesh. I think the gods may seek retaliation said Enkidu. Gilgamesh soon looked at Enkidu, confused. But it was you who told me to kill Huawa, said Gilgamesh. Enkidu promptly replied. Although I came up with the idea, it is you who are disrespecting the creation of the gods, as if it were a trophy, said Enkidu, a little annoyed. In a way, Enkidu could relate to Huawa. Although the creature is the son of Hanbi, an evil god, the creature had a mission given to him by Enlil himself to protect the forest from the cedars. Just like Enkidu, whose mission was to preserve the balance between men and beasts, as well as stop the tyrannical rule of Gilgamesh. For Enkidu, he and Huawa were servants of the gods. Although Enkidu agreed to kill Huawa, he disagreed with bringing the monster's head as a trophy. And you wanted us to just bury the creature and give up our chance for our names to be eternal? Meaningless. I promised you that even if death defeated us, I would make sure that we would never be forgotten. Said Gilgamesh, with conviction. Enkidu just sighed in resignation. Although he managed to change Gilgamesh, some behaviors of the former tyrant were still perpetrated. One of them was pride. If Gilgamesh made a promise, he would fulfill it, no matter the means necessary. Gilgamesh had promised Enkidu that they would be immortal according to human limits, and that was exactly what the king was doing. With the death of the terrible Huawa at the hands of Gilgamesh and Enkidu, the king of Uruk was sure that no one would forget their names for millennia. So, has Thor returned from his own journey yet? Asked Enkidu, looking at Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh responded promptly. Although Lotan is said to be a creature of the same rank as Huawa, it has become quite known for slaying gods, and is one of the feared but mysterious king-class dragons. Perhaps our friend might need our help, although he shouldn't, after all, since he's my friend, then he must be strong enough, said Gilgamesh. Enkidu seemed to stare at Gilgamesh in disbelief. After all, the king's logic was simple if he's my friend, then he must be strong. But though Enkidu wanted to speak, he thought of Thor and the clash between them that demolished Uruk's palace. Enkidu, being part animal, fully trusted in one thing. His instincts. And during the confrontation, Enkidu's instinct soared when he was fighting Thor. But because of the result, which virtually all of Uruk's people believed was a draw, Enkidu knew one thing Thor didn't fight seriously. In fact, Enkidu believed that Thor was just having fun. Enkidu kept that thought from Gilgamesh, as he didn't want to see the people Enkidu came to call friends fight again. It was then that Enkidu and Gilgamesh approached the courtyard of the rebuilt palace and saw something that surprised them Thor. Sitting on a severed head of what appeared to be a giant water snake. The Norse gods smiled at the sight of them. I thought you guys would take longer, I've been here most of the night, said Thor. One day. It took a day for Thor to travel to the predicted location, locate Loden, fight Loden, kill Loden, and bring back his head as a prize. And there was still plenty of time. Phew ha 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 As expected. But tell me, my friend, where did you leave the rest of Loden's body? Asked Gilgamesh, curious. Thor then looked away, before answering. Well. Let's just say the rest of the body isn't in good shape, said Thor. Location. Yamha Mela Albar Al Mayyid, Dead Sea. POV. Third person. Yishak was a simple man. He obeyed the rules created by his father and the father before him from the beginning of his family, and the rules were simple. Honor the gods. Love your wife. Defend your home. But Yishak wasn't prepared for what he was seeing by the gods, whispered Yishak, in disbelief. The man came to the Dead Sea the next morning to investigate, for in the night the sky roared and shone like never before in the place where according to legend was inhabited by Yam's servant. But when it arrived at the place, there was nothing else. Literally. The sea that once existed was no longer there. Though it could be seen that the river was continually bringing water to the site. But there was something else. In the center of where the sea was, there was a carcass that was more like a bloody pulp. The reason the carcass looked like a giant pulp bathed in blood was simple, the carcass was crushed. It was crushed to the point of looking like a mere stain on the earth. Baal be praised, said Yushak, in awe. Location. Uruk. POV Thor. Upon my return from my small loot I left the head outside my storage location for practical reasons. The parts of Loden's body that I didn't destroy ended up being placed inside my storage collar, which was upgraded during my stay in Uruk. Unfortunately, one head didn't fit and I had to carry it. It was somehow funny to see the people of Uruk reacting to me as I carried Loden's head with one hand. However, it made me want to upgrade my storage space on the necklace again. This time I'll leave a space of 5,000 cubic meters, it should be big enough for anything I want to store. I was currently attending the feast in the rebuilt ballroom of Gilgamesh, along with my party. It was then that I was caught by Hel, who looked at me. How was your adventure, cousin? 
Did you find what you were looking for? Asked Hal curiously. Sincerely? Yes, I replied. I will make good use of the loot. But I was a little disappointed. I honestly expected more from someone who held the title of King Class Dragon. There is little time left for my group to travel but this time I will go alone. There was only one thing I wanted here. Adapa skeleton, which must still be preserved somewhere buried in these lands. What I want to do is something simple. Gods can bring things to life if they have the right items. Create a human? It was child's play. But to create something else? Well, that depends a lot on the resources. I want to create a being capable of protecting my land while I am away. Fenrir is my guard dog. But Fenrir cannot effectively guard my house if he has to probe the territory around my house. Then I will create someone capable of that. And as a creator, I already have a good idea of what to do, and I have a perfect name. I will call my future creation Igris. Location. Yamham El Albar Al Mayyid, Dead Sea. POV. Third person. A lonely man could be seen in the place that was once the Dead Sea. This man could be described as having an extremely handsome appearance. At this moment the man was slowly approaching the rest of Loden's body, after Thor's fishing. What was left of Loden's body was so little that it was comparable to the carcass of a blue whale. I must say, it must have been an impressive fight for humans, said the man, seeing the destruction around him, and raising a magical barrier. When the man approached the rest of the body he raised a hand and created a magic circle. Soon Loden's body disappeared. Being teleported to the man's house. In the underworld. Sai I'm risking a lot by coming here early, but unfortunately due to Loden's sudden death, I had to act early. I just hope my lord doesn't notice my absence, said the man with a slight tone of concern. Do you really think one of my generals could just slip away unnoticed by me? Asked a voice. As soon as the man heard the voice, he couldn't help but freeze for a second, before turning and looking towards the source of the voice. El Lord Lucifer, said the man, in a weak voice. It was noticeable that the man was scared. The first Lucifer. The leader of the devil faction and race. Feared even by his own faction, due to his power and cruelty. There isn't a single devil that can compete with Lucifer at the moment. Although Lucifer and Lilith's son showed promise, he was still just a child compared to Lucifer. Still, Lucifer's child would be a force to be reckoned with in the future. Rizidim is a worthy heir, in Lucifer's words. Lord Lucifer, I deeply regret not having notified you of my absence, I thought the man said quickly, before being interrupted. Lucifer silenced his subordinate just by lifting a single index finger. Before you start with your apologies, answer the following question Leviathan said Lucifer. The man, now identified as Leviathan, was silent and nervously waited for Lucifer's question. It was then that Lucifer asked the question in an emotionless tone. Why haven't you kneeled yet? Asked Lucifer. It was then that Leviathan realized he was so surprised by the appearance of his leader, that he forgot the basics when he is talking to Lucifer. Respect the hierarchy. On your knees, said Lucifer calmly. It was then that Lucifer, using the index finger that was still raised, pointed downward. Immediately Leviathan felt the effect. Bam one of Lucifer's three generals was now lying on the ground, and he was being pushed down to the point where there were cracks around his body. To Leviathan, it felt like a mountain had fallen on him, and it was getting heavier and heavier and pushing him to the ground. Amid the pain imposed on his body, Leviathan still tried to speak, gritting his teeth. My lord, I beg you for mercy. I never meant to disrespect you. It was a foolish mistake. Said Leviathan. The devil faction general's request seemed to have gotten a reaction from Lucifer Fun. You forgetting to kneel I might even let it go with just a small punishment, because that I might consider a foolish mistake, but begging for mercy? It looks like you're determined to die today, General Leviathan, said Lucifer. Leviathan sank further into the ground. The underworld general seemed to have understood that he had made his situation worse. Never beg Lucifer for mercy. It is a sign of weakness. My love, if you kill every fool in the underworld then you won't have an army anymore, said a voice. Lucifer didn't even look at the source, as he already knew who it was. A beautiful woman, with horns adorning her head, approached Lucifer and hugs him. Lilith can't you see I'm busy right now? Go back home. I'm not on with this fool yet, when I hear his bones crack, only then I will consider stopping, said Lucifer, coldly. Lucifer was angry. And for good reason. One of the devil leader's generals had just tried to do something behind his back. For Lucifer, this was a sign of betrayal. I know you're angry Lucy, but think first of the devil faction before the actions of a fool, said Lilith, whispering in Lucifer's ear. Lucifer reflected in silence, and in that silence, Leviathan thought he would be executed. After all although Lilith is considered the voice of reason for Lucifer, she was not always successful in convincing her lover. A good example was the murder of Valifer by his own son, Dama Valifer. Lilith tried to convince Lucifer to kill Dama, however, Lucifer ignored the request as he saw potential in Dama. Dama was stronger than the original Valifer. 
And if there was anything Lucifer was looking for right now, it was strength, after all he was about to start a war against heaven. Hmm. Before my decision, tell me Leviathan why exactly do you want the carcass of a dragon king? And know that if you lie I'll give you to Stolas, he needs a test subject in his lab, said Lucifer, coldly, ceasing to point his index finger down, and releasing Leviathan in the process. Leviathan soon became nervous. Stolas. It is a well-known demon because of his power over gravity, matter manipulation, and telekinesis. But there was one other thing he was known for Lucifer's left hand. Responsible for the scientific division of the devil faction. And tasked with carrying out any experiment that will raise the power of the devil faction. Luckily, Leviathan knew Stolas well, and for good reason. My lord, I would deliver Loden's remains to Stolas. Said Leviathan hastily, getting to his knees. This seemed to have taken over Lucifer's curiosity. Oh. Do you mean Stolas knew about what you were doing? What audacity, maybe I'm getting too soft with the punishments for insubordination, said Lucifer, reflecting. But quickly Leviathan continued with the explanation. No my lord, Stolas doesn't know I wasn't going to notify you until I reach the underworld, said Leviathan. Lucifer only raised an eyebrow. Then continue your explanation, general and be brief, said Lucifer. Leviathan knew better than to stall in this situation, so he decided to explain in one simple sentence. I believe Stolas can retrieve the Loden bloodline for the devil faction, said Leviathan. This seemed to surprise Lilith. But how? Asked Lilith, not understanding. Lucifer replied to Lilith. Stolas had notified me a few years ago about a project the project was about cloning, the goal was to increase the number of my legions faster, to be able to match the heaven. But the project ended up being a failure due to the low success rate, plus the clone's life expectancy, power, and intelligence are extremely low, they wouldn't even be fit to be sacrificial soldiers, said Lucifer, in disgust. It was then that Lucifer looked at Leviathan. If you're going to use this failed project, you must give me a good excuse to spend resources on something that won't be useful in the long run, said Lucifer. Leviathan then replied. Although Stola's cloning project was the driving force, I thought that bringing the power of a dragon's bloodline might prove fruitful for the devil faction, my lord, said Leviathan. Ha ha ha. Ha 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 ha. As soon as Leviathan finished his explanation, Lucifer started to laugh. You were ambitious, that I admit. However, dragons are well known for the way they are created by unstable energy. But I must admit, your ambition was for my faction's benefit, so we'll do it like this. Capture any mortal, as long as it's a female, and take her to Stolas along with Loden's body, I'll be responsible for the final result, said Lucifer. Leviathan can only lower his head further. While the general wanted to dispute credit for the work, he knew it would be an even more foolish move on his part. However I am being generous. In return you will have descendants with the end result if all goes well, said Lucifer, with a smile. Leviathan did not like about that. But my lord, do you want to contaminate my bloodline with said Leviathan, before being interrupted by Lucifer again? Leviathan was lying on the ground again, with Lucifer pointing down. Did I hear you right? My bloodline? Remember what you are general. You are an instrument for my faction said Lucifer. Lucifer spoke coldly to Leviathan, while Lilith remained silent as she knew that whatever she says, Lucifer would not hear her. You gladly followed me to the underworld, I never tried to convince anyone to follow me in my rebellion. You, like thousands, have knelt and pledged allegiance to me, but at this moment your actions are questionable, General. I'm giving you a chance, but it's your mistake to think you have a choice, you will heed my order, General said Lucifer. Leviathan only responded weakly. Yes said Leviathan, gritting his teeth. Lucifer hasn't stopped yet. Yes what? Asked Lucifer, pressing even harder, causing some of the General's bones to break from the pressure he was feeling. Ark? Yes, my lord. Said Leviathan. As soon as Leviathan answered Lucifer once again stopped and soon made a magic teleportation circle. Remember General, you just have one chance, said Lucifer, before disappearing. Leviathan slowly got to his feet and just gritted his teeth in pain and pent up anger. As much as the General is angry with his ruler, he knew he could never go toe to toe against Lucifer. And if the General asked another devil for help, it was quite possible that Leviathan and his descendants would be extinct. Just like the House Argatanas. The House Argatanas were devils with the power of brainwashing, mind reading and memory erasure and stealing abilities, as well as the gift of invisibility. In short, they were the perfect spies. Too bad they decided to be double agents and work with Mephistopheles. When Lucifer found out about the betrayal, no one of the House Argatanas was left. An entire house was extinguished. And Leviathan definitely didn't want to be next. I need to get to Stolas as soon as possible said Leviathan, before making a teleportation circle to the underworld. Location. Uruk Gilgamesh's palace Thor's room. POV Thor. I had been living in the city of Uruk for some time. 
It was already night and, for the moment, I was alone and my room boredom was taking over me. It's only been a day since I returned from my successful fishing trip, and I was still looking for Adapa's burial site. Adapa was likely buried on the island of Dilman, so it would be my first destination tomorrow. My, my, hello, said a female voice. It was time for this woman to say something. She had been at the window for some time. I looked towards the voice and saw one of the most beautiful women in my life. Hello Loden Slayer, for slaying a dragon that has slain other gods, I suppose you deserve a reward a place on my bed sounds fair, don't you think? Said the woman. Yes I already knew who it was. I got up from my bed and walked towards the woman. POV. Third person. Inanna. Goddess associated with love, eroticism, fecundity, and fertility. A goddess who always got what she wanted. A goddess who dominated men and women who called her attention through pleasure. A goddess that was never denied. Until now. What do you think you're doing? Shouted Inanna, in indignation. At this moment she was being held by the leg by Thor who was at the window. When Thor heard Inanna's question, he looked at the goddess and answered. I'm throwing out the garbage, said Thor, with a smile. It was then that Thor dropped Inanna and let her fall to the ground. Thor's room was on the first floor of the palace. Thor then went back to his bed, hoping to get a good night's sleep. Do you think you can deny me like that? Said a voice, with an angry tone. Thor looked out the window and saw Inanna, this time floating. Oh right magic, said Thor, listlessly. Inanna re-entered Thor's room and said angrily. I am Inanna. Goddess of fertility, love, and eroticism. Dumuzid's wife. Daughter of Nanner. Granddaughter of Enlal. And do you dare to ridicule me by denying me this way? Who do you think you are? Asked Inanna furiously. For the goddess collector of men, such disrespect was never shown. The goddesses of love were the most beautiful of all the pantheons, and they had a very peculiar skill. The ability to arouse lust in all beings who looked in their direction. Inanna was recognized as a gatherer of men even among the gods for one simple reason. No matter who it is, if someone caught Inanna's attention, the goddess will take them to her bed, to alleviate her carnal desires. When Inanna got bored with a new lover, she would discard him and go looking for a new bed warmer. Thor just scoffed. Is it to say titles? All right then, I am Thor, son of Odin, strongest Norse god and vanguard of Asgard. There are more titles, but I don't see the need to share at the moment, said Thor, shrugging. Inanna then said calmly with confidence. I see, now shall we go to bed or not? Asked Inanna, crossing her arms over her full breasts. Thor just stared at Inanna. I'm going to my bed you're going to the door, said Thor, pointing to the bedroom door. Thor had his pride. The Norse god definitely didn't want to be known as another bed warmer to the goddess Inanna. Are you sure? Asked Inanna innocently. The Sumerian goddess approached Thor and pressed her breasts to the Norse god. Inanna was appealing to the Norse god's lust. However Inanna's plan didn't go as planned. Get out, said Thor, narrowing his eyes. Inanna just stared before sighing and slowly walking out of the room. She knew she couldn't fight this god to take what she wanted. For Inanna, it felt like Thor was on a par with her grandfather. Enlil himself. Sigh all right, all right, I'm leaving said Inanna, with a tone of defeat. Thor just watched the goddess leave her room before sighing and heading to bed, intending to sleep through the night. Outside Thor's room. Inanna just stood in the hall of the palace, thinking about what had happened. The goddess then made a magic circle and removed a piece of parchment. The scroll remained floating beside Inanna, even as the goddess began to walk. A note for my next job possibly encountered my first rejection, it was a Norse god, son of Odin, which I find strange seeing as I took his father into my bed once a long time ago. Maybe he has a preference for men? Unlikely, as my reliable sources say he slept with a woman from his group, said Inanna. As Inanna spoke words magically appeared on the parchment. First rejection by a god, god's name? Thor. Title for my next work, Lust Isn't Enough? Yes, that's a perfect title. Said Inanna, approaching a door. It was King Gilgamesh's room. Now, for my next work, the title will be Make a King Beg to Have You in His Bed. This one should be easy, after all, he's only immortal, and no mortal in their right mind would deny a god's wishes, said Inanna, with a confident smile. The soldier standing guard just stared at Inanna, mesmerized. Inanna just smiled at the soldier, who passed out due to his nose had bled too much. Inanna, seeing the result, just scoffed. Yes, very easy ahem hello, king of men said Inanna, opening the bedroom door, and smiling. The next morning, Thor was heading towards the dining area. While walking the Norse god was talking to someone through a communication rune. It was Odin. So there is still no news of the missing? Asked Thor. Unfortunately, even though I've assigned several search parties, no more signs of demonic energy have been found Sigh, it's almost certain that the bat must have already left Midgard, said Odin. Thor frowned. Do you think this devil was responsible for Dane's death? Asked Thor. Odin remained silent before answering. 
It's a possibility said Aden. For Thor, this could escalate into a greater conflict. After all, if it proves the devil had killed an Asgardian. However, we have no proof the devils can only claim they were passing through, and coincidentally were near Dane's Forge, which they did not know the location. We can't just accuse them devil, I don't want to bring another war as my last act as ruler of Asgard, before passing the power to your brother said Aden. Thor just nodded. Thor wanted the Norse pantheon to be neutral towards the three biblical factions to keep Asgard out of future trouble. But then, problems aside how is your stay with the Anunnaki, have you met Anna? Asked Aden with a knowing smile. Thor grimaced. Yes, I met the man collector, I threw her out of my room, said Thor. Aden looked horrified. You denied her, don't you know it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity? Asked Aden. Thor looked apathetic in the face of Aden's despair. Believe me, old man, I'm sure sleeping with an Anna isn't a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, said Thor. Aden disagreed. Did you see those tits? I would give my other eye just to enjoy those valleys again, said Aden. This time Thor was horrified. Again. Did you sleep with her? Asked Thor. After discovering such an event, Thor did not regret his decision. After all, what son would want to sleep with a woman who has slept with his father? But of course I slept with her. I was younger and as I hadn't met your mother yet, so I took my chance while I was visiting Ninurta, because he had asked me for a favor to help a mortal named Quim, said Aden, with a smile. Aden seemed to be reminiscing about old times, but Thor wasn't interested. Goodbye old man, thanks for sharing a little bit about your adventures. I guarantee I won't forget about your lesson said Thor, dryly. For Thor, most of Aden's actions boiled down to this. How not to be a god. Thor then turned off the rune and continued walking towards the dining room. Until it was interrupted by a tremor. Gaudu Gaudu, an earthquake? Asked Thor, confused. But Thor noticed something odd. The earthquake had the pattern of footsteps? Run from the monster. Run. This is the divine punishment. It's the creation of the gods. It's our end. Save us Gilgamesh. Thor only heard the noise of screams outside the palace. The Norse god just looked out the window and widened his eyes. Must be Mondays, said Thor. At this moment, on a collision course to Uruk, something was moving slowly, with each step creating an earthquake. The creation of the Anunnaki and one of the autonomous weapons of the Sumerian pantheon. The Sky Bull. Google Anna. POV Thor. Waking up in the morning and seeing a giant winged bull skeleton coming toward you, was a good way to change your routine. I mean, it wasn't the most normal thing in the world. Not because it was weird. After all, I am part of the supernatural world. But why was it something that changed my routine? I knew what it was. After all, Google Anna had a reputation. The gateway to the classification of the strongest beings. Occupying the 10th position along with other beings. In addition to being the only one in the top 10 not to have the ability to think for a simple reason. Google Anna is an autonomous weapon. The weapon that was created shortly after Enlil's sword of rupture. While I wanted to test my strength against this thing and possibly get into the top 10 with my win, there was one small quirk. This was not my fight. I don't have enough reason to defend Yurik. Besides, Yurik already had his protector. Do not fear my people. As I have already promised at the beginning of my reign, no one will harm what is mine. Said Gilgamesh. The people of Yurik seemed to hear the decree of King Gilgamesh, who was accompanied by Enkidu. It looked like Gilgamesh and Enkidu were going to face the creature. Oh. My friend Thor. Do you want to fight too? It will be a worthy fight that even the great sky father Anu will descend from the stars and honor you with the highest honor you deserve. Said Gilgamesh. I noticed that Enkidu stared at Gilgamesh in confusion. Wait you not we? And what about you Gilgamesh? Asked Enkidu. Gilgamesh just laughed before replying. Phew ha ha ha. My friend, you tell good jokes. I was already born with the highest honor, bestowed upon me by fate itself, how do you think I have such ability? Asked Gilgamesh, creating a white colored portal with golden strokes. This was something Gilgamesh always said when asked about something he considered superfluous. Fate bestowed him with power. And with each passing day. More and more I believe that fate is giving Gilgamesh a helping hand. My old man was one of the most perverted men I've ever met in my entire life, although I have not yet met Enki. And Enki had a reputation that compared to Aden well, by the rumors and stories, if I were to compare Aden with Enki in the perversion aspect, Aden would be a chaste virgin. Anyway, if there was anything useful that Aden taught me, it was one thing fate is absolute. The wisest of Asgard said so. Although I rarely take my old man seriously. I always listen to my mother Frigg. When I arrived in this world the first thing I saw was Frigg, she was a good mother. And she always told me about the stories of this world. I learned a lot from her. One of those lessons learned was about destiny. According to Frigg fate was not necessarily the strongest or the most powerful. The fate was absolute for good reason. The ability to define the fate of all living and non-living beings. Without a doubt, I was in the plans of fate. I really need to visit the Norns. 
I'm sorry Gilgamesh, but it's not my duty I'm neither king nor protector of the city. Also, I'm a god remember? I don't think the Anunnaki will let it go if I interfere directly, I said. It was a poor excuse. But it was the best I had at the moment. I understand my friend, it's a pity come on Enkidu, let's become a legend to men and gods. Said Gilgamesh. The king then ran toward Gugulana, with Enkidu following him. And in the palace, I stayed. Sitting and eating my breakfast brought by a servant. I wasn't the least bit worried, even from a distance it was possible to see that Gilgamesh and Enkidu were managing to make Gugulana retreat. As I had no reason to help, I just stood by as the king of Uruk, and his best friend fought a weapon created by the gods in a way, the sacred gear was the name of the weapons made by the god of the bible and given to humans, while the Gugulana was technically a divine gear. Of course, I knew that the sacred gears are already being created by the god of the bible himself. After all, there were already rumors of humans with supernatural abilities, but nothing of note. I suspected the big G was already granting humans that kind of power. But again would the Anunnaki miss the giant bull? The answer was too obvious definitely yes. However, if I'm right about Gilgamesh's ability bestowed by fate itself. Perhaps I can get my hands on Gugulana in the future, without needing to come into conflict with the Anunnaki. My, my were you waiting for me? Said a voice. It was a female voice, and for just a brief moment I thought it was Anana again. But as soon as I turned around, I was wrong even through it was woman it wasn't Anana. It's kind of unlikely for me to wait for someone I don't know who would you be? I asked. I was suspicious. She just gave me an innocent smile. You don't need to be so alert son of Aden after all, my son considers you a friend, my name is Ninsen, said the woman. Ninsen, the goddess of healing. I was immediately interested, after all she also has other interesting abilities. Oh. What did you come here for? Did you come to tell me my future? I asked. The ability to see into the future was one of those interesting abilities. Ninsen just kept smiling. You may already know, this ability of mine is not very reliable for a simple reason. I'm not one of the agents of fate, if I remember correctly, one of the Norns has the same power that I have, but I assure you that she is more reliable and powerful, Ninsen said. I just shrugged. It doesn't really matter if your ability is weaker or stronger, I just want an answer to my question, not an excuse, I said. Ninsen just stared at me. For a brief moment, I saw Ninsen's eyes gleam. And she froze in place. POV. Third person. Though in Thor's vision, the goddess Ninsen had frozen in place in Ninsen's vision, she went to another place, a place she knew all too well. The dimensional gap. Home of infinity and dream. And Ninsen saw Thor floating and bleeding. Thor's entire body was covered in blood, and it looked like he was unconscious. Ninsen also noticed someone else or rather, something else. It was a hideous creature, it seemed that the whole body had the characteristics of various animals, having seven necks, seven heads, with ten horns, as well as seven long tails, plus four stout arms and two legs that are even thicker than the arms. Its main body is that of a primate leaning forward and is covered in black fur, and what appears to be scales all over its body. Ninsen was fully aware that this was just a vision, and that this was not real and will probably never happen. But the goddess cannot think that if this creature, this beast, existed it would be the end of the world. The creature seemed to be just staring at Thor, waiting for something. It was then that Ninsen saw Thor open his eyes, not in fear not in determination but in acceptance. I'm sorry Lariti I'm going to be late for your birthday, said Thor. It was then that Ninsen saw Thor face the hideous creature. And start talking a chant. I, the one who is about to fight, will drown myself in madness in search of power, said Thor. One sentence. A phrase that made Ninsen break out in a cold sweat, and Ninsen suspected it was just the beginning of a chant before Thor continued with the chant. Hundreds of seals appeared. Forbidden stamps. And then a flash of light blinded Ninsen, and the beast had been sealed away, but Thor had fallen into a crevice created from the seals and the chants quote. Thor was gone. And then Ninsen blinked just once before realizing that her vision of the future was gone. POV Thor. Well you will disappear from this dimension, said Ninsen. What? What do you mean by that? Does that mean I'm going to die? I asked. Ninsen just shrugged. It's like I said, this power of mine isn't very accurate. I just saw a brief flash, you were fighting something a scary thing with seven heads, and then you started to say a few words, but suddenly hundreds of seals appeared, that was the last thing I saw before from the flash of light, Ninsen said solemnly. This was not what I expected fighting a seven-headed thing? To vanish? Was I? Sealed? No, Ninsen said disappear from this dimension, but then where did I go? Don't be too worried about it, what I said may not even come to fruition, Ninsen said. Ninsen's words snapped me out of my thoughts. I'm curious what do you want from me? I asked. Ninsen just stared at me and then looked at Gugulana who was being knocked to the ground. Sigh. I need a favor said Ninsen. I got curious. And what kind of favor would that be? I asked. 
Obviously, I wouldn't commit to a favor if it didn't do me any good. I hear you've already met with Thoth, I need you to convince him to help me with a small project at the behest of the god Marduk said Ninsen. Oh? The next leader of the Anunnaki? And may I know what project that would be? I asked. Ninsen flashed a dreamy smile. It will be the rebuilding of a ziggurat in Babylon, Marduk wants to make a different ziggurat, the purpose of the ziggurat is to bring men closer to the gods once again, for a reason cities, they are worshipping ill. Marduk sees this as an affront to the pantheon, Ninsen said. Bring men closer to the gods again. I thought you had already given up on this idea of bringing men and gods together, after Nereus's failure with the perfect city, Marduk wants to repeat the failure? I asked, scoffing at the idea. Atlantis, or the utopian city, has been built before and it was a failure. But Ninsen looked solemn. I know it sounds crazy, but we need to do something, otherwise our influence will be reduced, and we are not strong enough if there is a direct war against you. Not even Enlil, who is the strongest of us, can defeat him. So we need to look for another form of influence, and the best way is to enchant the ancient ziggurat that was built by the mortal Enmerker, the grandfather of Gilgamesh said Ninsen. I'm sure I could convince Thoth to help, after all the old bird is always interested in that sort of thing. And earning a favor from this goddess can be useful in the future. Very well, I will speak with Thoth. And I will call him this favor in the future I said. Ninsen smiled in response. Thank you, I won't forget that. Finally the foundation of heaven and earth will be rebuilt at Temenanki will no longer be a dream, said Ninsen dreamily. So that's the name of the ziggurat at Temenanki. Location. Underworld Devil's Territory. POV. Third Person. The underworld is quite similar to the human world, but with a much larger land masses there are no oceans, only lakes. In addition to the sky being purple during the day and night. In the midst of this place was a place that stood out from the rest. In isolation, there was a mansion in the middle of nowhere. Every devil feared this place, but not because of the mansion's appearance. But of those who lived in it at that moment there was someone who appeared from a teleportation magic circle in front of the mansion. It was Lucifer. And he was together with three other beings. The first was Lucifer's most trusted general, Leviathan himself. The second was Lucifer's right hand, Lord Lucifuge himself. The latter was quite similar to Lord Lucifuge, except for being considerably younger. Lord Lucifuge, remember that although there is a certain rivalry between you and Stolas, I hope you will maintain your composure, Lucifer said, looking at Lord Lucifuge. The older Lucifuge nodded quickly. Surely my king my son Sebastian, will also follow your orders, said Lord Lucifuge. The rivalry between Lucifuge and Stola was for a simple fact. Both were Lucifer's most trusted devils, and both had divergent beliefs and ideals. And so the little group entered Stola's mansion. Lord Lucifuge, you don't like Stola's for one simple reason arg. Screams could be heard throughout the mansion. Only Lucifer remained expressionless. Leviathan and the younger Lucifuge looked nervous. While the older Lucifuge had a disgusted expression as he knew exactly what was happening. As the small group, led by Lucifer, walked into the house, the screams intensified. However, another sound began to be heard. Um hum 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 hum, someone was humming through the screams of agony. Lucifuge frowned as the group finally found the source. Someone was lying and trapped on a table, and another being was standing next to that table. The being that was standing was the origin of the singing, while the one that was lying down arg. Please, let me go. I didn't do anything to you. He shouted the being that was lying down. The being that screamed in agony was easily identifiable as a fur-covered creature with only one eye on its head, and a large mouth full of sharp teeth in the region of its body, where the navel should have been. Oh. I knew you didn't do anything wrong to me however, that's not relevant. What I want to know is how humans transform into you, said the being standing next to the table wearing a kind of mask. This was Lucifer's left hand. Stolas. I don't know. I've already told you everything I know. The first shaman of my land cursed the forest, any elder who leaves the tribe on a full moon night, will be transformed into the same thing like me. Cried the creature in despair. Stolas seemed to consider. I see in that case, I must find out for myself, said Stolas, holding up a hand. Stolas' hand had blades for fingers. But before Stolas could continue with his action, Lucifer interrupted him. Stolas, you have other priorities at the moment, Lucifer said calmly. Stolas seemed to finally notice the presence of more people in his room. Master Lucifer. How of me, sorry for not receiving you at the entrance of my humble home, although the defenses of my house recognize you and your company, said Stolas bowing to Lucifer. The creature on the table also noticed the number of people and screamed in desperation. Please, help me. This monster is going to said the creature, before being interrupted. Stolas had raised his hand and closed it into a fist, resulting in the table in the room shifting at Stolas' command, and crushing the creature that was lying on it. Stolas then looked at Lucifer and just went back to talking. 
I'm sorry to hear such laughable words Master Lucifer, I like to hum to the rhythm of the screams, so I keep him awake and aware, it helps me pass the time while I work said Stolas, bowing again. Lucifer was unconcerned. Don't worry about it, I must say I've never seen such a creature I'm curious, what's its name? Lucifer asked. Stolas seemed to like the question. I don't have the specific name it was Dam of Alifer who captured him and brought him to me in exchange for some blood potions, according to young Balifer, the locals call it the Mappingwary, and it looks like these creatures were once human, Stola said excitedly. Lucifer just nodded. I see but then, how is the other project? Lucifer asked curiously. Stola seemed to quickly consider his words before replying. Loden's cloning was a success, however it will only be able to live for a single millennium at most, said Stola's. Lucifer frowned after all, that was a short time. Lucifer hoped he could use Loden's clone in the war he was planning, but it seems that wouldn't be possible, as Lucifer was just waiting for an opportunity, and that opportunity definitely wouldn't come in this millennium. Lucifer then looked at General Leviathan. Congratulations on your second marriage, General. Remember, our race is not that fertile, so I suggest you try more often, I expect a second heir of yours in at most half a millennium, Lucifer said. Leviathan soon knelt down. Thank you, my lord I will not disappoint you, said Leviathan. Although he didn't like the idea of contaminating his bloodline, Leviathan knew that it would be complete idiocy to go against Lucifer's wishes. I hope so, Leviathan or else your first son will have to assume the responsibilities of an heir a little sooner than expected, due to your unexpected absence, Lucifer said, narrowing his eyes. For those present in the room, the warning was clear fail me and you lose your head. Location. Uruk. POV Thor. A month had passed since Gilgamesh and Enkidu's victory over Gugulana. In the first week after the victory, something happened. Enkidu became sick. A fatal disease he ended up dying a week after showing the signs of the disease, Gilgamesh stayed by the side of his best friend for seven days and seven nights, until Enkidu gave his last breath of life well at least until I resurrect him with the magic taught by Thoth. Obviously, I would not let Enkidu die, as that would trigger Gilgamesh's quest for the plant of youth the same plant that was in my possession. However, my solution didn't seem to be definitive, since the next day after I had resurrected Enkidu, he got sick again and ended up dying again. And I ended up resurrecting Enkidu again. For the rest of the month that followed I practically resurrected Enkidu several times I didn't care, as it didn't deplete my divine power, so I was fine. But it was in the middle of tonight, at the end of the month, that things got a little interesting. For my father's sake, stop resurrecting him as guardian. Shouted my guest. This was Enu. The Sky Father and former leader of the Anunnaki before his son Enlil took the power. And right now, he was complaining to me about something trivial. But it was about me not letting Enkidu die from the disease Anu was causing. By Inanna's behest, by the way. Apparently, Inanna didn't like being refused by Gilgamesh again and being hit by Enkidu with a piece of Gugulana's body. Specifically, a piece of Gugulana's left hind leg. Yes, in short, Enkidu created baseball with a piece of Gugulana serving as a bat and Inanna serving as a ball. With all due respect, and why are you doing your great-granddaughter's bidding? You are more powerful, as well as holding more authority than her, you are the father of Enlil, so why are you obeying Inanna? I asked. After all, it didn't make any sense. Then Anu began to explain. For two simple reasons. First, Enkidu has just humiliated someone from the Anunnaki pantheon, this doesn't bring a good image to us, especially now with the increasing worship of humans to you, within our territory. The second reason is that Inanna is very dear to my wife, Kai, so said Anu, the last explanation being said with an embarrassed tone. So his wife, Kai, is blackmailing the husband, Anu, into following Inanna's will it's time to change the game. I just smiled at Anu and walked over and put a hand on his shoulder. I see come with me my friend, I will teach you what a thought is I said mysteriously. As I pushed Anu through the palace. Anu looked confused. You mean thought the god of knowledge? Ra's nephew? Asked Anu, confused. I just smile. No. But I assure you it will be a valuable lesson you will learn, I said. It will be an interesting conversation. Location. Zagros Mountain's entrance of the Kerr, Sumerian underworld home of Ereshkigal, POV Thor. Kerr was dingy. After all, the Kerr is basically several connected caves located deep in the soil of Sumerian territory, where the inhabitants were believed to continue a dark version of life on Earth. The only food or drink was dry powder, but the deceased's relatives poured libations for them to drink from time to time. Unlike many other afterlives in the ancient world, in Kerr, there was no final judgment of the deceased, and the dead were neither punished nor rewarded for their deeds in life. In addition to the souls of the deceased, the Kerr was also home to the descendants of Arali, the demons of the Sumerian world. I was here for one reason only. I came for Adapa soul. But first I had to find her. Although generally if the deceased is forgotten the soul will disappear, Adapa was a special case. 
After all he was the son of Enki. There was only one being who could help me find Adapa's soul. Ereshkigal. The owner of this place is called Kerr. My thoughts were interrupted as I saw my first destination the gates of the underworld. Stop right there. Who are you? Shouted someone. I turned towards the origin and saw someone walking towards me with an axe in their hands. I raised an eyebrow. I just want to talk with Ereshkigal. I came to ask her a favor I said, trying to explain. But it looks like this guy doesn't want to have a reasonable conversation. My beloved wants nothing to do with you, I am Nergil, the guardian of the seven gates, and I will not let you through, said the being, now identified as Nergil. I knew that sooner or later I would find this guy. After all, Nergil was the only god to disrespect Ereshkigal, it was only after Enki warned him of the power of the queen of the Sumerian underworld, that Nergil decided to apologize to Ereshkigal personally. However, no one imagined that Nergil would end up falling in love with Ereshkigal's appearance. Unfortunately, for Nergil, the sentiment was not returned. But he was still devoted to Ereshkigal. I just want to ask Ereshkigal for something, not you, I said. Nergil then approached and stood just an arm's length away from me. The goddess Inanna also wanted to demand to speak with Ereshkigal to have her husband, Dumuziti, back from the dead, Inanna thought her goddess status would help, but... Inanna arrived at Ereshkigal's palace completely naked, as she passed at every gate she was to give up something of value, by order of Ereshkigal. Now tell me how you expect to get through the gates if your god status is of no use here in the Kerr? Asked Nergil, mockingly. Nergil was taller than me maybe he has nine feet. And as a god of war, he was quite confident. Too confident then. I will ask you to please open the gate for me so I can have my talk with Ereshkigal in private, I said. Nergil stared in disbelief before acting. Ha 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 ha. Do you really think I'm going to open all seven gates out of goodwill, just because you asked, please? Do you know how to tell jokes, as guardian? Ha 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 ha, said Nergil, as he laughed. I remained expressionless. I never said you would open the gate out of goodwill I said. That seemed to stop Nergil's laughter before he looked at me. Location. Ganser Ereshkigal Palace. POV. Third person. Ganser's palace was no ordinary castle. After all it was located underground. So it was just the biggest cave in the entire Kerr. And in the center of Ganser was a woman, sitting on a throne and playing with a green fire between her fingers. The woman was the queen of the Sumerian underworld, Ereshkigal herself. She was in that moment, reflecting as she looked at the small flame in her fingers. Only in death do you realize that life is just an instant, said Ereshkigal. Ereshkigal, like most gods of death, lives in isolation from the other gods. There are few gods of death who still remain sociable with the rest of the pantheon. Ereshkigal just didn't feel the loneliness because of two beings. Husbishag, the secretary of Ereshkigal. And Namter, the Sumerian god of fate, the messenger of Ereshkigal and husband of Husbishag. The two were Ereshkigal's best friends, and they protected her from other beings, all was peaceful, until Ereshkigal froze and released the flame from her hands, because she had sensed a disturbance in her realm. The first gate was opened? Said Ereshkigal, confused. For Ereshkigal, it was confusing, after all, Nergil had orders not to open the gates to anyone except two beings, but it was not the time to open those gates yet. Which can only mean one thing. Someone broke through the first gate of Kerr. Ereshkigal, realizing the situation, frowned. It was then that someone caught the goddess's attention. Ma'am, we have a troublesome guest, someone said. That was Husbishag. As soon as Husbishag finished speaking, Ereshkigal felt a new disturbance. The second gate has been breached. It was then that a new voice echoed through Ganser. What is happening? I felt two earthquakes all over Kerr. It was Namter, one of the agents of fate and god of luck, as well as being the husband of Husbishag. As Ereshkigal and her allies thought about what was happening, just a few minutes later the third, fourth, and fifth gates were breached. Location. Kerr Sixth Gate. POV. Third Person. The gates of the Kerr only opened according to the will of Ereshkigal and the Kurds. And they remained closed the rest of the time. Boom the sixth gate was knocked down by the collision of something it was then that something started trying to get up from the rubble of the sixth gate. It was Nergil. Plea please, I've already apologized and said I would open all the gates for you, said Nergil. Nergil was completely wounded. It was then that someone walked through the sixth gate and approached Nergil, who was still trying to get to his feet. It was Thor. And I've already said that I accept your apologies. But I still prefer to use your body as a key to open the gates, said Thor, narrowing his eyes. The Norse god then raised his foot in a ready-to-kick position. Nergil seeing what was going to happen yelled quickly. Wait! shouted Nergil. But he was ignored and ended up being kicked by Thor for the sixth time in a row. Nergil's body crossed the entire area of the cave, from the sixth gate to the seventh gate. As soon as the body reached the seventh gate, the last gate was destroyed as did the six previous gates. The seventh gate was the entrance to the Ganser area, the home of Ereshkigal. 
As Thor passed through the seventh gate he saw three beings in the center of the cave, these beings remained silent, staring at Nergal's now unconscious body. It was only then that the woman, who appeared to be the leader, looked at Thor. I am Ereshkigal, ruler of the current ruler of the dead. May I know who you are, and why my only guard at the gates of the underworld lies unconscious at my feet? Asked Ereshkigal. Thor just explained calmly. My name is Thor and I came here just to ask you a favor, but it seems your guard wasn't very reasonable. So I asked him to open the gate politely, said Thor. Ereshkigal, as well as Namtar and Husbishag, looked surprised by Thor's response. Politely? Said Ereshkigal, looking at the unconscious Nergal and the seventh gate knocked to the ground. But it was Namtar who had a different reaction right after hearing Thor's name. Namtar had the look of recognition. Thor? So as you said Namtar. Thor looked at Namtar, confused. What? Have you ever heard of me? I've never seen you before, said Thor, frowning in confusion. Namtar seemed amused by the situation. Not exactly. As one of the agents of fate, I have friends in a few pantheons, your pantheon is one of them for Dandy doesn't like you very much, and Skull thinks you're funny for some reason, said Namtar. Thor was confused and afraid, after all, it seemed that the Norns were talking about him. Before Thor asked Namtar more about Narnas, Ereshkigal chose that moment to interrupt the conversation. You said you wanted a favor from me, what favor would that be? Asked Ereshkigal, curious. Thor then looked up to Ereshkigal and chose his words carefully. I'd like to ask Adapa Sol for said Thor, before being interrupted. No. There's a good reason the Kerr has known the land of no return, no soul should return to the world of the living beings. Said Ereshkigal. Thor knew this could happen after all the name Kerr is a short abbreviation of Kerr no Gia, which means exactly what Ereshkigal had said. The land of no return. Ereshkigal, I know this is a rather unusual request. However, I'd like to do it the right way, said Thor. This caught Ereshkigal's attention. What do I mean by the right way? Asked Ereshkigal, curious. Thor then smiled. I know that for the souls of mortals there is no judgment, only the supernatural is a fair judgment however, Adapa should be a special case, said Thor. Husbishak soon interrupted. And why would Adapa be special? Why is he the first human chosen by the gods of our pantheon? Asked Husbishak. Thor continued to smile. No for being tricked by accident. He shouldn't be judged as a human, but as a supernatural being, Thor said innocently. Ereshkigal frowned in response. What do you mean by that? Asked Ereshkigal. Thor then explained. I know that a long time ago, Adapa refused the gift given by Anu, which was the water and bread of life made from the plant of youth, and therefore Adapa refused immortality, however, there is a great mistake as it was unfair, said Thor. This made Husbishag, Namtar, and especially Ereshkigal more and more interested. And what mistake would that be? Asked Namtar. That was a question Ereshkigal was ready to ask as well. Simple Enki unintentionally caused Adapa to remain immortal, if Adapa had not obeyed Enki's instructions he would be immortal, and therefore there would be a judgment for a supernatural being, or there would not even be a judgment at all, because he would be an immortal, said Thor. This was one of the few pieces of knowledge Thor still had of his previous life, and Frigg had also expressed that this might have happened, but no one wanted to make amends, or no one knew. What Thor said made Ereshkigal nervous, because it meant Adapa shouldn't even be in the cur because of Enki's mistake. An error. Ereshkigal's first possible mistake. And for a goddess who took pride in her work as ruler of the underworld, it was like the end of the world. What? No 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 no, that couldn't have happened. Do you know what that means? Said Ereshkigal in panic. That was a side that Thor found fun to see. For Thor, it was like seeing a not-so-lonely version of hell. Ereshkigal grabbed Husbishag and shook her to the point that Husbishag was disoriented. What will become of me? Can you imagine if my little sister found out about this and Anna will never leave me alone again? Screamed Ereshkigal, still in a panic. Namtar soon tried to stop Ereshkigal from hyperventilating. My lady, calm down. Remember you are in front of a stranger said Namtar, whispering the last part. Ereshkigal froze and glanced in Thor's direction, who was grinning amusedly, then dropped Husbishag. Ahem it's a pretty substantiated claim but what would be your solution? Asks Ereshkigal. Thor then took a step forward. I propose a second chance. Let the soul make the decision, after all, Enki, purposely or not, made Adapa blind and foolish, if Adapa chooses to live, then he will live according to his will, said Thor. Ereshkigal seemed to consider before making a decision. Consider it done, said Ereshkigal. For Thor it's never been so simple to recruit someone. POV unknown. Darkness. Dust. Those were the two things that followed me the most after my death, but then again, I expected nothing less from Queen Ereshkigal's kingdom. But I do not understand. I've always known what awaits mortals in the afterlife. After all, I was a priest, before I was a king of the great city of Eridu. 
I was the first king of mankind, I did my best for my people, I always praised the gods, especially my father Enki, every day, whether in the scorching heat of the day under the sun or the icy cold of the night under the moon. I loved and respected the gods. But then why? Why did they abandon me? Why did my father abandon me? Did I not do what he asked me to do? He even commended me for standing my ground before the great King Anu, and for refusing to eat and drink the food of immortality, perhaps didn't he love me? Before I could even think of an answer, I saw and heard something after quite a while. The first thing was something that replaced my dark vision. A bright light. A bright light appeared through my darkness and blinded me for a brief moment. And at that moment I could feel it again. Feel the chill of rocks and the heat of a nearby flame, in addition to the stuffy environment. The other thing that surprised me was something simple. One voice. Hey, you're finally awake. It was then that I looked towards the voice and noticed another person sitting in a chair nearby a rather tall man, with long blood-colored hair, but what stood out the most was the golden metallic lines on his face and eyes with black scleras and golden pupils. Who is this man? Hey, I know it can be a little disorienting, after all, you're alive again, but it will pass. I suggest you stay calm because your new life is a little complicated, said the blood-colored haired man. I don't understand, what is he talking about? Um I suppose an introduction is appropriate, don't you agree? Asked the man. I could only nod, I had to know what was going on. I am Adapa, the priest king of the city of Aridu, and the first king of men by the will of Anu, I said. My throat was as dry as the dust I'd eaten for years. Nice to meet you Adapa I am Thor, Norse god of thunder, most of all said the man, before getting up from his chair. The man, now identified as Thor, approached me until he was only a few steps away. I'm your father dot 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 or something close, said Thor, shrugging his shoulders. What? No. My father is Enki, the god of wisdom, I said. Thor seemed to think I was saying something funny because he smiled right away. Well, as I said, your situation is unique what you have from your past life at the moment are two things, your soul and your skeleton, said Thor. Say what? Your flesh is the flesh of a dragon king, said Thor, smiling. What? And your blood? Well, it's actually my blood, said Thor. For Anna's sake I just closed my eyes for a few years, and then suddenly this happens, what did you do to me? I asked. This can't be happening, no, 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 it must be an illusion of the Kerr, Queen Arishkigal must be playing with my soul again. Yes. Should be it. Oh. Denial? I did what I did to give you something your father never gave you a second chance, Thor said, smiling. Thor then reached for me, but I just got up off the ground and ignored it. I admit I'm a little irritated. My father would never allow such sacrilege on me. Also, my father will always cherish the cycle of life, so of course, he won't bring me up from the dead. The second chance is sacrilegious and disrespectful to my father. I said. It was then that I saw the Thor stop smiling. Oh really? So, was it out of that respect that he deceived you when you were offered immortality? Was it out of this respect that he, your own father, accepted your first wife, Lilidu, as his lover? Was it out of that respect that your father also slept with your second wife, Tidiv, who ended up pregnant with his child? And it was out of that respect that you forgave Titi Eve and raised this child generated by infidelity as your own, and when the child grew up ended up killing your firstborn. Ask Thor. I never had the opportunity to answer every question. How could I? It was then that Thor one last sentence. Wake up to reality, Adapa you were used as a fool and then discarded when you served your purpose, said Thor. It was the purest truth Abba El. My son. My firstborn. My first star of the night. He was taken from Mika and did that. How much do you know? I asked. It was then that I saw Thor go silent for a brief moment before answering. I admit not everything, or rather not everything according to your point of view, said Thor. So that's it huh, I always loved and respected my father, he was always hopelessly weak when it came to women, so I shouldn't have been surprised, but I said, before stopping. A son should never hate his parents. This was almost an absolute law my father taught me when I was growing up. My father used to say another saying only the good man can be able to forgive someone and leave the past in the past, so there is a future that you will always look forward to. It was for this teaching that I forgave my second wife to Eve, and we had a great marriage, with 30 sons and 30 daughters, but the price I lost my firstborn because of this. But you hate them, don't you? Ask Thor. I denied. No. I'm just disappointed, I said. But it looked like Thor wasn't convinced. You don't have to lie, I even admit that hate is not productive, but it's very easy for you to hate someone who has hurt you, and you know as well as I do that betrayal hurts because it never comes from the enemies, but from the people we love the most, said Thor. He was right. I loved Lilidu, and she hurt me. I loved Titi even she hurt me. My father, Enki, someone I loved the most hurt me. I still raised and loved Kain as my own son, and he killed my true firstborn son. 
And I still had to make my firstborn's murderer my heir, not my son Sidi. What can I do now? I asked. I couldn't live again like before I don't want to get hurt again. If you want a fresh start then live for me, I will be fair to you, that I will promise, said Thor. It was then that I looked at Thor and saw him holding out his hand to me. Fair. I like that word. I then didn't take the outstretched hand I knelt. I will do my best to be worthy of this new chance of life, Master Thor, I said. I want a second chance. I need a second chance. I now know this. A new life, far from injustice, impunity, betrayal, and intrigue. That's my biggest wish right now. No need to call me master, technically you are part of my family now, you may not have my flesh, but you have my blood, said Thor. That it was a surprise. After all, I had to call Enki a master for quite some time before I was allowed by him to call him father. Wait. Does that mean Thor is my father now? After all, I don't have the blood of Enki according to Thor's words. I suppose I'll find out only in the future. First I had to know one thing. What do you want from me? That I serve him as a priest? I asked. After all, being a priest was what I did, even before I was a king. It was then that I saw Thor smiling. Priest? With the flesh of a dragon king and the blood of a Norse war clan god? No, that would be a waste of potential you will be a hunter, and I will train you myself, said Thor smiling. A um, hunter? It makes no sense. What am I going to hunt? I asked confused. Definitely, this hunter wouldn't be able to hunt any animal, after all, he said that I would be trained by him, and he also said that he is part of a war clan. So I suppose I'll be some kind of warrior. But then does that mean that I will be subordinate to him? Will I be subordinate to another god? You won't have something specific to hunt, because it can vary a lot. You will have your free will, however, you will have only two duties as my only orders, said Thor. Two duties? The first duty is to remain in the territory I will designate you, which is also the territory where I live, said Thor. That was fair because if I didn't follow that rule, I could be accused of trespassing just like my son Abel. Your second duty is to protect the territory you will live in from any threat, capture or kill whoever tries to harm you preferably capture, said Thor. That was strange. If I'm just going to follow these two rules then I don't need to honor the gods. I don't need to bow my head when greeting someone higher up. I don't need to obey the gods. Do I not need to accept any decision imposed on me by the gods? Like marriage? I don't need to serve? Is this freedom? POV. Third person. Although Adapa is wondering if what he will feel would be a kind of freedom. Thor had calculated every word he would say to Adapa for good reason. Thor wanted Adapa as an ally, not a servant. Thor was offering Adapa a sense of freedom and free will, so that Adapa would be more devoted to Thor's orders. After Thor found out about the devils invading Midgard, he knew he should be as practical as possible in solving the problem. Because Fenrir is the watchdog of Thor's house, the Norse god needs another being to guard the remainder of Midgard's vast territory. Thor found Adapa as a solution. The first king of mankind. And the first human was graced by the gods for dedication. Thor took advantage of Adapa's history and his relationship with the Sumerian gods. Adapa was a son of Enki who devoted himself to the gods all his life. In addition to being the first king, he was a priest. A dedicated priest. Anu, the leader of the Anunnaki at the time, knowing Adapa's dedication to praising the gods, invited him to a celebration. Initially, when a human was invited by the Anunnaki, they would eat and drink the food of death, as the human somehow ended up disrespecting the Anunnaki, who only saw them as mere sources of entertainment. However, Enki advised Adapa never to accept any food given, and due to the law of the guest Adapa would be safe from any affront. What Enki did not count on was that Adapa was very polite and respected all the gods. By this act of respect, Adapa became the only mortal to be protected by the strongest of the Sumerian pantheon Enlil himself. Even though Enlil was not very fond of Adapa, due to Adapa's existence served as a reminder that Enki betrayed Ninki and had Adapa with a mortal. To Enlil, this was a desecration of the Anunnaki's race, but contrary to what many thought would happen, Enlil ended up leaving Adapa alone, and turned his anger at the desecration of the Anunnaki race on Enki. For Enlil, the relationship between the brothers ended that day. And the strongest Sumerian god proceeded to deny his own brother. Adapa's actions by the gods also changed Anu's opinion of humans. And for these reasons, Anu did not offer the food of death as planned, but the food of eternal youth. But Adapa thought it was the food of death being offered to him by Anu, and trusting his father, Enki, he turned down the offer, and Enki didn't stop it, but not because he didn't know about the exchange of the food of death for the food of eternal youth, on the contrary Enki knew of the exchange. The god Enki only believed that half-blood humans and the rest of humans should forever be mortal. Enki asked Anu to let Adapa remain mortal, so that Adapa would identify more with humans than with the Anunnaki, even though he was technically a demigod. Enki did not want the longevity of the gods to be given to humans. When Adapa refused the offer of the food offered to him, King Anu was not only perplexed, he was ashamed. 
To Anu, Adapa's actions were very strange. In the end, Adapa left as immortal and returned as immortal. As Adapa was chosen by Anu as the first king, and the descent between Enki and Anlal, Adapa decided to appease the strongest twin gods, and ended up marrying Lalidu, sister of Arishkagal and granddaughter of Anlal, and Tidiev, half-sister of Adapa and daughter of Enki with another mortal. Enki and Enlil approved marriages only for peace. However, no one thought about the key factor. Enki's hopelessly lust. Lalidu did not like the marriage proposal, because for her, a pure blood and an aqui, it was humiliating to marry a demigod. Tidiv, on the other hand, was paranoid about the right of succession. Adapa's half-sister had ambition, she wanted her children to inherit the throne, but she had something that stopped her Lalidu. Lalidu had pure Anunnaki blood, being the sister of Arishkagal and the daughter of Nanner. Tidiv was a demigod, daughter of Enki, and immortal. It was then that Tidiv had a plan, while Lalidu had no son or daughter, due to the heartbreak of having to marry Adapa, Tidiv seduced an Anunnaki that could change the game. The Anunnaki was Enki, her own father, and father-in-law by marriage. And then Tidiv slept with Enki and Adapa successively until she was pregnant. And pregnant Tidiv was. Pregnant with twins. The older twin was named Kyan, and it was apparent to Adapa that he was not the father, Ninhursag had confirmed Adapa's assumption. The younger twin was named Abael, and he was Adapa's firstborn son. Tidiv claimed to Adapa that the betrayal was for political reasons, and Adapa forgave her after some time. However unlike Kyan, Abael turned out to be a favorite of the gods. Tidiv's plan didn't go exactly as planned and everything indicated that Abael would inherit the throne after Adapa's death. But then the tragedy. Kain killed Abael for the throne, as Kain felt threatened, even though he had a more prestigious lineage than Abael. While this fight for the throne on the part of Tidiv took place, Lulidu, angry at having married a mere demigod, ended up finding comfort in someone's arms, or to be more exact in someone's bed. The someone was Enki. And then Lulidu forsook Adapa and became Enki's lover, having with the god of wisdom two daughters. Lulua, who became the wife of Kyan, and Alamath. Unfortunately, as much as Adapa ended up having 30 more sons and 30 daughters, none of them ended up being the future heir for the simple fact that none of them came to the attention of the gods like Abael. And so the throne of the first king ended up being given to Kyan, after he had returned from the exile given to him by Enlil for committing fratricide. Adapa had to kneel before the murderer of his own firstborn, and the result of the betrayal of who he considered the love of his life with his own father. After Abael's death in the story that followed, Thor could be sure of one thing about Adapa, it was almost certain that Adapa was no longer so submissive to the gods. Quite the opposite it was quite likely that the first king of civilized men, had a repressed hatred, Thor explored the truth and what to say, so that Adapa would willingly follow him. And it worked. You can rise up Adapa, no need to kneel although I can make something symbolic of it, said Thor, rubbing his chin thoughtfully. Adapa, who remains kneeling towards Thor, was confused. Symbolic in what way? I asked. Thor then smiled. Well, you knelt before the court of seven of the Anunnaki as Adapa the priest, and you stood up as Zalulam, the first king of humans, until your dying day, let's do something like that, before me you're kneeling, after having lived as Adapa and Zalulam, so I'll give you another name, said Thor, explaining. Adapa nodded, understanding the logic behind Thor's explanation. To have a new life it is necessary to have a new name. Stand up Igris, my first son said Thor, with a small smile. Adapa, now called Igris, stood up and looked around him and realized something he was in a kind of forge, or more specifically, he was in the forge of the kingdom of Arishkagal. N.A. I will be referring to Adapa as Igris from now on. Are we still on Kerr? Asked Igris, confused. Thor started walking towards a spot in the forge as he answered Adapa's question. Yes, we are here because next time I leave, I will no longer be welcome to this land by decree of Enlil, I will go east. So I asked Arishkagal another favor in exchange for a better security system to replace the seven gates of her realm, and Nurjulai would be allowed to use the forge of her realm, said Thor, scouring the area. This news surprised Igris. Nurjul replaced? I thought he would never stop being the Kurs guard so he could have a chance with Miss Arishkagal, said Igris. Thor paused for a moment, before picking up a chest and walking back to Igris. He will retire due to an accident at work, but that doesn't matter anymore, I promised Arishkagal a replacement for the gates, and guard him in exchange for the underworld forge to bring you back to life, and forge some toys said Thor, placing the chest in front of Igris. Thor then gestured. Wear it, it will help you on our journey to the east, you will accompany me, so that you will receive teachings not only from me, but also from other important gods and goddesses. I'll meet Arishkagal to sort out the problem with the gates, meet me at the exit, see you soon Igris, said Thor. The Norse god then left the place and left Igris lost in thought before opening the chest given to him by Thor. It was then that Igris saw what was inside the chest a kind of armor. 
While Ligris remained at the forge, Thor made his way towards meeting the queen of the Sumerian underworld, Arishkigal, at the seventh gate of the underworld. Thor found Arishkigal waiting for him. So Asgardian, what's your idea of fixing this? Asked Arishkigal, displeased, gesturing to the seventh collapsed gate. Arishkigal was unhappy with what had happened to her kingdom, all seven gates were destroyed, and the only guard of all gates was left unconscious and traumatized after waking up. Nurgil abandoned Kerr as soon as he woke up. Thor remained calm in the face of Arishkigal's displeasure, before summoning the storage space, and pulling out a small bluish-colored cube. This is something that I came up with recently, in theory, it will create barriers according to the power and will of the user, as well as create energy constructs, not so resistant of course, but can work perfectly as guards for all seven gates, or in that case barriers, in your realm. I shaped this artifact with my energy and was hoping to use it in Thrudvinger, my home in Asgard after my journey, but due to the trouble I've caused you can keep it, said Thor, holding the artifact towards Arishkigal. Arishkigal hesitated for a moment before accepting the artifact. Thor delivered such an artifact for one simple reason. You can always forge a new and better one, so it doesn't make much difference to give an experimental prototype. So how does it work? Asks Arishkigal, assessing the artifact. Thor responded promptly. You will pour your divine energy into the cube and place it next to you, keep in mind that within the area demarcated for use, the amount of guards will be inversely proportional to the quality, and the number of barriers created it will be according to the energy you will power the artifact. Keep the artifact close at hand in case you want to change something, or if the artifact needs more divine energy from you, explained Thor. Arishkigal seemed to understand most of the explanation but not all of it. Air what do you mean by the number of guards will be inversely proportional to their quality, I don't understand, said Arishkigal, with a shy smile. Thor just shrugged. Well, that's what it means a good example is you, if you end up creating 700 guards each will have the strength and power of an angel with three pairs of wings, if you only create seven guards, each of these seven guards can probably kill a low-class dragon, and give a high-class dragon a little warm-up, said Thor. This surprised Arishkigal. The guards may not be as strong as Nurgil individually. But they're still promising. However, Thor explained only one possible probability, after all the artifact has not yet been tested on a large scale. In addition, you need to know the cost of everything. From the area that will be demarcated by the artifact, the production of barriers, and the creation of a certain number of guards. So if I feed my energy to the artifact now and set up seven barriers, seven guards for each gate and let the use area occupy from my throne room to the entrance of the first gate, how long will it take for the artifact consumes the energy, until I need to feed it with my energy again? Asked Arishkigal. Thor hummed thoughtfully before answering confidently. One lunar cycle, said Thor. Arishkigal reacted quickly. I accept the artifact. It was nice doing business with you Nordic I mean Thor. You are more than welcome in my house said Arishkigal quickly, the goddess then took Thor's hand and shook it quickly, sealing the deal. While Arishkigal's reserves of divine power are not the greatest among the Sumerian gods, Arishkigal's divine power is endless while in Kerr, because the realm will constantly supply Arishkigal's power. So the goddess doesn't have to worry about being helpless right after feeding the artifact with divine energy. It was then that a figure fully clothed in armor walked towards the gods. The presence of the fully armored figure was quickly noticed by the gods. Oh, Igris, it's about time, I thought you were having a hard time putting on the armor, said Thor. For a moment Arishkigal looked confused. After all, she didn't know who Igris was, but suspected it was Adapa due to Thor's action towards the figure, as Thor didn't know anyone in the Kerr. Igris did not answer and just bowed his head in respect to Arishkigal. For Igris, Arishkigal was one of the few beings he could still respect in his second life. Well, I think that's it, Arishkigal. I will retire from your lands it was a pleasure to meet you, Thor said smiling and nodding in respect. Arishkigal looked embarrassed as she blushed. Farewell Thor, may your journey echo through the times, said Arishkigal. And so they parted. Thor and his new ally, Igris, departed towards the surface, while Arishkigal headed for the throne room. After a while, Arishkigal was in the throne room, where she placed the artifact on a stone pillar, created next to the throne. As soon as Arishkigal placed the artifact, she fed it with divine energy from her, and the artifact, which was once a blue cube, became a cyan-colored cube. In the first few days after Thor left the land of the Anunnaki, the artifact worked flawlessly. However, on the seventh day, what is this? Asked Arishkigal, confused. What Arishkigal was looking at that moment it was a kind of stone, the color was black with cyan accents. The stone had appeared over the artifact that Arishkigal had received from Thor. This stone also had a strange shape the stone was shaped like an egg. The artifact Thor gave to Arishkigal still had some of Thor's divine energy. And then, when Arishkigal fed the artifact with her divine energy, the artifact changed color. This means that within the artifact the divine energies of Thor and Arishkigal were fighting, the fusion of the element lightning with death taking place. 
and both energies ended up forming a great mass of energy. When you have a large mass of unstable energy, it ends up being the perfect condition for the creation of a specific being a dragon. POV. Third person. It had been about seven days since Thor left the lands of Arishkigal. The Thunder God returned to Uruk, where he bid farewell to Gilgamesh and Enkidu, and notified the small Nordic party of his departure to the east. In addition to introducing the only being that will accompany Thor on his journey to the east. Igris. When the others saw Igris, they were automatically curious, for the presence of this armored being was a cross between dragon and divinity. Unfortunately for the curious, as soon as Igris left the lands of Arishkigal, he took a vow of silence. At that moment, Thor and Igris were leaving the Sumerian territory and approaching the Elamite territory. However, neither Thor nor Igris realized they were being watched from a distance by someone. It was a man, who had bronze skin and dark brown hair, and his eyes were such a deep blue that would resemble the sea. This was Enki, the god of water and wisdom. As well as Thor's travel companion's former father Enki was about to take the first step toward Thor and Igris, but he was stopped by someone, don't you dare little brother, or I'll break both of your legs, said a voice, with a tone of authority. It was Enlil. The threat seemed to have its effect, for Enki dared not go forward, but Enki's face showed no fear. Brother. It's been a while, said Enki, with a small smile. Enki's carefree attitude was definitely not contagious, for Enlil had a serious expression on his face. Adapa was dead, neither you nor anyone else can interfere in anything after his death, said Enlil. Enki frowned. He is still my son, said Enki, before being interrupted. He was your son. Adapa died and came back to life, because of Thor and Arishkigal, but neither of them had violated the law of the Anunnaki, so I suggest you stay where you are and don't interfere Enki or I will be forced to act against you brother, said Enlil. Enki had a sarcastic smile. As if you weren't eager to kill me. I understand my limits, without the sword of rupture I am weaker than you as you would still remain in the top 10, my talent is in the runes, so I am not crazy to fight you, brother, said Enki, raising his hands in a posture of surrender. Enki then turned away from Enlil, but not before speaking you know. You can't hate me forever, I know I made mistakes, but I assure you I never had bad intentions, said Enki. Enki then felt a strong pressure. Enlil was furious. The winds began to grow stronger, as Enlil's eyes shone with power as they faced Enki. You admit that you made mistakes. But the problem is that you never tried to correct those mistakes, you shame our Enki race, I should have killed you millennia ago, said Enlil. Enki seemed unperturbed. Maybe but I'm still here, so there must be some part of you that forgives me, said Enki, with a smile. Enlil, however, did not smile. You are right, and that part is called our mother, so do not push your luck Enki, said Enlil. Enlil then disappeared along with the wind. Enki still remained at that place before looking towards where Thor and Igris were. Perhaps I can speak with you again in the future Adapa said Enki, with a melancholy look, before forming a teleportation circle and disappearing. As soon as Enki disappeared, Thor stopped walking, looked towards the place where Enlil and Enki were, and frowned. Thor had felt the Enlil's power, as well as the strong winds. The Norse god then looked at Igris, who was standing and waiting for Thor and spoke. Come on Igris, let's keep walking, when we get to the east, we'll still need to find someone who can help us or... To be more exact, convince them to help us, said Thor, sweating. Thor had little misgivings about the deities of the east, and the reason was for their fame. One of them was one of the big three of the Shinto pantheon. Isanagi's right eye. Brother of Amaterasu and Susanu. Tsukuyomi. The fame of this god could be described as something funny. The story was simple, the goddess Amaterasu sent Tsukuyomi as her representative, to visit another Shinto goddess. The goddess of food. Yukimachi. A feast was organized by the goddess of food, and everything was going well, until Tsukuyomi discovered how the food for the feast was made. Needless to say, the feast was remembered for Tsukuyomi's fury and Yukimachi's murder. Of course, the Shinto pantheon shouldn't be the example of the gods of the east, after all, not everyone had Tsukuyomi's temperament. Also, Thor's biggest problem is finding someone willing to teach him about Tauki. Thor had someone in mind, but he wasn't entirely sure. Because Thor didn't know if his existence had been born yet, as he hadn't heard rumors of anyone facing a divine army alone. Thor would then have to be practical to discover the whereabouts of this existence. First, Thor researched a weapon described as a golden staff that weighed 8.1 tons, and could change size. Thor found such an object. Rai Jingu Bang. Described as a treasure of Aogwang, one of the four dragons, and king-class dragon, the eastern sea dragon. Thor's fate at the moment was clear, he needs to meet Aogwang first. Location. Former center of the universe. POV. Third person. Former was the name of the planet that was located at the center of everything, where everything took place. On this planet, there were two twin towers, which respectively represented life and inevitability. Vormer was where the current everything of the universe originated. And from the beginning, there was only one being. Originated from the dream the primordial of destiny. 
or as he was known to others Fatim. And at this moment it was possible to find someone in the middle between the Twin Towers. He was a man, with long blonde hair, dressed in golden armor sitting in the air with his legs crossed and with his eyes closed. It was then that a woman, with bronze skin and emerald eyes, appeared next to the armored man. Fatim are you sure it was necessary to do what you did? Asked the woman uncertainly. The man, identified as Fatim replied calmly. It was necessary, Samsara when you came to me about someone who was not affected by the reincarnation cycle I was silent until the future changed so much that I had to intervene myself, Fatim said. Samsara still remained uncertain. How much of the future has changed? Asked Samsara. Fatim then opened his eyes, which were a blurred steel color. Fatim appeared to be blind. Before the future was altered several times due to this being not following the rules of the reincarnation cycle, a tall, six-eyed, golden-armored mechanical humanoid being nicknamed, the Incarnate Devastation, and the Fierce God would invade our house in the future, but now. Said Fatim, pausing before continuing. Samsara looked worried by Fatim's hesitation. Sigh there will be no invasion from the Fierce God, but another will take his place, said Fatim. Samsara quickly questioned. Who will take his place, Fatim? Asked Samsara. It was then that Fatim looked towards Samsara and spoke the words that would haunt the dreams of the existence responsible for the cycle of reincarnation. The absolute despair will come, and there's nothing we can do to stop him, Fatim said. Location? East coast of future China. POV Thor. Months have passed since I departed from Sumeria, and my arrival in the land of the young master, my journey turned out to be quite uneventful. Which was strange. After all, I've walked these lands, and I haven't been approached by any god or goddess directly emphasis on directly. I couldn't be on this earth without anyone noticing me, the thing is. Who noticed me, and why didn't show up yet? Even during these months, I could not find a twin dragon of the Eastern Sea, the original holder of the Rai Jingu Bang, the monkey god's weapon. I expected the monkey to be famous already, unfortunately, no mortal has ever heard of a monkey god. Although some travelers coming from the southwest of where I was, what would one day be known as India, claim of a monkey god, an insanely strong monkey god that I suspected was in the double digits. Hanuman which I suspected was an avatar of the Trimurti due to the insane force of the stories, but which god of the Trimurti I wasn't entirely sure. While I would like to meet this guy it will be a journey to another time, for the monkey god I wanted to meet at the moment was the guy who would teach me the technique that most eastern gods had, and that I learned from his existence through from my mother Frigg. Tauki. While I was lost in thought, I noticed my traveling companion and a corpse of a monster that I recognized immediately. Igris, I've already told you that you can't just kill any supernatural being in foreign lands, I said, sighing. Igris seemed to consider, before leaning a little towards me. My lord the creature it's a nuisance, said Igris. Oh? We weren't close to the new year for this creature to be on land so what did Igris do? Why do you say that? I asked curiously. Igris seemed to consider, although he took the vow of silence I asked him to at least respond to me, otherwise, our communication would be impaired. But that made him still speak a few words. I was scouring the bottom of the sea looking for the dragon, this creature spotted me and tried to devour me, said Igris, pointing to the corpse. Ah, that was a very anticlimactic reason. Again, the race of the Nyan is a plague on these seas so far to the east of the world. Although the four twin sea king dragons keep them at a minimum population, it is possible to come across a young Nyan now and then, but never an adult one. Although once a year the Nyan have such a large population that some end up escaping the sea and heading for land. I just looked at the creature. Well it was defensive I suppose, but what do you want to do with the corpse? Don't even look at me, it's your kill after all I said. Igris then looked at me and back to Nyan's corpse. It was then that Igris unsheathed the simple sword, which I had forged a short time ago to assist him in combat, until I had a worthy weapon, or I forged another sword from better materials and decapitated the corpse. Trophy, said Igris, simply. I could only sweat in response. Well, each with their quirks I suppose. And it looked like Igris is starting to develop a quirk of collecting trophies, perhaps this is the result of a cross between a dragon of fury, and a god from a war-prone clan? My master said Igris. Another thing that bothered me was the fact that even though I had said he was my family, Igris still insisted on referring to me as master or lord. I suppose old habits take time to die. I just waved in his direction and asked him to continue. Why are we still here? Asked Igris. A valid question I suppose. As you already know, our objective is to learn Tauki, but I think I owe you an explanation as to why we have remained in the western terrestrial limits of this great land for so long we have a secondary objective, which will depend on you mainly I said. Said. Igris seemed to react as he quickly knelt. What the orders? Asked Igris. Such devotion was what made me a little worried after all, I don't want a fanatical sect in the future. 
What separates two of the most influential pantheons in the East is only the Eastern Sea. The armor I forged for you was made of blood copper and pure Sumerian gold, mixed with corrupted ice, which nullifies magic. Including detection magic of simple, intermediate, and advanced presence I replied. Of course, it wasn't cheap stuff, but it would be worth it. Even now, if an alien god performed a detection spell where we are, it would only show my presence, and Igris would remain camouflaged. While I would have liked to carry out this quest myself, I was disappointed that the amount of ice corrupted in the armor was not enough to camouflage the presence of a full deity. Although, apparently if you were a demigod it was possible. We stay on this side, so that I can identify and evaluate the best place for you to continue your journey further east, on some islands close to the land of the rising sun, it will be your first mission as my hunter, while I learn Tauki. I have full faith that you will succeed in it under your abilities, I said smiling. There was something else that had caught my attention. And I would definitely capture it at some point. You will go to those islands that I suspect are the habitat of the being I want you to look for. I suggest you get information from the local people about the four fiends. I don't care about three of them. Only one caught my attention. Dot dot. Look for any legend about the fiend of gluttony. You can get information from both the people of the land we are in, and the people of the land of the rising sun I said. The being I sent Igris to hunt was a well-known creature for its unique power and ability. I learned about this while learning Thoth's healing technique, which kept records of various things in the library. In addition to the standard advanced regeneration ability of the Four Fiends, Gluttony had the ability to devour and consume everything in an infinite capacity, no matter if they are living creatures, objects, or special abilities, including magic I couldn't help but wonder if this ability would be valid for the Holy Gears that would appear in humans in the future. But, he was a secondary objective, after all, not even I would know the limits of its ability, even Thoth hadn't that kind of record. Understood, said Igris. Igris then stood up and seemed to consider before leaving. When should I leave? And how soon should my return be? Asked Igris. I thought briefly. I'm sure Tauki will be simpler to learn compared to Thoth's healing technique. The hardest part was finding a teacher willing to teach. We'll be here for 10 years, that's the longest after we're done here, we'll head west, but further south, I said with finality. India, the cradle of spirituality, was my next destination. The place I would find out whether or not it was possible to replicate hockey to some degree. Oh. By the way, Igris, the side quest, while important, is not necessarily my priority at the moment, as I'm sure I will have other opportunities consider the side quest as your test in this new body, as you now have dragon flesh and blood of a god, if you can't complete the quest, don't worry so much, I said casually. That was the truth. Gluttony was said in Thoth's records to be a powerful existence, but due to the unique abilities, it was difficult to know the exact position between the three or double-digit ranking of powerful beings. The only thing Thoth was sure of was that no fiend was definitely in the top 10. Or has not shown the ability so far to be in the top 10. I sent Igris to test his new body, as well as learn the capabilities of the gluttony, which was the most powerful of these four fiends. If Igris is on the brink of death, the armor will react and he will immediately teleport to me. Also, if Igris fails the mission I can always hunt gluttony during the Great War personally. Igris seemed to think for a while before answering. Understood, said Igris. I think I should ask him to relax. Why is he so serious? I could only sigh before heading to the ocean. I think it's time to fish again location. Sumeria Kerr, Kingdom of Arishkigal. POV, Arishkigal. I was always feared by many, loved by few, but undoubtedly all beings, mortal and immortal, respected me. That's the result of being a goddess of death I suppose. I thought it would be like this, forever. The love of my friend's husband Shag and her husband Namter. Nurgil's fanatical love. And the fear and respect of the others. But then, a few days ago something happened that changed things a little I gained another friend wait, should I really call you my friend? No. My baby. I said, caressing the being's belly in my lap. I knew it was a dragon. But in my eyes, you're the cutest thing I've ever met. I said pulling the little dragon into my embrace. My little baby just squeaked in response. I took it from my embrace and looked into those bright blood-colored eyes that had been staring at me since the moment the egg hatched a few days ago. The muzzle suddenly quivered. A chew sneezed the little dragon into my hands. With emerald-colored fire shooting from its nostrils, and purple lightning flashing from its beautiful little wings. Ah! Is my baby okay? I asked, worried. He's never sneezed since the moment he was born, and I've never let him out of my sight, maybe Kerr is too cold for him? Should I take him to see the sun for a bit? He also refuses to eat any food. Looks like he's not hungry or maybe my food is so bad that my own child refuses to eat it ah, what a pathetic mother I am, I could feel my eyes watering. It was then that I felt something wiping my eyes. I looked and saw my baby's tail. I looked at him and realized he was showing his concern for me. Oh thank you. I said, pulling my son into a hug again. 
It was then that my friend Husbishag appeared in my throne room, accompanied by her husband Namter, I think the meeting of the gods ended earlier than expected. I can finally introduce them to my son. My lady, it's good to be by in-law, what is it? Shouted Husbishag, pointing at me and, more specifically, my baby. Well, I suppose those who have never seen my baby, they will find him a little different, but you don't need that reaction. Hey! It's my son you're talking about. I screamed in response and pulled my baby closer to me to comfort him. He might be hurt by your words, you know I looked to Namter for support, but Namter seemed to be frozen and thinking about the world itself. My eyes could see that his eyes gleamed with an unearthly tone. Oh! Is he having a vision of fate again? He seemed to come to himself and whisper a few words that I heard perfectly. It's not just two anymore but three? Said Namter, in disbelief. A? Three? Three what? Anyway, my precious son, you need a worthy name. Um. But I don't think it's fair that I decide alone, even though it's normal for the mother to be the one who names the child also, the father I felt my face heat up in embarrassment. How am I supposed to explain the situation to him? I asked, looking at my son. My beloved son seemed to sense my mood as he tilted his head in confusion. It was then that my son looked at the gate and narrowed his eyes. It was then that I saw someone else coming after Husbishag and Namter. My love. For many moons, I don't see you, the woman who lights up my night and guides me to tomorrow. Today, I came ah. What is this disgusting creature done in my future place I mean in my lady's lap? Shouted the person, in indignation, and pointing at my son. It was Nurgil. I hope he would never show up here again out of fear unfortunately, it appears that was not the case. Also disgusting creature my son the nerve of him. But before I could even respond, my baby didn't seem to like the tone, and broke out of my grip and growled at Nurgil. It was then that I saw Nurgil do the unthinkable. He raised a battle axe and threatened to hurt my baby. Nurgil. Don't you dare. Or will I I said quickly before being interrupted. Bam Nurgil didn't even hesitate. But my son was fine. It actually looks like my son's beautiful scales glowed in amethyst color. My son then attacked Nurgil with his tail and. Bam threw Nurgil out of the throne room. Oh. Just like his father. Oh come here my little one. I'm so proud of you. I said, stepping down from the throne and walked quickly to my baby and gave him another hug. Come on, it's time for you to rest, I'll tell you some stories about your father, I said. I then leave the throne room, right after I wave goodbye to Husbishag and Namter, who are still looking at my baby in fear oh, maybe in the future they'll see my baby's cuteness just like I do. POV. Third person. As soon as Arishkagal left the throne room, Husbishag glanced at Namter. Clarify what that was? Asked Husbishag, pointing to where Nurgil was thrown. Namter just smiled. The future emperor, my love the dread dragon the dark emperor. Its scales are unbreakable, and its rage will reflect any power said Namter. Husbishag sweated cold, there were only two emperors a long time ago, who were stronger than dragon kings, except for Tiamat. What did he do to Nurgil? Asked Husbishag, curious. Namter looked at his wife and replied. Counterattack, said Namter, with a nervous smile. Location. Future Canada Lake Huron Manitalan Island. POV Loki. Finding my lost son was a headache, and to think he would go so far from home, perhaps Thor is no longer a viable option to solve Asgard's problems more ultimately. Besides, he's already caused me more trouble than I expected. I didn't expect Thor to be so protective of Hel. My original plan was to make Hel lonely enough so that when I showed up, I'd take advantage of her possible loneliness, and turn her into being totally dependent on me. It would be simple to blame my foolish brother for his delusions of peace. With Hel obeying me in exchange for love and recognition, giving me command of an endless army of Draugr, me freeing Fenrir and luring Jormungandr into war would be ideal. After that, it was the war to take that boy off the throne. I would never let Asgard fall into the hands of someone as soft-hearted as Baldr. Although Baldr has the potential to be a ruler, he prefers diplomacy. It doesn't matter how many times I tell him that we are a warrior society and force, like it or not, is our main argument. Unfortunately Thor spoiled most of my plans. He took Hel and became quite protective of her well-being he freed Fenrir, who turned my god-killer son into a mere guard dog. It traumatized Jormungandr, to the point that my son, considered the weight of the world and a dragon king, fled from his own land. Fortunately, there are other ways to get what I want. Also, the bad Balifor owes me a favor I just need to find other ways to achieve my goal. I saw some humans making some kind of sacrifice on the edge of a big lake. Hail na ik, grant us safe passage through your domain, said an old-looking man, then slitting an animal's neck and letting the blood drip into the lake. Hmm. Perhaps I may have found a clue to my son's whereabouts V.O.V. Third person. Loki then walked towards the small family who was ready to board a raft. Loki then made a magic circle and shot a simple fireball that went towards the raft, which had a child inside, waiting for the rest of the family. 
As soon as the fireball made contact with the raft, the small improvised boat caught fire, only the screams of a child could be heard in the fire. An Iber! cried a woman in despair, holding a baby, who began to cry. The older man turned toward Loki in fear of the magic, but the anger at the death of the man's daughter was still noticeable. Loki glanced briefly at the burned boat. Oh, I didn't notice your other offspring on the boat, just wanted to get your attention anyway, now that I have your attention, tell me more about this Naik, will you? In return, you can meet your offspring again, said Loki. The man remained cautious as he had just witnessed magic for the first time in his life. But the woman, that was holding a baby, soon replied when she saw a ray of hope. After all, to the human family, Loki was a god or at least a powerful shaman by all means, he probably could bring the dead back to life. Naik is the water spirit of our land, we come from the land where the sun sleeps. Legends passed down by our ancestors say that it is a giant serpent that lives in the Great Lake. That's all we know, now, please bring my daughter back. Whether you are a shaman or a god, we will praise you too, but bring my little one back, I beg you. The woman said quickly, with a desperate tone. Loki remained impassive. Why, thank you for your cooperation as a god, let me fulfill my part of the exchange said Loki, creating a magic circle. But what appeared it was another fireball. Now you will be gathered again said Loki. Then the fireball shot out of Loki's hand and set the family on fire. Loki stared impassively at the fire as he listened to the screams. So fragile so noisy well, where the sun rests, how west then, said Loki. It was then that the Norse god walked back in the determined direction, in search of the water serpent spirit Naik, who Loki suspected was what the locals were calling his son Jormungandr. Location. East coast of future China. POV Thor. Well this quest is more complicated than I thought. No sign of the dragon, even if I search the bottom of the ocean, I'm starting to give up on finding this dragon I had sent Igris on the side quest, along with a few things that might help him capture gluttony, as well as the water of life I made with one of the immortality plants I got in Sumer. Now, I was heading towards the nearest village in search of more reports of any supernatural beings. That's when I saw a kid with a monkey's tail. Hmm? Monkey? Is my luck smiling on me again? I asked, in disbelief. I saw the child running along the path I knew led towards a specific mountain. I may have found the god I was looking for, but it's just a kid. You can't teach me anything I expect. But I couldn't help but be curious. Where is he going in such a hurry? POV. Third person. The monkey-tailed child was actually an orphan, who was born by specific means in a mythical stone formed by the forces of chaos, which resulted in a playful and adventurous personality. He initially had no name. After all, he didn't know what a name was. And so, he lived at the place of his birth on Huaguo Mountain. During the early stages of his life, he lived on this mountain that was home to ape species. At the age of five, he earned the respect of the local monkey clan when he proved his worth by jumping down a waterfall and finding a new home for the monkeys through it, and thus became the king. The Monkey King. But respect was not enough, the young king became aware, after the death of one of his subjects, that his time would come someday. Mortality was never so terrifying for the young king. Therefore, he decided to go in search of the long-awaited immortality, dressing up in human clothes, so that he would be accepted into sects. The Monkey King's plan was a complete failure, as all the sects masters and apprentices saw through the disguise, which generated mixed reactions. The so-called apprentices mocked the young king for the stupidity of the disguise. While sect masters refused to teach a monkey in the arts of cultivation, as they believed that due to the nature of Falun Dafa cultivation practice, the young Monkey King would never learn due to his own personality. No master wanted to waste his time with a useless apprentice. It was then that the young monkey king met a peculiar master. Pewdy Zushi. And after much insistence, Master Zushi took the young monkey king as an apprentice, and gave him something the king didn't have until now a name. Sun Wukong. Master Zushi was impressed by the young Sun Wukong's determination and his ease in learning. However, young Sun Wukong was very sly. And Master Zushi was losing patience in the face of such a personality of his most renowned apprentice. Another problem that worried Sushi was the growing vanity displayed by Sun Wukong. Young Sun Wukong made a point of demonstrating that he was the best apprentice for everyone, especially those who had previously mocked and denied him guardianship. Although Pewdie Sushi was worried, he still continued to teach the young man more rigorously, in the hope that his student's growing ostentation would be lessened. Did not work. And now, at the age of 10, Sun Wukong was returning to his master Pewdie Sushi's sect, after almost successfully performing one of the most advanced lessons. The ability to transform. The almost success was kind of obvious, no matter how much Sun Wukong wants to if he turns into a human his ape tail would show. But to Sun Wukong, it didn't matter, due to the simple fact that not all masters could transform 71 different things perfectly. Just a single transformation wasn't a complete success the transformation of a human. 
And then, as soon as young Sun Wukong arrived at Pewdie's Eshi sect, he shouted. Master, master look. I achieved. Shouted young Sun Wukong, as he jumped excitedly towards a tree in the middle of the sect. Master Pewdiezushi was sitting in the form of the lotus position with his eyes closed and seemed unaffected by the excitement of his most prestigious student. Sun Wukong looked upset. Teacher. Look. Please. Said Sun Wukong, in front of Pewdiezushi. Master Pewdiezushi then opened one of his eyes and saw Sun Wukong, who stretched out his arms in display and gave his master a giant smile. Pewdiezushi, however, didn't smile and just closed his eye again. Congratulations my student, you transcend many masters in terms of skill and persistence, including me. But remember that the person who keeps calm proves that he has beauty Zushi began before being interrupted. Wisdom, I know, I know, you said the same thing when I mastered the advanced art of jumping in a week, now what's next? Asked Sun Wukong. Beauty Zushi was silent before standing up and opening both eyes. Sun if you don't change the path you're on now. You'll end up right where you started, beauty Zushi said seriously. Sun Wukong didn't seem to understand, and when he went to question his master, Pewdie Zushi widened his eyes and positioned himself in front of Sun Wukong, and assumed a defensive posture, looking towards the exit. Pewdie Zushi didn't feel anything. Which was strange since he had reached the limit of Falun Dafa cultivation, having full mastery of the vital energy that was Kai, being able to manipulate and detect. Thus mastering Sinjutsu. Thus achieving the Grail of Xian, a sage. Pewdiezushi only noticed that someone was approaching because he was always manipulating his kai to heighten his senses. That was how Pewdiezushi heard heavy footsteps approaching his sect. What worried Pewdiezushi was the scary reason behind it he didn't feel the aura, so he didn't detect anyone approaching. For Pewdiezushi, who was a Xian in his own right, and had full knowledge of the supernatural, he considered only two possibilities. The first possibility was that someone with mastery over Kai of his level or higher, was masking their life energy with the environment, an extremely advanced technique, and being the only technique necessary for a transcendent master to become a Xian. That possibility would put anyone on the defensive, but it wasn't the scariest possibility. No the scariest possibility was definitely the second. The second possibility was that the person approaching the sect had an aura that transcended the limits of Pewdie Zushi's own understanding of Sinjutsu both possibilities put Sun Wukong's master on the defensive. It was only a few seconds before a figure could be seen through Pewdiezushi's eyes. An extremely tall man with long blood-colored hair that reaches past his waist, golden eyes with sclera the color of the night sky, and wearing a sort of winter coat, with a strange-looking hammer attached to a golden belt, plus something like gloves covering the hands. The man approached Pewdiezushi, who had not let his guard down and was still protecting Sun Wukong, and spoke for the first time. Hello there, said the man, with a smile. POV. Third person. Two beings were sitting under a tree, located in the middle of the local master's sect complex, drinking a kind of tea. Or at least one of them was drinking tea. I'm sorry for the refusal, as I'm not much of a tea drinker, I hope you don't mind, said the taller red-haired being. This was Thor, and he was talking to the sect master of the sect he was in, and the master was right in front of him watching him warily. The sect master was Beauty Sushi, a Xian, or sage according to the supernatural world. I don't take offense to your likes and dislikes, Pewdiezushi said calmly as he sipped some tea. It was then that another voice spoke. Hey! Don't refuse someone's hospitality. It's rude! Said the voice. It was young Sun Wukong, who had climbed the tree and stood on a branch, looking at Thor with a frown. Sun Wukong didn't know why, but in his eyes, Thor was just someone rude and an ignorant foreigner, however the young king's instinct screamed in warning in case of any conflict. I apologize for my student, he's young and quite loquacious, Pewdiezushi said, not taking his eyes off Thor, who grinned in response. I don't worry about such things I didn't come here for that, said Thor. Pewdiezush didn't show a reaction, while Sun Wukong seemed to want to retaliate with disrespect, but chose to remain silent because of his master's actions. With all due respect, what's a god doing here? Asked Pewdiezushi. Thor raised an eyebrow. Oh? How exactly do you know I'm a god? Asked Thor. Pewdiezushi didn't respond right away, as he seemed to consider his next words carefully. I'm a Xian, I have full knowledge of the supernatural from learning and mastering life energy, moreover. I fear that you are not the first god I meet in my short life on the mortal plane, your presence passed to me the same presence as he, so I assumed you are a god, said Pewdiezushi. That seemed to interest Thor. Same presence as he? Who is he you speak of? Asked Thor, curious. Pewdiezushi, for the first time, looked away from Thor, and now had a melancholy countenance. An old friend. The one who taught me Sinjutsu Huyi said Pewdiezushi, looking out into the sunset. Huyi was once an archer god who was expelled from the divine plane for killing nine of the sunbirds, which were nine of Daijun's wandering children, rather than bringing them by the heel, as Daijun wished. 
Dai Jun stripped Huyi of immortality and banished him to the mortal plane, where the former god had many adventures. And in one of those adventures he found love. But there was still something that bothered the former archer god mortality. When Huyi sought immortality for himself and his wife, Chang'e, who had married Huyi while mortal. The two of them ended up separated by carelessness and curiosity of both. Chang'e ended up ascending to the moon, while Hu Yi remained on the mortal plane devastated by the separation, Hu Yi, who was once a great respectable hero, became a recluse and someone unfair and cruel, but he did not stop having apprentices among mortals. The Sinjutsu was Hu Yi's attempt to extend his life, so that one day he can be reunited with Chang'e. During a hunt, Hu Yi was betrayed by some of his disaffected apprentices, led by Feng Meng. Hu Yi died as a mortal by the very students who looked at him with envy of his powers and abilities. But his spirit, attuned to Sinjutsu, ascended to the sun. That day was one of the most difficult days for Pudi Zushi, who had lost his own master and a close friend. Although Hu Yi was considered a tyrant by many, in Pudi Zushi's vision he saw something else a broken man, who had lost the love of his life, and who didn't know how to react, other than becoming reclusive and cruel. Although Thor was a little curious about such a being, it wasn't the Norse god's priority at the moment. I would like to learn Sinjutsu, said Thor, with a tone of finality. Thor got straight to the point, the sooner he learned Sinjutsu to gain access to Tauki, the sooner he would go to India, where the concept of hockey would be tested in that world. Pewdie Sushi had found the request strange. I am afraid I don't understand your request, the Eastern gods seek harmony with nature since the beginning of their lives, and this was one of Huyi's teachings. If you are a god, and you are not already in harmony with nature until now where are you from? Asked Pewdie Sushi. I'm from a far far west of here, said Thor. Pewdie Sushi and Sun Wukong were surprised for just a few seconds. So, a deity from the West came all this way to learn Sinjutsu, if you can satisfy my curiosity, what do you expect to find after you learn Sinjutsu? Asked Pewdie Sushi. Thor raised an eyebrow. Sinjutsu will help me in the future I'm afraid I can't talk more about the case, said Thor. For Thor, there were many things Sinjutsu could be useful for, but the main reason for Thor's journey east was clear learn as many techniques as possible from the other pantheons. The reason for this was that Thor knew there was going to be a war, and besides the fact that his pantheon will have its own threat. To Thor, the logic of future knowledge was clear the Sumerians had the Utuki. The Greeks would have Tiffin. The Egyptians had Seth and Apophis. The Slavs had Vels. The Shinto had Tsukuyomi. And so on the Nordics? The Nords had Surt. Thor only saw Surt once, during a gathering with his family centuries ago. At first glance, Surt looked menacing, whether Thor could defeat him without a continent blowing up is what Thor is not sure. But just in case, Thor was making plans for this moment, so, you're claiming that Sinjutsu will help you I see, I honorably accept your request for guardianship, God Pudizashi said, before being interrupted by someone who had been silent for a while. Sun Wukong. Now, wait a minute. Shouted Sun Wukong. The young monkey king jumped down from a tree branch, and landed beside Pudizashi, Sun Wukong, then pointed a finger at Thor. You can't just gain training. Did you know that I suffered and begged a lot for Master Zushi to accept me, why do you have such treatment? Asked Sun Wukong. In a way, what Sun Wukong was now witnessing was a complete injustice for the simple fact that the young monkey king was refused guardianship by several masters, until he found Pewdie Zushi. Zushi treated him impartially, not because he was a monkey who wanted to train. Master Zushi was fearful at first because of Sun Wukong's active personality, but after much insistence, Sun Wukong was accepted as an apprentice. But then someone comes along, gives a simple, weak explanation as to why he wants to learn Sinjutsu, and has now been accepted as a disciple without any problems. In Wukong's mind, the reason was that Thor was a god and had special treatment. This made young Sun Wukong unhappy with Thor's presence. Pewdie Zushi looked like he wanted to scold the young apprentice, but before any words were said, Thor spoke. A. Hey, but it's not your decision who decides who to train as the master, simple as that. A good example is if you are the master here and I seek to learn your teachings, but then you refuse my request, I'll just leave in the same way I came in and looked for another master, said Thor, shrugging. Could Thor have gone to learn from other masters or even other gods? The answer would be a maybe verging on no. Thor chose Pewdiesush first for a very simple reason. Pewdiesushy was the only master who volunteered to train a supernatural monkey, and, basically, slapped the other masters in the face who refused Sun Wukong's request, when the Monkey King became the best apprentice among the sects. This made good points in Thor's view. Thor's answer seemed to have angered young Sun Wukong. Sun. That's enough, the god of the West is right, respect my decision, said Pewdie Zushi, calmly. Sun Wukong looked at Master Zushi in surprise, and just ran to the compound that was the dormitories. The entire time Master Zushi remained to look at Sun Wukong's exit. Sai I apologize for my apprentice's behavior. 
He's young and still undisciplined, said Beauty Sashi, looking at Thor and bowing a little. Thor seemed to disregard the apology. No offense taken, now are we done here? Can we start my training? Asked Thor. Beauty Sashi took a serious stance. We will start training tomorrow, but there is something you need to answer me first, for the safety of my disciples, said Beauty Sashi. Thor was confused, after all, he didn't mean to hurt anyone here, may I know exactly what you are referring to? Asked Thor, confused. Beauty Sashi narrowed his eyes as if gauging Thor's reaction. I am referring to the malevolent energy that exudes from your back, said Beauty Sashi. The youngest sage in history had stood guard the moment Thor set foot in the sect, always fearing a trap or attack. Beauty Sashi noticed the energy that the berserker mark on Thor's back exhaled. For any Sion or Sinjutsu user who looked at Thor, they would see a shadow behind the Norse god, and dazzle any ray of light and leave anyone on their guard. The shadow had red eyes that exuded an unhealthy joy, as if the shadow was making fun of the fear of others. And the smile it was a red smile of satisfaction that did not exude happiness, but it seemed that the smile served to mock those who feared the shadow as if inviting the opponent to try to face the said shadow. But what caught Beauty Sashi's attention the most was the symbol that was located a little above the red eyes, right in the middle, where the forehead would be. The symbol was colored red, as were the eyes and smile of the shadow. Degrees. The shape of the symbol was strange to Beauty Sashi, as he had no knowledge of the grammar of Thor's homeland, and therefore did not know what it meant. My back? Oh! said Thor. The Norse god then took off his coat and then the top of his toga, which was more of a sash, and then turned, leaving Beauty Sashi to look at the tattoo on Thor's back. In Beauty Sashi's Sinjutsu view, however it was as if the shadow face was an inch away from his face. What a horrible feeling. It's as if your equilibrium state is split into two parts, said Beauty Sashi. Thor then dressed again and looked at Beauty Sashi. What do you mean split into two parts? How do you feel with your Sinjutsu? Asked Thor, curious. Beauty Sashi stopped channeling Sinjutsu, and only then responded to Thor. Sinjutsu is an art that can control the flow of vital energy in living beings. Generally, a Xian, or someone superior in the art of Sinjutsu, can detect a being's aura. In your case it's like you're split in two, said Beauty Sashi. Thor looked confused. I suppose this is not a common thing, said Thor uncertainly. Beauty Sashi nodded in agreement. Actually, the imbalance in one's aura is one thing but two auras, different from each other, inhabiting the same body? This is something that has never happened before as far as I know. I strongly suggest that you go to the land of the Hindus in search of connecting with your spiritual side to know the reason for such a division, said Beauty Sashi. Thor considered the advice and nodded in response. I see but do you have a god in mind that will help my situation? Asked Thor. After all, Thor was unaware of any Hindu god's personality, they might as well try to kill him after learning about the mark of the berserker. Well given the nature of the mark Shiva would be the best option, and Vishnu would be the worst option, said Beauty Sashi, in a firm tone. Thor looked confused. When you refer to worst option you began Thor, leaving the question in the air. Beauty Sashi did not immediately respond. Sincerely, I do not know. Vishnu is on the side of preservation so he will intervene when creation is in jeopardy, you risk your life if you meet Vinshu is uncertain, as you are also a living being and some god that is not under his jurisdiction, said Beauty Sashi. The common sense among the gods of all pantheons was something that all supernatural knew only two beings actively intervened in all pantheons, Samsar was one of these beings, and responsible for the cycle of reincarnation of all pantheons, in addition to being the existence that even the Trimurti, the most powerful trio of gods, would ask for permission to use an avatar. The other existence was something more present in not just all pantheons, but all of existence. Fathom. Destiny itself. Everyone says, everything has a purpose in a way it's true. Although a being's fate is decided by themselves not by conditions or luck, but by decisions made, Fathom has the ability to see far beyond the limitations of time. Fathom sees the past, present, and all possible futures of the universe. All timelines. Fair enough, I'll keep your advice in mind. Where are the dorms? I think I'll call it a day, said Thor. Beauty Sashi nodded and pointed to a large two-story house. Thor then withdrew and left the young master Beauty Sashi alone and thought. Sai a god from the west wanting to learn Sinjutsu? Maybe. Is it fate? Asked Beauty Sashi. The young master then rose as soon as the sun was no longer in sight, and at night the moon reigned in the sky. Time skip. Five years. POV Thor. It was faster than I thought. That was the only impression that crossed my mind as I looked at the white aura, with shades of blue, along my body. Sinjutsu was like second nature, although learning the more advanced forms was my main contract. Transformation art was not something I was interested in. But the other arts like jumping art? I could cross from the moon to the earth in two seconds of course, if I did that, according to Beauty Sashi, I would blow up the earth on impact and shatter the moon so I never tested the theory. Another thing was my attempt at hockey. 
Turns out I could consider Senjutsu a bastard form of observation hockey weaker than hockey, but it will still do. Of course, I couldn't predict the future, but locating beings through the aura was enough, for now, not to mention that Senjutsu was already better than normal detection magic. Another thing Tauki was a success. I could shape my divine life energy and use Tauki for combat perfectly. Unfortunately, the Tauki was considerably weaker than the hockey armament, but I suppose that only in India will I be more likely to improve what I already have, in addition to trying to create the hockey of the Conqueror, and especially getting answers for my Berserker mark. In the five years, Igris returned. He failed the mission. It seems that the Fiend of Gluttony is so hidden that no one has heard of any legends about it. At least I already have something to do during the Great War. Another thing that happened was Sun Wukong's banishment from the sect. The motive was as childish as the Monkey King behavior. Apparently, Sun Wukong was quite upset that a god of the West had stolen his best apprentice spot, and Sun Wukong's resentment towards me was noticeable. Pudisashi, however, saw an opportunity to teach humility and modesty to his student. Did not work. Sun Wukong was found showing off his abilities to some humans. Pudisashi learned of what had happened and so, displeased with his pretentious student, he ended up banishing Sun Wukong from the sect, never to return. The young monkey king begged to stay but was soon refused. Sun Wukong then, at the age of 15 and the youngest Xi'an, was expelled from the sect. But not before declaring that one day he would go west to challenge me to an apprentice duel and take what was his by right. I didn't respond to the challenge. Anyway, with my success in this land, it was time for me to continue with my journey, but now, it will be my return to the west. With my first stop in India, and my second stop in Greece. Are you leaving already? Asked someone. I looked towards the voice, and saw my so-called teacher. Sashi yes, I'm on my way out, it's a miracle I haven't gotten into trouble with some deity of this land, better not push your luck I said. Pewdie Sashi looked at the horizon. Our gods are different they rarely interact with the mortal land. In fact, they would only act if you decided to do some damage, said Pewdie Sashi. I raised an eyebrow in confusion even though I knew my presence was being watched by someone from time to time, it's still too much freedom for a foreign god to enter a territory without talking to the local deity. Not to mention this never interact plan, the land of future China was not so restricted at the present time. Why did your gods decide to distance themselves from mortals? I asked. Pewdie says she gave a small smile. Immortality is seen as an accession. As the gods are in a higher class in the hierarchy of existences, and as the mortal land is well mortal, the gods see the earth as if it were some kind of exile, said Pewdie says she. Ah well, I suppose it's like that everywhere. But it seems that here in the east this kind of godly behavior is more strict. Well, whatever goodbye Sashi, until next life, if you light up too, but if not it was nice meeting you I said. Honestly he would get along well with Thoth. POV. Third person. While Thor left the sect, accompanied by Igris, Pewdie Sashi just stared at the Norse god's back. He was an interesting student, but I worry the day that presence dares to take over his body, or worse. He willingly lets the presence take over, said Pewdie Sashi. The master then entered the sect's complex, after all, there were more students to teach. Location. Midgard House of Thor. So I said to the mirror, what's today's menu? Then I replied right away. I don't know, I'm not the cook ha 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 ha, said the voice of a woman who was embarrassed by the looks. The woman was Hell, who had just attempted a joke for the guests. Needless to say, it wasn't the best reaction Hell wanted, the guests were actually some of the women Hell met Sith, who was holding a drinking horn full of mead, and didn't seem to mind the joke as she continued drinking. Freja, who was looking at Hell with a strange look. And finally, Nana, who was looking at Fenrir, who was sleeping at Hell's feet, attentively as if waiting for something to happen. Ermia so, Hell, could you explain why you called us here? Asked Freja, confused. This seemed to get the attention of Sif, who stopped drinking, and Nana, who stopped staring at Fenrir. All three women looked at Hell expectantly. Poor Hell, however, looked uncertain. Well Thor told me something about a fun meeting to improve my social skills. He said the meeting was called a slumber party, and it would be good for me if I invited someone to have fun, as long as it's girls, so I called you Hell said, averting their expectant gazes. Freja quickly began to speak. Oh. Thor? Did he tell you to talk to me? Asked Freja, in an excited tone. Sif and Nana raised an eyebrow, toward Freja. Meanwhile, Hell replied. Erm not specifically but yes? Said Hell uncertainly. Freja looked remarkably happy. Ah that means he thought of me. But what a dizzying feeling. What does he say about me? Asked Freja. But it seemed that the goddess and princess of the Vanner was asking the question more to herself than to Hell. He doesn't speak, Hell said weakly. But Hell's answer fell on deaf ears. That seemed to have caught Nana's attention. Since when you had this interest in Thor, Freja? Asked Nana, confused. 
Sif didn't seem to care where the conversation was going, and she was soon back drinking her mead. Since the dispute with the Slavs when I found out that there is a man who looks at me without a hint of lust in his eyes, said Freja dreamily. This only seemed to confuse Nana more. If he doesn't want you how do you expect to have him by your side? Asked Nana. For Nana, it was somewhat confusing, she initially lusted after Balder, but as time passed, lust turned into love. Freja seemed to hear the question and looked thoughtful. I don't know. Frankly, I was never in that situation, Freja said uncertainly. It was at this moment that Sif chose to speak. I really don't know what a fuss you're making make him drunk and take him to bed. It worked for me, said Sif. Nana's mouth dropped open in surprise, while Freja seemed to hear a curse. What did you say? Asked Freja, screaming. But hell drop him up? Take him to bed? Oh? Asked hell, confused. She was confusing what Sif had said with the effect of too much meat ingested had on Thor, which resulted in a thunder god blackout most of the time. R. You deaf or do you want me to draw too? Asked Sif, looking at Freja. Princess Vanner soon said. I know you and some waitresses have already bedded Thor. But how long will you just have fun? Or do you think Thor will approach your father and mother with an offer? Asks Freja. Sif then looked away and frowned. Freja softened her gaze but still continued. I don't want to upset you, Sif, but you seem to forget that Thor is still a prince, as well as the strongest in Asgard high-ranking Asgardian women already have their eyes on him. You may have gotten to him first, but you're unlikely to end up with him, Freja said, her tone soft. Freja didn't want to upset her longtime friend, but that was the truth in her eyes. Sif looked saddened by the facts being told something all the other women noticed. I, I know it might never happen. My family can't offer anything in return for agreeing to marry a prince I'm fully aware of that fact, said Sif. The other Asgardian said nothing. But I've never slept with anyone than him because deep down I hoped in fact I still hope that one day I can wake up next to him, not as a one-night lover, but wife said Sif. Whispering the last word. The young Einarjar then looked Freyja in the eye and said unperturbed. Aren't you the goddess of love? Look me in the eye and may I have your word that you will speak the truth do I love Thor? Said Sif. Freyja looked Sif in the eye and sighed in defeat as she looked away because she definitely knew one thing Sif loved Thor. A feeling that started as a friendship and evolved over the years. So Sif and Freyja want to marry Thor? Just do it someone said with a shrug. It was Nana who had spoken. Such an idea caught the attention of Sif and Freyja. As if it were that simple. Said Freyja. Hell remained silent as she watched the conversation unfold until she quickly left the room. Nana tilted her head in confusion. And it's not? Asked Nana. Of course. For starters, there's the problem of sharing. Said Freyja. Nana responded promptly. Thor is a god now, do you know how many wives Dabog has? Three. Four in winter. Dear friends, you can work it out, but you need to talk to Thor first before anything else, said Nana. Sif and Freyja seemed to consider as they exchanged a look. It was at that moment that Hell appeared with a box. How about we play a game? Thor created this game called Monopoly, and he explained to me how to play it, I'm sure we'll have fun. Said Hell quickly. The Asgardian women looked at Hell and shrugged, joining the table and forming a circle. But then Sif noticed something. Hell where is Fenrir? Outside Thor's house, a bush moved towards a window of the Thunder God's house. As soon as it got close enough, a head popped out of the bush. It was free. I'm going out with some free friends, don't worry free, take care of your social life free. Well I would take care of my social life, sister, but you didn't tell me the part where you would go to the being's house that you drew the face and spread the drawings all over your room, said free, muttering. The Prince Vanner then looked at a window and began to float towards it. But as soon as Free looked up to see what was happening inside the house through the window he was met with a look. A look of a pair of apathetic yellow eyes that belonged to a known god slayer. Free seemed to freeze under the gaze. Only a few seconds passed until Free decided to act. Understandable, have a good night, said Free, as he walked out and out of the area of the house in quick strides. All this time Fenrir was looking at Free, as if expecting Free to turn his gaze back to the house. Unfortunately for Fenrir, Free didn't look back, let alone dare return to Thor's house. Nothing happened the rest of the night in Midgard. But the same couldn't be said for Thor the other day. Location. Territorial limits of future Bangladesh with India. During dawn, Thor came across the first Hindu deity, but he just didn't expect it to be this way. Sorry, could you repeat that again? Asked Thor. At that moment, Igris was also looking at the same thing as Thor. A young woman stood in front of Thor. But of course. I have come to wash away the negativity of your body, said the woman uncertainly. Thor and Igris blinked and exchanged a look. The thunder god then looked at the goddess in front of him. You mean I need a bath? Asked Thor. POV Thor. Well this one I didn't expect. Meeting Ganga and discovering that the woman I was seeing in front of me was part of a river was one of the few moments I was surprised. 
It also didn't help that I didn't understand much of what she was talking about. So are you asking me to bathe in you so I can be cleansed? I asked. Just to make sure after all, this was a strange request for me. Kind of. Just take off your clothes and dive into me, and then I will cleanse you. Said Ganga. Well my mind might be a little degenerate. But then again will she be able to help me with the mark? I know the beauty Zashi informed me to look for Shiva, but I didn't know exactly where the god of destruction lived, and honestly, the more time passed, the more I was afraid of this mark. Because I don't know how to release the seal, and, mainly, I don't know what will happen if I release it. Alright, where are you? I asked. It's kind of tricky to refer to someone who's technically not here not completely in the case. Ganga then looked to the west. I'm a little far away in that direction I'm the first river you'll find, so let's go. As we walk, I can introduce you to some stories from my land, like, did you know that there is a goddess of the dawn who has the most beautiful breasts that make the sky shine? Asked Ganga excitedly as she started walking to the west. I, like Igris, started following the goddess. Yeah must be incredible tell me, do you happen to know Shiva? I asked, wanting to change the subject. I don't think, if I know of the existence of a goddess who bears her breasts to light up the sky, is something important. Oh? Why don't you ask him yourself? Asked a voice, with a childish tone. POV. Third person. Thor broke into a cold sweat, as he didn't notice the being's presence until the voice appeared, but he maintained his composure not to despair, but. Igris, however, soon unsheathed his sword and made a decapitation movement aiming at the source of the voice, which seemed to be a hand's breadth away. Clang although Igris's sword hit the neck the sword failed to tear the skin the sword hit a child, which confused Igris for a few seconds. But not Thor, because the Norse god knew that in front of him was a powerful being. Ganga, at that moment, had approached the apparent child, with palms together and then knelt bowing to the child the goddess, who was the personification of a river, then lightly touched the child's feet, still with her head bowed. The child looked at Ganga and smiled softly. Ganga. I know your goal is to wash the world of negativity so that it can thrive, but in this situation, I'm afraid I have to interfere for your safety, said the child, with black and blue hair. Igris soon get away from the boy, because he soon notices that the boy was not just any child to behave that carelessly, even with a sword at his neck. The child soon looked at Thor, who was standing nearby. Shall we talk in a quieter place? Asked the child with a smile. It was then that the child disappeared and reappeared alongside Thor. The child then placed his hand on Thor, and created a portal that looked like a puddle of water just below him, and so the Norse god and the child sunk into the ground. Igris, seeing that Thor was being kidnapped soon bolted towards the puddle, only for him to arrive too late. Igris then looked at Ganga and raised his sword. Where? shouted Igris, asking about Thor's whereabouts. Ganga, however, remained unperturbed and responded with a big smile. Oh! Don't worry the great auspicious said he just wanted to talk. Said Ganga innocently. Although Igris wanted to question more about what she meant, he didn't know that Ganga could help him at the moment. Furthermore, a feeling of helplessness haunted Igris's subconscious after all, he had just met someone who was on a completely different level, and that made Igris more determined than ever. I need more power, said Igris. Location. One of the particular dimensions of Vishnu KC plus Raya Skara, Ocean of Milk, Thiraparkital, Sacred Sea of Milk. POV. Third person. In a dimension where a vast ocean of calm blue waters was the only thing existing, a small boat, which looked more like a resting bed, which was shaped like a large serpent, floated peacefully. Near the boat, a portal formed in the water, and then Thor along with the child appeared. The child then released Thor and then smiled at the Norse god. Well now that we're here, let's start our little dialogue, shall we? I asked the child. Thor was silent for just a few seconds before he acted. The Norse god jumped to get away from the child, although the dimension was made up of water, it looked like it was possible to walk on the surface, as if it were something solid, although waves could still be made. The child soon raised an eyebrow at Thor's actions. Oh! Am I that scary? Asked the child, with an amused tone, while still smiling. Thor, however, didn't smile at all. He knew who it was due to the description given by Pudiseshi Shiva. In fact, for the first time, the Norse god was nervous, as using Sinjetsu, Thor caught a brief glimpse of Shiva's power, what Thor saw was something terrifying. Thor has already witnessed some of Ra's power. But at this moment if I were to compare Ra against Shiva, it was like comparing a lake against a vast ocean. The difference was absurd between rankings 4 and 2 in the top 10. In fact, each position had its own gap between the other positions in the top 10. Considering that technically I've just been kidnapped, I think my reaction to you is justified, said Thor, as he removed Mjolnir from his belt, and held it in his right hand. Shiva looked at the action with an amused look, but then made gestures with his hands as if to dismiss the action. I'm not interested in fighting right now in fact, I want to try to help said Shiva. Now it was Thor's turn to raise his eyebrow, but you could see the confusion in his eyes. 
How do you said Thor, before quickly breaking off? No I need help? Well, I know Ra, and he told me some things about you at the last meeting between the leaders, so he asked me to help you, a tree will not an eye shade even to the woodcutter, an interesting saying, right? I'm sure you understand the meaning, said Shiva, with a smile. Thor paused for a moment and then put them Jolner away again. Shiva nodded in satisfaction and then gestured towards the serpent boat. Are you ready to talk? Asked Shiva. Thor was silent and then nodded. The Norse god then followed Shiva towards the boat. A short time later, the two were facing each other in the lotus position, Shiva still holding a calm smile, while Thor looked around curiously. Where are we? Asked Thor. This is one of the personal dimensions of the Trimurti, here specifically is Vishnu's resting place, which I borrowed for a while, said Shiva. Thor looked at Shiva. Does he know I'm here? Asked Thor. Shiva didn't lose his smile, but looked on with amusement as he thought about the question. The real question would be who doesn't know? We are very intertwined with the spirituality of the world. From the moment you took the first step into these lands, most of, if not all, the gods and goddess felt at your presence or rather, the negative presence emanating from your back, said Shiva. Sai so what do you want to talk about? Asked Thor. Oh. But wasn't it you who wanted to talk to me? This is what I heard while you were talking to the young Ganga, said Shiva. Thor sweated, but the Norse god then proceeded to remove the robes from his upper body, and turned his back on Shiva. Any advice on how to handle this? Asked Thor, showing his back. Shiva only gave one look, before replying. I won't help, said Shiva. The Hindu god had even lost his smile. Thor froze to ponder the answer. You you won't not I can't or I couldn't, won't you help me because you just don't want to? Asked Thor, turning to Shiva. Shiva just gave an apologetic look. It's not that simple. You are definitely an anomaly, your aura is divided, but there is still a strange connection. If I do something I may end up hurting you more than helping you said Shiva. Thor only frowned, and then softened his gaze as he faced Shiva. Since you won't help me could you please teach me? Asked Thor, as he looked at Shiva expectantly. The Hindu god stared at Thor and then stood up with a smile on his face again. Before I made up my mind, I need to test something, Shiva said. Shiva then began to glow with an amethyst aura that blinded Thor for just a few seconds. When the glow ceased, Shiva was no longer looking like a pre-teen child. Now Shiva was a full-grown male of Thor's height, with blue skin and long black hair, wearing armor and a tunic around his waist, in addition to now having four arms, with one wielding a sword of trident. An albino viper snaked around Shiva's torso, its eyes glowing red. Come on Asgardian how about a friendly little spar? No magic or tricks, just fist Shiva said, with a smile, the trident then disappeared, and the albino snake wrapped itself around his neck. Thor seemed to consider. Why? Asked Thor, confused. Thor was confused as he didn't know the reason for the spar. Shiva still had a smile on his face when he replied. First lesson, everything I ask for, has a purpose, said Shiva, getting out of the small boat and jumping on the surface of the sea. Thor, still confused, chose to follow Shiva out of the boat shortly thereafter. This little spar will give me a brief idea of what level you are at, said Shiva. Thor looked at Shiva. I heard you could read minds, so you'd know my goals and what I could do, said Thor. As they walked away from the place they had just talked about, the boat began to sink into the sea. It was then that Shiva turned to Thor. I can but it seems that the seal is also getting in my way, said Shiva. Thor blinked. Wait, what? Asked Thor. Shiva's smile seemed to have gotten bigger. Yes. Even though it looks like something of malevolent and negative origin, it seems that the seal is protecting you mentally, which intrigues me, said Shiva. There was also another thing that intrigued Shiva Trimurti also could see the future to some extent, but when Shiva used this ability to see Thor's future it was always confusing, as sometimes Shiva saw Thor releasing the seal. It wasn't a good thing. It was worse than the time when Kali went mad. Much worse Shiva asked for a small spar to push Thor to the breaking point, and use the skill to see in which situation Thor would release the seal. Obviously, the Hindu god would stop when he saw that Thor was getting closer and closer to releasing the seal. Thor still looked at Shiva confused, but decided to fight. The Norse god thought it unlikely that Shiva would ask for such a pointless thing, so at this point, he could only trust the Hindu god. So shall we start? Asked Shiva, extending all four arms invitingly. Thor looked at Shiva and then smiled, taking the Mjolnir out of his belt, and placing it inside the necklace's storage space, and then he made a decision. The strongest Norse god, for the first time removed the Jarn Greepers. The gauntlets were specifically created to absorb most of the impact of his heavy blows, and one of the things that were created to prevent Thor from ending up breaking Mjolnir in combat. When Thor removed the gauntlets, he stored them inside the storage space along with Mjolnir. It was then that Thor assumed a fighting stance, hands raised, while Shiva remained standing, unperturbed. Both were smiling at each other. 
It was then that Thor and Shiva disappeared and reappeared just an arm's length away with fists raised. Boom when Thor's fist collided with Shiva's fist, the dimension shook violently on impact. The sea, once calm, had become a raging sea that was only seen in storms. This was just a spar between Thor and Shiva, but if it had happened on the mortal plane at least one country would have already exploded in the collision. Location. Midgard, future Norway, House of Thor. POV. Third person. At Thor's house, at the dinner table, Sif, Nana, and Freyja were in the middle of breakfast after the amused, in Hel's words, night. Hel had left, as she wanted to walk Fenrir around the estate, as Thor denied that Fenrir was a completely lazy resident. So it was an interesting night, don't you think? Asked Nana, with a smile. Sif just shrugged, while Freyja It was, dare I say it was a fun night until we started playing that damn game, Freyja said, her tone grim. Sif sweated when she heard Freyja's tone. Freyja it's just a game, Sif said uncertainly. Bam Freyja had knocked on the table. No. It's. Not. Just. A game. It was created to sever bonds of friendship and love. Said Freyja, with tears in her eyes. Nana looked to the side. You say that because you were the first to run out of gold, said Nana. Sif, however, was irritated. Don't hit the table. It's not your house, if something breaks you'll have to fix it. Said Sif, frowning. Freyja soon realized the actions and quickly withdrew her hand from the table, and had the decency to be embarrassed. Sorry, said Freyja. It was then that someone knocked on the door of the house, which confused the women inside the house, as Hel had left with one of the spare keys. Which meant it was probably a stranger knocking on the door. Sif was the first to get up from the table to answer the door. I'll take care of it, Sif said, as she headed for the door. As soon as Sif opened the door, she raised an eyebrow in curiosity at the guest. Prince Free? Wa Sif said, before being interrupted. Free soon spoke quickly. Hello Sif, is Fenrir in? Asked Free, looking into the house with a worried face. Sif stopped talking but answered shortly afterward. No, he said Sif, before being interrupted again by Free. Great. Said Free, with a smile. Prince Vanner soon entered the house in search of someone. Freja. My beloved sister. I need you. Said Free. As soon as Free noticed Freja at the table, he soon ran towards his sister and grabbed her by the shoulders. I need your help. Said Free, with a worried look. Freja was scared, as much as she disliked some of Free's shameless actions, she still worried about her brother. Free, what happened to you being like this? Is anyone hurt or has someone threatened you? Asked Freja, worried. Free soon looked at Freja as if she had said something strange. What? No. It's all fine, Free said simply. Sif had returned and looked at Free in confusion, exchanging a look with Nana, who shrugged her shoulders at Prince Vanner's demeanor. Freja was soon confused by the answer. So why the cry for help? Asked Freja. It was then that Free soon released Freja, and then the Asgardian women noticed something different Free was blushing. I'm in love, Free said, looking away, and looking out the window with a dreamy glow. The room was silent at Prince Vanner's assertion. You what, now? Asked Freja, her tone empty, as if she didn't believe such a statement. Free then blushed even more. I asked permission from Odin and Baldr to sit on the Lidskiff, so I could see what was happening here somewhere in particular, but I couldn't see through the wall said Free, looking away at the last statement. In fact, Free tried to be smart, asking permission to sit on the Lidskiff, so he could see what was going on inside Thor's house. Without risking his life again. The flaw in the plan was that Thor had already thought that Odin would do such a thing, particularly after the events at Utgard Castle, so he forged runes to block Odin's vision centuries ago, after studying the corrupted ice from the Winter Castle. Unfortunately for Free, he was unaware that Thor had done this, and now it was a favor in vain for using Odin's all-seeing throne. The Asgardian women present at Thor's house frowned as they thought of Free's words. Did you try to spy on us? Asked Freja, frowning. Free soon denied it. No. Initially yes, but... Screamed free at the last word as he saw Nana summoning a rune, Sif drawing her sword and Freja summoning her spear. Free soon continued quickly. Wait. Wait. When I saw that it didn't work, I soon gave up. I then got bored and started watching the other realms. Said Free. The women looked at each other and seemed to consider whether to attack or not. But it seems that Freja gave up first, as she soon sighed in defeat. I've known you for over a millennium I should have known you would try something like that, it's my fault too. Now, although I really want to stab you in the eyes for daring to spy on us, you said something about falling in love right? Who is the unlucky one? Said Freja. Although Freja put away the spear right after the question, Sif didn't sheath her sword, and Nana didn't cancel the rune, it looked like the two were still considering whether it was worth attacking Free for insolence. Free, however, smiled at Freja, though ignoring his sister's last question. You must see her, sister. She's the most beautiful I've ever seen. 
Not beautiful as you but I swear in Bury's name that I would do anything to be with her. Said Free, in a determined tone. Freja looked at Free apathetically. Good, but why exactly I'm needed? Asked Freja. Well there might be a little problem, Free said, with a nervous smile. Freja looked at Free. Problem? What kind of problem? Asked Freja. Free backed away a bit and put the hands behind his back, and then started walking around the kitchen, looking around and refusing to meet Freja's eyes, who was staring suspiciously. Well remember Billy? The Jod and I accidentally killed while taming Gullenbursty? Asked Free innocently. Freja raised a confused eyebrow. Yes, but what does that have to do with it? Asked Freja. Free seemed to consider the next words. Well he has a sister a very pretty sister by the way, said Free. At that moment nothing was said in the house, until Sif, who was looking in shock, dropped her sword on the floor. Nana, with her mouth open, cancelled the rune and looked at Free for any sign of joking. But Freja was the worst. She soon got up and ran towards Free and grabbed him by the shoulders. Let me get this straight did you fall in love with the sister of the Jodin you killed? And now you want my help to make her fall in love with you? Asked Freja, looking Free in the eye. Free had the decency to look embarrassed. Yes, said Free, looking away. As soon as Free answered, a vein popped on Freja's forehead, which was starting to turn red with rage. Location. One of the particular dimensions of Vishnu KC plus Ryaskara, Ocean of Milk, Thiraparkital, Sacred Sea of Milk. POV. Third person. The KC plus Ryaskara was a private resting place of the god Vishnu, after dying as an avatar in the mortal world, being characterized as a calm sea where silence prevails while Vishnu rests in bed and was massaged on his feet by his wife, Lakshmi, the personification of prosperity. However KC plus Ryaskara was now everything but a calm sea. Tsunami's 1000 meters high was created, not by the force of an earthquake, but from a clash of fists. Two figures were running through the rough sea at a speed never seen before. Boom as the sound of an explosion resounded through the dimension, time seemed to freeze as the two figures at the origin of the explosion were revealed. Thor and Shiva. Both of them bumped fists, with Shiva being the one smiling excitedly, while Thor grimaced. It was then that Thor moved and tried to punch Shiva's face again, only for the Hindu god of destruction's hand to stop and grip his fist, causing another explosion that caused the water floor to sink 500 meters below normal sea level. However, Shiva only used his upper arms. Bam the Hindu god's lower arms slammed into the Norse thunder god's hypochondriac region, which resulted in Thor being flung away, splitting the sea in two, until he slowed down. What is this Nordic? Are you even trying? Asked Shiva, his voice resounding throughout the dimension as if it were thunder. Shiva at that moment was urging Thor and pushing him to the limit, whether physical or psychological, so that he could utilize the ability to see the future, and determine in what situation the god of thunder would release the berserker seal. As soon as Thor stopped, he replied, his voice resounding like thunder just like Shiva. I don't fight against someone who has four arms frequently. Shouted Thor, mumbling about the situation. It was ridiculous the dexterity that Shiva displayed in fighting with two extra upper limbs. Also, if Thor were to compare Shiva's fighting style, it would be a dance. A dance with a rhythm that could be described as eternal. This resulted in Shiva never getting tired in a long fight. Aside from Thor's inability to land a decent hit, the Thunder God was doing relatively well, with no bruises or wounds, let alone blood, after receiving a few attacks from the Hindu God. Thor then propelled himself forward, churning the sea and creating new tsunamis, and shot towards Shiva, who raised all four arms and raised his left leg. As soon as Thor got close enough, he punched again, aiming for the God of Destruction's head, but then something, which has happened several times during the conflict, Happened Shiva closed his eyes and lifted two right hands from his upper and lower arms, time seemed to stop when the Hindu god touched Thor's wrist and pushed it lightly to the side of his head. Resulting in a complete change of direction that split the sea and caused an explosion in the distance due to the shockwave from the power the fist had. Shiva soon used his left arms free and delivered a double punch to the side of Thor's chest, but the thunder god raised his leg blocking Shiva's fists before they made contact. Thor soon raised his free hand and grabbed Shiva by the wrist of his upper left arm, and prepared to punch again, this time with Shiva trapped in his grip. But then the Hindu god made a small leap and knee the thunder god in the face, interrupting the Norse god's action, and causing him to step back. And now Shiva was going on the offensive running towards Thor, with all four arms ready for a consecutive series of punches. Thor seeing Shiva's actions raised both of his arms, and just like that, Shiva delivered hundreds of blows per second, but most were being blocked by Thor's forearms. But then something happened that surprised the Hindu god. Bam Thor had surprised him by quickly reaching out with his left arm and hitting Shiva squarely in the face, which sent the god of destruction hurled by the force of the blow. And then Thor smiled. So you really have a rhythm to your dance, huh? Good to know, said Thor, darting towards Shiva. 
As soon as Shiva compassed himself, Thor was already in front of him, preparing to punch him with his right fist. The god of destruction soon prepared to redirect the blow again. But then Shiva's eyes widened, and then the forearms quickly moved to the right side of the body at high speed. Bam Thor had punched him with his left arm, his right arm was just a feint. Although the blow was obvious, Thor changed the attack in a matter of milliseconds. Shiva was only able to perceive the change, as he saw the near future. Shiva then used two of his arms and grabbed the arm and kicked Thor in the neck, causing the Thunder God to be bewildered for just a few seconds. Long enough for Shiva to slap Thor's ears quickly, who quickly lost focus, while punching Thor's chest with both lower arms, where the ribcage would be. Each blow caused thunder in the world, as the water was pushed by the shock waves. For just a second, Thor gasped for air and lost focus, but the Thunder God soon regained consciousness and kicked Shiva's leg, causing the Hindu God to lose his balance. During the loss of balance, Thor landed a punch on Shiva's chest, in the region where the diaphragm was located, causing the god Shiva to spit out some saliva as he lost air and was thrown. However, Thor stopped the Hindu god from being flung too far by grabbing the god's foot and violently pulling him back towards him. The thunder god then quickly turned his body with his extended left arm and landed a blow on Shiva's neck area, making a swinging motion. Shiva gritted his teeth as he fell from the force of the blow that looked like it would break his neck. Just as the Hindu god was taking off, he crossed his arms in front of his body to prevent a high-speed kick from Thor that hit him squarely. Boom Shiva was then flung away, followed by Thor at high speed. As he was flying, Shiva noticed that Thor had an excited smile plastered on his face as he fought, the initial frustration had disappeared and was replaced by satisfaction, now that Thor was finally getting a feel for how Shiva fought in hand-to-hand -hand combat. But there was something else Shiva noticed as Thor smiled. When the Hindu god uses the ability to see the near future the image shown in Shiva's mind is always in the third person, as it is the astral projection itself that sees the near future. There were moments when Thor seemed to be enjoying the fight the berserker mark glowed a mesmerizing scarlet red from time to time. Shiva could feel a feeling that the glow emitted, it was almost like as if the presence in the berserker brand was having fun. While Shiva thought Thor was approaching quickly preparing for a punch, Shiva soon got ready and assumed once again his dancing posture. The Norse god then tried to punch Shiva, but the Hindu god just redirected Thor's fist again, which caused another explosion right behind the Hindu god, who went on the counterattack, quickly punching Thor's celiac plexus in face at the same time. But then Thor dodged the blow by jumping and doing a high-speed somersault, causing Shiva's fists to just miss. It was then that Thor used his heel to hit Shiva's head with a kick right after the somersault. Bam Shiva was bewildered for just a few milliseconds, as he looked at the ocean floor due to the force of the kick, Thor then grabbed Shiva by the chest, turning the Hindu god upside down, and quickly threw him upwards, Thor then grabbed Shiva by the armpits of the Hindu god's lower arms. Thor then threw Shiva towards the ground, aiming to crush his head. The force of the ensuing blow felt like a meteor falling into the ocean, causing an explosion that shook the dimension, and created a clap of thunder that resounded throughout the place. But then something happened right after the clap of thunder. An amethyst-colored glow appeared and blinded Thor for just a second. The sea suddenly calmed down, and Thor stopped his fist before punching Shiva. Not least because the Hindu god was no longer where he threw it. I thought you only said fists why did you start using tricks now? Asked Thor, who then turned and looked at Shiva who was behind him smiling calmly. Thor didn't return the smile, for for the first time he thought he would fight without all restrictions, but it seems that Shiva didn't want to fight anymore. Ha 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 ha. Don't be like that, my friend I've seen what I needed to see. Also, this last blow reminded me how old I am said Shiva, with a sly smile, rubbing his neck a little. The vision of the near future showed Shiva interesting things, but the main one was the answer he was looking for at or would never release the berserker mark, even if Shiva used divine power. This made Shiva look curiously at Thor, as the mark also didn't seem to react to Thor's difficulties. There was something else that also caught Shiva's attention. In a near future line, Thor removed the golden belt, and during the fight, in this specific situation, Shiva was sure of only one thing, that if Thor removed the gauntlets and belt physically, he is already stronger than me thought Shiva, still smiling. Thor then took the gauntlets out of the necklace's storage space and put them on again, while facing Shiva. How did you predict my blows? Asked Thor curiously. Shiva just smiled wider at the question. This is one of the things you will learn by unlocking your Sahasrara, you, as a god, will have a perception beyond time and space, and your consciousness will be open to a new vision that the world offers you, said Shiva, which created a glowing puddle again, which soon began to sink both him and Thor. Thor was a little surprised by what Shiva said after all it meant that Shiva would not only allow him to stay, but also the thunder god was surprised by the Sahasrara's function, after all, it reminded Thor of something else observation hockey. Or at least one of observation hockey's abilities. Will you teach me personally? Asked Thor in surprise. 
Initially, Thor thought Shiva would just assign someone to teach him, but now Thor had the opportunity to learn from the god of destruction himself. Shiva nodded in response to Thor's question. Yes, that and much more said Shiva. Well it can't be that hard, right? Asked Thor, with a smile. But Shiva didn't respond, which made Thor look at the god of destruction. Right? Asked Thor, losing his smile. Time skip. Her Indira 2195 BCE, Age of Thor. 1805, POV Thor. I achieved. It took me centuries of frustration, in addition to my determination being based on the strength of pure hate, but I did it. A bastard version of hockey. Observation hockey was the easiest, as I practically had to merge what I already knew about Senjutsu, in addition to having learned about Sahasrara, and then we have an innovative, not 100% faithful version of observation hockey. Armament hockey was a little more difficult as I had to combine the Tauki with the energies coming from all the balanced chakras, from the Muladhara chakra to the Sahasrara chakra. I still couldn't do such an action unconsciously, since the Sahasrara chakra awakening itself was necessary for all the six previous chakras to be in perfect balance, which is still quite difficult for me to perform right now, but I believe I can improve in the long run. Also, to my disappointment, using the bastard version of armament hockey I created doesn't create a black colored armor. In fact, it just leaves an aura, almost invisible, of pure white color. Shame, but worth a try also, this bastard version of armament was very, very similar to Tauki however, it was much more resistant. If I were to compare Tauki with the bastard version of armament hockey, it would be like comparing an armor made of leather against an armor made of steel. For me, it was a success. About the conqueror's hockey, well I had to be a little creative utilizing the abilities of the Ajna Chakra, which enhances my concentration, as well as gives me the ability to see things beyond the material, and the Sahasrara Chakra, which allowed me to have the ability to be connected with all the energies in the universe, and combining them with my divine power. I found a way to recreate this hockey energy pulses. Basically, using my divine power, I can focus on a certain area, and using the chakras, allows me to focus enough to fire a small pulse of energy that results in a momentary interruption in normal brain functioning, as the nerve impulses of the brain are electrochemical phenomena. It was a success, but it doesn't work as I wanted. If the energy pulse I shoot is too powerful I might end up blowing the target's head off, instead of knocking them out anyway, after learning everything I could from Shiva, in addition to training Igris in my spare time, I decided to continue my journey. I have not met with any Hindu deities other than Shiva and Ganga, the reason for this, according to Shiva, was that Vishnu and Brahma forbade any supernatural beings, other than those I had contact with, to approach me on pain of death. I thought it was an exaggeration, but according to Shiva, it was necessary due to some volatile clash maniac gods like Indra wanting to face me, and possibly try to kill me. I didn't want to get in trouble with another pantheon so I shrugged off the decree. Shiva, however, was a nice guy. I dare say I became friends with him, I was even a little surprised when he introduced me to his wives when he invited me and Igris to his house for dinner. One thing that I found a little strange at the time, was that one of Shiva's wives, who was called Kali, was quite similar to him, when I asked him about this I was surprised by the answer. Shiva had created Kali from a hair of his. Obviously, my mind was confused about what this could mean, so I just closed my eyes and got on with dinner. In fact, even after my departure, I still kept in touch with Shiva and his wives, Shiva had also stated that I was always welcome in his house, which was good, as I still planned on talking to Shiva about creating an astra for me eventually. And here I was approaching the island of Crete in a small boat, where it would be my first stop after I had left India. I was disguised as a mortal, not wanting to attract attention. I was wearing only a men's lionskin loincloth, plus leather sandals, all my clothes, including Jolner, were inside my necklace's storage space. I was wearing the Jingjurd and Jarn Reaper too because I thought it best to have my limiters still being used just for safety. This disguise I created as another secondary function of my necklace for me to use when I wanted to blend in with humans. There was also the fact that this disguise also made me hide from supernatural beings, I just needed to avoid any use of my divine power, and I would be fine. My natural strength should be enough. The reason I disguised myself was something basic after all, I was technically invading the territory of the Greeks, who, apparently, were in the midst of civil war. Actually, this was great, because while the Titans fought the gods, I could just sneak in and meet the Talkeens. The problem was finding these mysterious sea creatures it was then that I saw the island of the future known as Crete and smiled in anticipation. I only hoped to find any clues to the whereabouts of the Talkeens without getting any attention from any supernatural beings, I said. It was then that I started to row towards the island in my small boat, after all with my strength and endurance, I could row for days and not get tired. Also, what are the odds of meeting a Greek deity? 
My luck was never good, but this time I was so careful that I look like an ordinary mortal in the eyes of supernatural beings, only a select few in the top 10 could notice me. Sigh I wish I hadn't left Igris behind, at least I would have had someone to talk to, but he refused to take that armor off, besides, he wanted to go to my house in Midgard sooner. I told Hell, so everything should be fine, I said, reflecting on Igris's situation. For some reason, Igris was strange from the moment I returned from my little spar against Shiva, the first king of civilized men trained fervently every day. It looked like he was training to get stronger for some reason at least it's good he's motivated for something. Location. Greece east coast of the future island of Crete. POV Thor. Ah. Crete. The largest and most populous island in Greece. One of the most important islands for the Mediterranean economy. Home of many myths and mysteries. Truly the Sea of Greece would be a tourist spot worth visiting or at least it would be in the future. At the time Crete was an island. Still the biggest island in Greece. But still just an island. Civilization not very developed, unfortunately. Hello. Could you help me point the direction to the nearest temple? I asked a woman who was swimming next to my boat. The funny thing is that this woman was in the water a little far from the shore if you think about it. Perhaps she was unlucky enough to be swept away by the sea current. Oh. I soon noticed something quite noticeable on the woman's face fins. What are you doing so far from shore, mortal? Also how are you seeing me? Asked the woman with a confused face, a giant fishtail soon appeared in the place where her legs should have been. Bloody hell. Oh, by the gods. I swore I heard something it must have been the wind. After all, I've been at sea for a long time. I said innocently and went back to paddling more quickly, towards Crete. No, you will not fuck with me again Murphy. Wait. Mortal. Don't go there. There's a screamed the woman in a tone of despair. I didn't care much, as I quickly distanced myself from the woman. As soon as I got to the beach, I got off the ship and walked for a while, until I noticed that the entire beach was empty, which was strange, since the civilization of this island was usually quite dependent on the sea, and therefore there must be some kind of village or at least some human presence on the beach. Why is everything empty? I asked confused. And as if to react to my question, something happened. Boom and explosion sound resounded throughout the island and made the earth shake. Right after the explosion sound, something fell like a meteor on the beach, it was a woman with long hair and bright green eyes, wearing only the simple attire of the time, a toga. I considered my choice to walk away slowly, after all, I came here to meet the Talkines, not to interfere with any Greek deities other than them. It was then that something else landed in the vicinity of the woman lying on the beach and caused a shockwave. The thing was much larger than the woman and me, in fact, it was surprisingly the size of a Jodan. I narrowed my eyes as I noticed the thing flashing a confident smile as it walked towards the woman lying on the beach, with each step making the ground shake. What surprised me was that I felt almost no divine power coming from this guy, whereas the woman had a lot more raw power compared to him. In fact, the woman, although she had more power, her physical body was noticeably inferior. It was then that the woman formed a dark blue magic circle and shot a beam of light towards the giant. As it hit the target, the giant's body glowed blue, while a larger magic circle appeared on the giant's head. I immediately realized what the woman had done, and it seemed the giant knew too. Gravitational magic is useless. You cannot defeat me. I am the one who rules the titans just below the master Kronos long before you were born from your mother's womb. You alone will never defeat me, child, submit, and maybe I will spare you said the giant, as he walked towards the woman unperturbed by gravitational magic. Who the hell is this guy? I asked in disbelief. Did the giant's skin seem to nullify the magic effect? No. He was resisting with just brute strength. But again, Shiva was able to do this easily. What caught my attention was what he had said command the titans. It means he was allied with Kronos, and since the rebellious faction of the Greeks is the Olympians, I must assume that woman is a goddess, but which goddess I have no idea. As I stood there, watching the possible fight that was taking place, I felt a presence behind me. I soon turned around but was surprised when I saw who the presence was. What are you doing standing there? Go away and run for your safety. My lady cannot be distracted at critical moments like this, shouted the voice. It was the woman from before, running toward me just as she transformed a fish's tail into long, scaled legs. Oh, but what do we have here? I turned around and saw the giant looking at me, or more specifically, the woman. That is. Your traitorous father and mother, as well as your grandfathers and grandfathers, need an incentive to support Master Cronus in this foolish rebellion that began because of that usurper, said the giant. POV third person. The woman standing next to Thor, identified as Thetis, broke into a cold sweat. It was no secret that Asenus and Pontus, and by extension, their descendants, took a neutral stance, resulting in Cronus's wrath, as he considered such neutrality a betrayal of the rule of Gaia and Uranus's youngest son. Thetis was the only one who took a stand from the entire Asenidus family. Help the Olympians. 
This was due to the fact that Thetis had become friends with one of Cronus's daughters. The goddess Hera. The goddess who at that moment was fighting the giant that Thetis knew very well who she was Atlas go away while you still can mortal, for Atlas, it makes no difference whether you're innocent or not, Thetis said, frowning as she looked at Thor. Thor looked apathetically at Thetis. If you knew what could happen if you followed me, then why did you choose to come here? Asked Thor. Thor thought Thetis would not initially follow him, for various reasons. Although he did not know that a fight between deities was taking place on the island of Crete, Thor suspected that Thetis knew what was happening, and even so, Nereus's daughter chose to come to the shore of the island Crete, following Thor. Thetis softened gaze. My duty is to ensure the safety of mortals. Even if it costs my life, I will come back to save even a baby. To me, every life is precious now go said Thetis, looking seriously at Thor. Thor just looked into Thetis's eyes which reflected the seriousness of her words. I see so you're a fool, said Thor simply. How pitiful too bad I have to spoil the moment. When I send his crushed body to Nereus and Doris, Asenus will remember what awaits him at the end of this war, said the giant, identified as Atlas, as he lifted his foot over Thor and Thetis. It was then that Thetis grabbed Thor's arm and tried to throw him out of Atlas's reach. Keyword tried. For Thor didn't move an inch. Although I consider you a fool for sacrificing yourself in this way, not caring about your well-being it doesn't mean you are someone who shouldn't be respected, said Thor, looking Thetis in the eye. Thetis stopped trying to pull Thor when she saw it was useless, and then looked into Thor's eyes with a worried look, not caring if she was about to be trampled by Atlas. Thor saw that look in a few people. Frigg was one of them. A mother's genuine concern for her children was a look that would make any child show the deepest regret, or even rethink the choices made, only to make the look disappear from the mother's face, as the child's conscience filled with guilt. Thor saw that Thetis looked at mortals as if they were children. Children who needed to be protected. It was then that as soon as Atlas dropped his feet, Thetis made one last attempt to pull Thor out of there. Bam that was the noise that resounded across the beach as Atlas's foot hit the target, kicking up a cloud of dust and shaking the beach, knocking everything nearby. Thetis cried the woman on the beach in desperation for Thetis's safety, as she tried to get to her feet. Atlas had a confident look in his eyes before he started sweating and worry for two reasons, the first reason, Atlas heard something he shouldn't have, and the sound was coming from under his foot furthermore, it was noticeable to Atlas that his foot hadn't touched the ground. Thetis had closed her eyes before being hit, although she still tried to hug Thor in order to protect him. Hey open your eyes, said a voice, beside Thetis. As soon as Thetis opened her eyes, a pair of golden eyes stared at her with a calm gaze. It was then that Thetis realized that Thor had hugged her with one arm and raised his other arm to intercept Atlas's foot. What surprised Thetis most was the effortlessness of Thor, who was holding his foot above his head with just a single arm, as if it were nothing. How? whispered Thetis, witnessing Thor's feet. The Norse god disguised as a mortal only half smiled. Go help that woman you look like you know her, right? asked Thor. Thetis just nodded in response. Yes yeah. She's my friend, said Thetis. Then go help her, said Thor. It was then that Thor lightly pushed Atlas's foot, but the result was that the Titan had lost his balance and fallen to the beach floor, which made the island shake as if an earthquake had happened. Thor soon turned away from Thetis and walked towards Atlas. The Titan had begun to rise, as he watched Thor approach. Who are you know you look like a mortal, smell like a mortal, and feel like a mortal, but you don't act like one. So I will ask what are you? Atlas asked, frowning. Thor didn't give a smile or even an immediate response, and just ran towards Atlas and jumped, surprising the Titan with the speed displayed. Thor was still slowing on purpose, but it was still enough to deal with Atlas. Bam Thor had aimed at Atlas's head and hit his fist just below the Titan's chin, causing the Titan to fly a little off the ground, due to the force of the blow, had been enough to lift the body off the ground. As soon as Atlas fell to the ground, he soon got up when he saw that Thor had leaped towards him again. The Titans soon punched Thor's mid-air body, however, when Thor saw the giant fist coming towards him, the Thunder God only punched Atlas's fist harder. The result was a shockwave that caused the ground to shake, and the winds to pick up speed, however crack arg! shouted Atlas in agony as he looked at his arm. The arm had broken at the slightest contact with Thor's wrist. The Titan didn't have time to compose himself, for in the next second Thor had leaped towards Atlas's chest and kicked him, hard enough to throw the Titan and knock him to the ground. When Atlas showed no signs of getting up, Thor stopped the attack, but then he heard something coming out of the Titan's mouth. Hi hi, Hyperion! said Atlas. It was then that a pillar of light fell from the sky and struck the Titan, briefly blinding Thor. When the Norse god opened his eyes again, Atlas was gone. Thor, seeing that the confrontation was over, turned his gaze to Thetis, who seemed to be healing the other woman named Hera. Both women were looking at Thor as if they had seen something unbelievable. Thor looked at the two women and walked towards them, scratching his head. So are both of you okay? 
asked Thor, with an uncertain smile as he looked at the two women. Location. Asgard North Zone. The northern part of Asgard was known for the highest mountain range in the entire realm, as well as endless storms. For these reasons, it was not a very popular place to live. However, there was only one castle that broke this rule. Thorn Redhamer, Threadheim. The stronghold of power or world of strength. This was the castle that Baldr had given Thor as a gift many centuries ago. The gift was considered the highest honor for any Asgardian, as for that reason, Asgard would be considered impenetrable, as the Aesir house was well protected from all sides. Breedablik, Baldr's shining castle, is located east of Asgard. Sisrumner, Frage's castle, located south of Asgard. Noden, Freeze castle, located west of Asgard. And finally Threadheim, is located north of Asgard. These four castles had the function of protecting the center of the realm of Asgard, as well as protecting the homes of the families of people who have died, where it was located in Folkvinger, a field reserved for dead mortals, where they could build or rebuild their lives. Threadheim, at that time, was being administered by two people. Sif welcomed New Einarjar who wished to serve under Thor's banner, as well as lead them in battle. And Abana, the Sumerian demigoddess who was taken in by Thor during his journey to Sumer, and who was trained by Baldr and Free due to the powers of the young demigoddess, daughter of the sun. At the time, Threadheim had about 540 Einarjar, including Sif and Abana. And now. One more had just joined. What the hell are you doing here? Asked Sif, looking at the new brother in arms. The figure was a tall man, not as tall as Thor, but dressed in armor and carrying a longsword. It was Igris. I came to serve my liege, said Igris. Igris went to Midgard, where he found Hel and Fenrir in Thor's house, however, Fenrir didn't let Igris get too close to Hel. The goddess of death just told Igris, where the Bifrist entrance was and asked the first king of men to go to him. Threadheim in Asgard and assist Sif in managing Thor's house in Asgard. Igris followed orders without question and headed straight for Threadheim. Well you can help me train the new Einarjar that has been summoned. They are inexperienced and most died fighting a moose or a bear, they never fought properly, they just fought for their lives before they died. Do you think you can teach them anything? Asked Sif, crossing her arms and raising an eyebrow. Igris seemed to consider before speaking. I can teach them to not die, said Igris. Sif looked at Igris apathetically, before smiling. Hey hey you and I are going to get along great tin head, said Sif, with a bigger smile. Sif then took Igris to the Threadheim training grounds, which was an open field where large parts of the Einarjar were training hard, while some just watched the training. However, Sif soon caught everyone's attention. Heads up! shouted Sif, her voice echoing through the training ground and stopping the Einarjar. All the Einarjar recognized Sif, as she was responsible for hosting them in these halls provisionally, until the original owner returned. But no one recognized the armored man beside Sif, and some began to assume that it was Threadheim's owner, Thor who had returned. But then Sif interrupted the Einarjar's thoughts. This is Igris. One of Thor's greatest friend and now, along with me, his master at arms. We will be responsible to transform you into respectable warriors, so that you don't die so quickly in Ragnarok, as if you were a farmer who never took a sword. Any question? shouted Sif, looking at the Einarjar in defiance. The brave Einarjar raised his hand. When are we going to meet Thor? Asked the Einarjar without waiting for Sif to notice him with his hand raised. Sif only took a second look and went to answer, but Igris took a step toward the Einarjar. As Igris walked, the Einarjar led the way to the Einarjar who asked the question. The Einarjar who looked like a young man, no more than 17 years old, broke out in a cold sweat when he saw that Igris's eyes gleamed in defiance, even though he was wearing his helmet. When Igris stopped just a few steps away, he only said one thing. Take your sword, said Igris, pointing to the sword, which was in the scabbard attached to the Einarjar's waist. The Einarjar was a little nervous and shook his hand a little before reaching for his sword hilt. But before the Einarjar could draw his sword, Bam Igris had punched the Einarjar in the stomach quickly. The Einarjar around them gasped as they saw the young Einarjar on his knees on the ground, as he spat blood and held his belly. Never hesitate, said Igris, looking at the young Einarjar. Igris then looked at the rest who were staring at him with trepidation and fear. When my liege returns it doesn't matter. What matters is that when he returns he will come across warriors that's my promise, even if I have to make your bones crack, your skin rip, and your blood spurt on the floor for that promise to be fulfilled, said Igris. All the Einarjar were silent as they stared into Igris's glowing eyes. No more questions start running the training ground two full laps, said Igris. A few Einarjar looked up in shock. But the training ground is gigantic, said the Einarjar. Threadheim's training ground was the largest training ground among Asgard's castles. Three kilometers long. Igris looked at the Einarjar who had complained. Two full laps until the end of the day said Igris. Before anyone else could complain about the madness, Igris spoke again. 
If you don't start running I'll kick your bodies until you complete the two laps, and next time you'll do it carrying extra weight, said Igris. No Einerjar dared speak, and soon they began to run on the training ground. Sif just looked at Igris, while giving a small smile. Well maybe he was born for this? Said Sif, with a drop of sweat falling. POV. Third person. Who are you? What are you? Those were the two questions the two supernatural women in front of Thor asked right after the Norse god of thunder had given Atlas a beating. One woman looked on in curiosity the other in distrust. The distrust was understandable, as Thor was a complete stranger. But as the Norse god intended to stay in Greece until he found the Talkines, so he had to be as innocent as possible by the standards of a foreign god. Well, I gained his strength and extended life after having devoured a strange plant out of hunger, as for my name well. Said Thor, before pausing and thinking only to smile right away and answer. I'm Yolia, said Thor, with a smile. Thor couldn't possibly give his real name, so he had to improvise a little. Hmm? That name doesn't sound familiar you're not from here, are you? Asked Thetis. Hera just looked at Thor with a raised eyebrow. Plant? I've never heard of a plant that grants longevity and strength, said Hera, looking suspiciously. Thor, however, smiled innocently. The plant turned out to be the plant of life, you see I am Sumerian, and I came here to escape Enlil's wrath after eating a plant of life without permission, and without having processed it into food, said Thor. The plant of life was something the pantheons near Sumerian knew about, as it was the Sumerian way of turning a mortal into an immortal. However, no one knew what would happen to the mortal who devoured it in the purest form, that's where Thor got the insane strength excuse just a side effect. Thetis and Hera's eyes gleamed in recognition. Well, by all means. Thanks for helping us against Atlas, said Thetis, with a smile. Although I still find it strange for a human to be able to match, much less surpass, Atlas in physical strength, plant life or not said Hera, narrowing her eyes slightly. Thetis soon nudged her longtime friend with a disapproving frown. Hera. He was under no obligation to help us. Even though he was a human, he was still willing to reach out to us, said Thetis. Hera had the decency to look embarrassed. I know Thetis it's just that Atlas shouldn't be here on the island, as it's too far from Mount Othrys, and Cronus would never send Atlas for no reason this is all very strange, said Hera. Meanwhile, Thor listened intently. Outwardly he was expressionless, yet inwardly Thor was thinking about the happenings on the island. I'm unlikely to be the cause of all this, after all, I arrived on the island just now, but according to Hera, Atlas shouldn't even be here, thought Thor. After much consideration, Thor had only one conclusion. Somehow there is a traitor, thought Thor seriously. From what Thor remembers from Greek mythology, the mother of the gods, Rey, made Crete a haven for divine rebellion against Cronus, hiding the presence of her sons and daughters across the island. However, Atlas found them in some way that Thor is unaware of. We better get out of here, said Hera. Thetis nodded, but then glanced at Thor before turning back to Hera, whispering. We can't leave him here every Titan will know who he is since Atlas has escaped, said Thetis in concern. Hera soon looked at Thetis in shock before considering, but Thetis would still insist. Well he saved us perhaps we can trust him, and he will become an ally, said Thetis. Hera soon scoffed. We don't need allies, when the Cyclops gave Hades, Poseidon, and Zeus those weapons, no Titan could stop them, Hera said confidently. But said Thetis, before being interrupted by something. A bird made of yellow lightning swooped down from the sky like a meteor heading for Thor? Thor just looked at the bird in disinterest and remained still. Boom and then the bird hit Thor squarely, kicking up a cloud of dust and shaking the island once more like an earthquake. When the dust cloud settled, it was noticeable that a new figure had arrived on the beach. The figure looked like a teenager with long blonde hair and yellow lightning dancing around him, wielding a silver-colored javelin spear. Another noticeable thing was that the blonde-haired young man's javelin spear was hitting Thor's shoulder, after all, the young man had descended at high speed, aiming at the most likely possible threat, and, by the force of the blow, Thor should at least have broken something. However the Norse god in disguise was perfectly fine. Thor remained staring into the eyes of the unflappable golden-haired youth, and glanced briefly at the javelin spear still resting on his shoulder. The blonde-haired young man only applied more force, causing the veins in his arms to dilate from the pressure imposed. But Thor showed no discomfort at the young man's attempt at strength. I'm not impressed, said Thor. The blonde-haired young man broke into a sweat when he saw that the person in front of him was not an ordinary person. Thor then grabbed the spear quickly, and kicked the blonde-haired young man away, causing the young man to drop the spear from the force of the blow as he was thrown. Hera can only stare in shock before reacting. Zeus! Shouted Hera in concern. Thor looked at Hera briefly in surprise as the goddess spoke the name. So this is the future ruler of the Olympians? Oh I have a unique opportunity here thought Thor. Betis remained silent but noticed something different about Thor's smile that could be described as malevolent. Since for some reason you decided to try to kill me as soon as you saw me. 
How about I return the courtesy, said Thor. That is soon shouted. Eolia. Wait, please. Do not do it. He is our leader and someone of great importance to us. Said Thetis quickly. Thor looked briefly at Thetis. Don't worry I'll just break him a little said Thor, looking at Zeus as he stood up. I don't know who you are or what you are, but give me back my bolt. Said Zeus, extending his hand to Thor. What Zeus was doing was simple, the Olympian's god was calling for the javelin spear that was in Thor's hands, and he expected the spear to fly towards his hand. But the spear didn't even move from Thor's hand, which only worried Zeus for a brief moment, as he thought the spear had chosen another wielder. However, it only took a few seconds for Zeus to notice what was happening, Thor was preventing the javelin spear from flying into Zeus's hands just by the force of his grip. What's wrong little shit? Don't you know how to fight without your toy? Said Thor, raising the javelin spear in amusement, after noticing Zeus's attempt to retrieve the spear. Thor had a satisfied smile. Let me teach you how to fight the old-fashioned way then, said Thor. It was then that Thor ran toward Zeus, who was surprised by the speed and shot yellow-colored lightning at Thor. Thor dodged the lightning and shot towards the sky god quickly, closing the distance and, after making a small jump, raised his knee and hit Zeus full in the face. As soon as Zeus was hit, the Greek god fell to the ground immediately. Thor soon raised his fist ready to hit Zeus's face, only to stop as soon as he realized something huh? Said Thor, looking in disbelief at Zeus on the ground. The Greek god was knocked out. As soon as Thor realized Zeus was knocked out, he backed off shortly thereafter, giving up on fighting any further, and looked at Thetis, who was looking at Thor in awe, and Hera, who was looking at Thor, as if like Thor had just kicked her dog. Bastard! shouted Hera. Hera soon raised her hand and then her eyes gleamed with power, but before Hera could do anything her arm was grabbed by Thetis. No Hera. Our priority is to get off this island, we must rescue Zeus and leave, only Chaos knows how much time we have until Krona sends someone to search the island after Atlas has been defeated, said Thetis quickly, preventing Hera from starting to fight Thor. As soon as Hera realized the situation, the anger was soon dispersed, and the goddess then glowed in a pink aura, as well as her eyes as she raised her hand to Zeus. The fallen god's body acquired a pink aura, and was soon lifted off the ground, still unconscious, and quickly floated towards Hera and Thetis. The Greek supernatural being soon began to float up from the ground, as they looked warily at Thor, who looked at them bored. Once Hera and Thetis reached a certain altitude, they quickly flew in a specific direction, leaving Thor behind still wielding Zeus's javelin spear. Thor glanced briefly at the spear. Does that qualify as a theft? Asked Thor, raising an eyebrow. The Norse thunder god just shrugged and then placed the javelin spear on his shoulders, as he lazily braced his arms, and started walking in a random direction. They'll remember eventually, said Thor, unconcerned. Location. Future Japan. POV third person. A boy, who could be considered a teenager, ran through the forest while carrying a basket on his back. The most noticeable thing about the boy was that the boy had prominent horns on his forehead, in addition to having scarlet red skin. The boy was an oni, one of the many yakai presents scattered across the islands in the lands of the rising sun. And at that moment the boy had only one mission. The young Oni always looked back and sniffed the air a little after running a long distance without stopping, for one simple reason he was being hunted by someone. Sniff is it still close? Said the Oni in disbelief as he noticed a familiar scent. The same odor he'd smelled when he'd seen his parents murdered in front of him. Blood. The boy just looked around for shelter and soon noticed a cave nearby. The young Oni then ran towards the cave and took the big basket off his back and placed it next to some stalagmites. The Oni soon opened the lid of the basket and looked inside with a worried but firm gaze. Pay attention. Don't leave, even if I ask for help, even if you hear something, even if you hear screams, don't leave here only leave when the bad smell is gone I love you, said the young Oni looking into the basket. The Oni didn't wait for an answer, and then took a small vial from his pocket, which contained a light blue liquid. For all five Kodamatsukami. I hope this works as it should said the Oni, opening the vial and pouring the contents into the basket. The young man then sniffed the air a little, and then gave a happy smile. But before I say anything young Oni, why do you run? Are you angry that I fell in love with your mother? Oh, I'm sorry, but love works in unusual ways, resounded a voice throughout the forest. The Oni froze at the voice and then closed the basket and went to the entrance of the cave, jumped to the top of a tree, and waited. Young Oni knew he wouldn't escape, but at least his mission was completed. Don't hate me young Oni. Your mother's face is so unique that I couldn't help but to be hypnotized by her. I'm carrying proof of my true love for her said her voice, getting closer and closer. The Oni began to sweat out of both anger and fear. Anger, for me the young man saw what happened to his father while the voice sang. There is no obstacle in love. His father was impaled alive, in front of the eyes of the young Oni and his mother. 
His mother soon ordered him to run away with the basket and not look back, and the young man reluctantly obeyed as his mother reminded him of the firstborn's main duty. The young man then ran for his life and never looked back, no matter how much he wanted to go back and help his mother. The Oni then saw a figure appearing in the darkness of the forest, propitiated by the night, and could not help but scream in rage and disbelief. Mother? Said the young Oni, looking at the shadowy figure in fact, the Oni was looking at what the shadowy figure was carrying his mother. Or at least what's left of his mother. Just the severed head, with a face frozen in a look of fear. The figure soon looked in the direction of the Oni, who had revealed his position shortly after he had shouted. Oh. There you are. See? I love your mother so much that I decided to cut her head off so I can enjoy the beauty of her face whenever I want. Said the figure with a happy smile, as he lifted her severed head and hugged it tenderly against his cheek. The figure was eventually revealed as the heir to House Valifer Dam of Alifer. The young Oni couldn't help but scream in rage, he then jumped out of the tree and landed on the ground, summoning a giant war club as it descended to the ground, and ran towards Dama. Dama was still smiling happily. That's right. Come to your new father. Said Dama. Dama then dropped the head to the ground and raised his arms in a hugging position. The young Oni soon approached Dama, raising his club, ready to strike the devil mercilessly, cough choked the young Oni, with his blood. The Oni soon looked down and saw a kind of spear made of bone stuck in the center of his chest. The young Yakai soon looked towards Dama, who wore a worried face. Oh, for Lucifer. I forgot to warn you that my bloodline reacts unintentionally in some cases, said Dama. The devil soon ran towards the Oni who fell to the ground, and held him as if he were someone worried. Don't die, son. You were my first son. I didn't even teach you what my clan skill is like, said Dama, with tears in his eyes. Cough Boz cough. Bastard said the young Oni, while coughing as he choked on his blood. What were strange were the purple veins that began to appear along the young Oni's body, originating precisely from the wound caused by the bone spear in his chest. Don't talk to your father like that. It's impolite, said Dama, pouting. The Oni never wanted to kill the person holding him as much as he does now. Unfortunately my blood must have already spread on you it's a pity, but you won't see the sun anymore, said Dama with a sad face. Meanwhile, the boy's eyes, ears, and mouth began to leak a purple substance and began to soil Dama's clothes, which he soon noticed. Hey! It was washed this morning! Said Dama. Young Balifer then dropped the young Oni and dropped him carelessly to the ground, while rubbing the stain on his clothing. Dama then started to leave. I can't exactly stay here, as I don't want to bother the prying eyes while I feed. Although I wanted to invite you to dinner, I was quite upset that you stained my robes, so consider your invitation revoked then it will just be me and your mother having a romantic dinner, said Dama, with a smile on his face. The young Oni, just watched Dama leave carefree and take his mother's head again. Let's go dear. I even have a perfect vase for you, said Dama, blushing, and looking excitedly at the severed head. The young Oni could only look on helplessly as Dama walked away, but only one thing crossed the young Oni's mind at this moment. The Oni looked at the cave once more. Please live please be well thought the Oni desperately, while losing the sparkle in his eyes. The young Oni may have left the mortal plane, but he fulfilled the mission of every older brother. A few hours later a new figure appeared at the entrance to the cave it was a young Oni, and this time it was a girl. And she looked at the fallen and bloodied body of the young Oni from before, with tears in her eyes. Brother? Said the little girl Oni, in disbelief. Although the girl wanted to take a step toward the body, a dark voice startled her. Help me come help me said the voice, mixed with the wind. The Oni child then looked towards the origin the cave she was in before. Come I can help you said the voice again. The girl hesitated for a brief moment, before looking at her brother's fallen body, and turning back to the cave again. The Oni girl then started walking back to the cave. Come little one I can help you said the voice. The girl just listened, but she could see the insecurity in her eyes. Can you can you help my brother? Asked the Oni girl, as she stopped briefly. Child Taddy don't lie said the dark voice, with a warm tone. Hearing the answer, the child started walking again, this time with more confidence. Yes come my first user. Era. 2022 C. Location. Greece Island of Crete City of Heraklion Archaeological Museum. POV. Third person. The Archaeological Museum of Heraklion is one of the main museums in Greece, sometimes considered the second largest museum in the country. A museum with collections from ancient Greece that, although the structure was damaged during the Second World War, all the archaeological collections survived intact. At this moment, a new scientific discovery has just had an impact on the foundations of ancient Greek legends. To better understand the history of humanity, human beings began to investigate, for the sake of curiosity, various things and places, to satisfy the desire to discover more about the world in which they live but for humans, it's necessary to know the difference between a few things, when it comes to discovering something about a time that is long gone, mythology, legend, and history. 
When it comes to common knowledge, it is considered that mythology is defined as just a tale or story that someone created in an attempt to explain something or to make a point, having the presence of supernatural events. A good example is the Titanomachy, which is considered by humans as just a story to explain catastrophic natural phenomena. In contrast, history is defined as a record of events that happened in real life to real people. A good example was the Empire of Alexander the Great, this empire really existed as well as this person, because there are several records about it, although Alexander's tomb was never found, and it still remains one of the greatest mysteries of humanity. However, between mythology and history, there is another classification. Legend. Legend could be defined as something between mythology and history. A good example of a legend would be the famous Trojan War. Humanity knows that some locations, and even characters, of the famous battle, are real, due to several archaeological discoveries in Greece, such as the city of Mycenae and Agamemnon's mask in gold, and in Turkey, where an archaeological site at Hisarlik, next to Anatolia. Near the coast in what is now the Turkish province of Kanakale is located. It is worth remembering that the city of Mycenae was classified as a mythological city, until the ruins were discovered on December 6, 1870, by a German archaeologist. And that same German archaeologist ends up going to Turkey and finding ruins that he ends up assuming as the ruins of another ancient city long lost. Troy. Heinrich Schliemann was that archaeologist. Means that maybe, just maybe, some archaeological discoveries increasingly end up turning something that would be mythological into legend, and from legend to history. And at that moment, a mythological story was being revised, for the reason that a new archaeological find had been found, this changes everything. This, in addition to showing more about Minim mythology before Greek mythology is known, shows the reason for the great advancement in metallurgy and engineering demonstrated. This man was Philippos Papadakis, an old archaeologist who had made a great discovery in the ruins of what was then known as the Palace of Knossos. The old archaeologist if he were younger, would be jumping like a child that had just received the desired Christmas present. However Philippos this just shows that the Minims had a deity focused on construction and metallurgy, but it doesn't explain how the Minims built a sewer-like water drainage system, said one of the people in the closed room. At that moment, everyone was studying an ancient rock crystal vase, which was adorned with a painting. The painting consisted of Minim arts depicting several Minims bowing towards a distinguished figure, which appeared to be wielding a javelin spear in one hand, and what appeared to be a hammer in the other hand. The distinguished figure seemed to be guiding the population to build houses and the sewage system found in the ruins, as well as teaching metallurgy and jewelry making, which many archaeologists would agree to consider quite advanced techniques for the time. Old Philippos was indignant by the argument. The Minin deities we have encountered so far have different art, and details from the population portrayed, the deities are always shown as powerless, but not this one. It's like he's an important figure, but not divine, said Philippos. The people in the room considered, but still showed disbelief at what the old archaeologist was insinuating. So who do you suppose is portrayed in this art? Asked a young woman, who was a university student who was interning at the museum. Philippos had a smile on his face as he answered. That, ladies and gentlemen, could be the first hint of the first leader of the civilization. It is common knowledge that we call this civilization the Minin, because a British archaeologist found the ruins, and named it Minin in honor of King Minos, but this civilization came long before the Minos of Crete was supposed to even born said Philippos. This discovery could change everything for one simple reason also. Look inside the vase and shine a light on it, said Philippos, gesturing. The young university student was the first to approach and did as asked. What happened next surprised everyone in the room except for Philippos who wore a confident smile. Philippos that said one in disbelief. The vase made of rock crystal, when lit from the inside, emitted a glow that had erased all the external paint from before, and was replaced by 1,400 images. But they weren't just any images, as half could be immediately recognized hieroglyphics dating from ancient Egypt of the old empire. Said the young university student, who was closer and recognized some images. But then, these other images said a scientist, this time looking at Philippos expectantly. Philippos if he could, would smile wider. I admit, I also got a fright when I realized. Ladies and gentlemen, you are facing a dictionary of the language of the first great civilization prospers from Greece with the Egyptian civilization, and I did a little work and at least translated, who is this figure by the inscriptions painted on the foot of the vase, said Philippos. This immediately interested the people in the room. What is the name? Asked the young intern excitedly. Philippos only had a big smile on his face when he answered. This is the rough translation I'm the wind, as I guide, I'm water, as I satiate, I'm the lightning, as I'm momentary, I'm the strength, as I'm human, I'm Eolia. Era. 2194, BC, Thor. 1806 years, POV Thor. Well that didn't quite go what I planned, I said, whispering to myself. 
I was at that moment without reaction due to the shock to understand why and what happened to me, it happened right after the Greek deities left. It turns out that although supernatural beings used barriers to interact away from human eyes, phenomena such as an earthquake were interpreted by humans as the wrath of the gods. And that's exactly what happened, the people of the island felt an earthquake, and attributed it to a divine factor rather than a natural phenomenon, and ironically they were right. But as soon as I arrived in a kind of village, I was greeted not as a stranger, but as a divine. The people who live on the island immediately began to kneel before me, as they interpreted that the end of earthquakes, and consequently the wrath of the gods, was due to my presence. Needless to say, I was worshipped as superior to humans but inferior to gods. In short, I was being worshipped as if I were a demigod. The gods rejoice us with their champion. The one who will bring a new era of prosperity to our people. Shouted a priestess. I couldn't help but stare at her robes in amazement. Call me a degenerate, but it's not every day you see women's clothes that show their breasts like it's something to be proud of. Although when I realized what the priestess said, I soon spoke quickly. Wait, it's not what you're thinking I'm just I said, before being interrupted by something. It turns out that while I was gesturing with my arms I did something that activated the javelin spear I still wielded rumble, the result was lightning shooting into the sky and creating rain clouds, as soon as it dispersed look. The champion of the gods bestows blessings on us. Cried the priestess. But I wasn't paying attention to her, but to the javelin spear in my hand. Bloody hell I hope you don't have a conscience of your own like the sleeping Jolner, because if you do I'm shoving you up the ass of the brat who left you behind, I said, whispering to the javelin spear. Unfortunately, I was not graced with an answer from the javelin spear. I then looked at the small group of people who looked at me in adoration and expectation before making up my mind. Well maybe I can have some fun in this quest for the Tolquinius. I soon took Mjolnir out of my storage space and held out my hands while wielding both weapons. I'm Eolia. I said it loud and clear. Hail Eolia. Shouted the people with their hands extended towards the sky. While I'm here maybe I'll help these people out a little the main reason for this was the noticeable smell of prominent shit that was bothering me considerably. I came here for a purpose to give you a gift from the gods. I said. This seemed to cheer people up even more, apparently, I was doing a good job of holding their attention. Well. At least until I told them what I was going to give them. And that is hygiene I screamed to the sky. And it seemed that the sky was accompanying me in the dialogue, because as soon as I said the word hygiene, lightning flashed in the sky, followed right by the sound of thunder. However people looked at me confused hi what? Asked the priestess, looking at me strangely. Well I suppose the saying Rome wasn't built in one day never made more sense. Anyway, it's time to get to work. The era. 2190, BC, Thor. 1810 years, POV. Third person. And so Thor guided these people. In just four years, the god of thunder had transformed a village with wooden walls into a perfectly manageable and tall enough town. Building simple houses and, mainly, a water drainage system, which would be considered the sower too advanced for that time. Thor also taught metallurgy to the people in addition to teaching agriculture, using simple farming tactics like crop rotation, which made the people primarily excel at farming. Thor also created a specialized militia to defend the city from foreign attack, this was because one ordinary day, pirates landed on the island, and tried to plunder the people who welcomed Thor as their leader. Needless to say, Thor didn't like the attempt to jeopardize his investment at all. In what ended up being the people, who would come to be known as Minans, to witness a massacre committed by just one man. Obviously, Thor, after driving out the pirates, was even more adored by the people. And little by little Thor gradually created a place that would come to be known as the greatest military and economic power in all of Greece. The Norse god had not forgotten his mission. The problem was that the Tulchinias were impossible to find at the moment, even though Thor asked local legends about any creature that had a dog's head and a fish's tail, and here was Thor, seated on a throne, located in the palace that he built with his own hands, which at the time surprised the people with such strength shown. Although I knew it wouldn't be an easy mission, and not a quick one I know it will be worth it in the end, after all, having expert blacksmiths immune to any magic, even ancient magic? That's totally broken thought Thor, deep in thought. It was then that a priestess, a beautiful young-looking woman, entered the throne room and caught Thor's attention with her presence. But Thor glanced briefly at the priestess's chest which, just like when Thor arrived on the island, was still completely exposed breasts, despite wearing a long dress. Four years it's been four fucking years, and I haven't been able to change people's opinion about this damn women's outfit. Exalt beauty they say, sure respect for the great mother they say, but if I didn't know better, this garment was created by my old man. Thought Thor, as he frowned and a vein soon pop in his forehead. Though Thor could use magic to alter the minds of the people who adopted him as their leader, he refused to use such an action, mainly because it gave shudders over the evils of mind control ability. The priestess, as she approached, noticed the grimace on Thor's face and showed concern. My king is something wrong? 
asked the priestess, moving even closer. While Thor was distracted the priestess approached and stood behind the Norse god, and began to massage Thor's shoulders, and the Norse god jumped out of his throne as soon as he noticed the priestess's touch. Xenia. What do you think you are doing? Asked Thor, looking at the priestess suspiciously. The priestess, identified as Xenia, looked confused. Oh? I'm giving you what you taught us, I believe massage was the name, Xenia said innocently. Thor didn't believe it at all. After all, as soon as Thor finished building the city, the people pressured Thor to marry any woman he was interested in, for the simple fact that the people believed that Thor, just as he appeared out of nowhere, could disappear out of nowhere when the people no longer needed him. For the people believed that Thor, or in this case Eolia, was like lightning momentary. As soon as it appeared, it will disappear. And after this people suffered from drought, winter, and pirate attacks, hardly the people would want to let their savior who brought the safety and prosperity leave. So the people plotted behind Thor's back to seduce the Thunder God in disguise. Whether single or married, every woman would try to seduce Thor, so as would be sure that Thor would stay, or at least the people will have an heir to their savior. Unfortunately for the people, Thor saw the attempt as soon as he noticed the first not-so-discreet movement of the people. The attempt was simple. One night, Thor's room, which should have been empty, was occupied by ten women, all virgins and unmarried, completely naked, waiting anxiously for Thor. As soon as Thor opened the door and came face to face with the women, the Norse god in disguise did only two things, the first thing was to blink his eyes once, to guarantee he wasn't seeing a hallucination the second thing. He closed the door right away, but not before yelling for the women to get dressed immediately. Thor ended up sleeping outside of his palace, while muttering about there must be an old FBI god, due to the fact that the women in his room, would be the women who had just demonstrated that they were fertile, this meant that the women were between 10 and 16 years old. Needless to say, Thor didn't return to the palace anytime soon still, in that period of four years, the people gave themselves a name, and soon after Thor was consecrated as the first king of the built city. Aeolids. Finally, the people could assume an identity, and they became an organized society in the city their king called Nassos. In this society, everyone was equal, whether male or female, as long as everyone worked for prosperity. This brought the Aeolus a sense of indebtedness to Thor, who only disregarded the feeling of indebtedness, which resulted in a people a little too loyal, cough and attic cough, to Thor. Thor was increasingly tempted to abandon these people and descend away. Never mind what do you want here? Asks Thor, raising an eyebrow. Priest Asenia then flashed a smile as the young woman's eyes gleamed. My king. The gods arrived and they order a feast. Said Xenia. Thor just swore mentally. How great, would you please prepare a feast? Asked Thor. The priestess nodded excitedly as she hurried out of the throne room to warn everyone to prepare the feast. The thunder god was waiting for the Olympians to come to him again in search of the javelin spear in his possession, or to come to meet the strong immortal human who defeated Atlas with his bare hands. When the feast was laid, unfortunately for Thor it wasn't who he expected. I see that you, human, know your proper place. But I can't help but be surprised about such a city, said the figure. The figure could easily be described as the most beautiful woman in the room, but Thor was not currently looking the woman, but the other figure, who was looking around in disinterest, and it was a tall man who wore luxurious robes. The reason for this was that the figure Thor was looking at gave off a bit of the same feeling that Thor felt when he was in Freeze Presence Harvest. To Thor, there was no doubt at all that this guy was the leader of the current Greek pantheon, which was facing a rebellion that would decide the rulers at the end of the entire civil war. Thor gritted his teeth and forced a smile as he bit back his pride in order not to cause any misunderstandings that could lead to conflict later. I do not deserve to be in the presence of your deity I invite you to grace my people with your presence at a feast made especially for you, said Thor. Thor then stiffened as he bowed a little, in order to show respect to the deities. Enough Themis it's not time for your game said the man, who was beside the woman. The woman, identified as Themis, let the man pass so that the man was in front of Thor. Where did you get that spear? The man asked, after a brief glance at the javelin spear Thor wielded. Thor froze but not in fear. As a gift, it was given to me. The spear fell from the sky like lightning, and I wielded it as I was called by it, said Thor. The man in front of Thor narrowed his eyes briefly. I feel the touch of my brothers I suppose they were the ones who forged such a spear, although they are so ugly, they can be expert smiths give it to me, said the man. Thor at that moment looked into the man's eyes and said just one word that would shock both the supernatural beings present and the servants who were serving food and drink at the table, and waiting for the gods and the king to be seated. No, said Thor. The man froze for just a second before a frown broke out on his face. What did you say, mortal? Asked the man. Themis frowned in concern, even though she was the titan responsible for law and order, she couldn't protect anyone from her younger brother's wrath, especially when he has a weapon capable of killing anyone at the mere touch. 
Meanwhile, the servants looked at Thor in shock, and were afraid of divine rebuke, for if there was one thing earthquakes taught the people of the island, it was that the gods were easily irritable and cruel. I said no do you want me to draw the word too? Said Thor, again loud and clear. If possible, the man's expression turned icy. You despise your supreme master with such arrogance. Tell me, mortal, do you court death? Asked the man. Thor raised an eyebrow. You come to my house and ask me to give you something of my own, you don't mind the hospitality I offer, and I'm the arrogant one? Alright then get your shitty ass out off my island, I'll count to five till you get out of here, or else I'll have to fix a new wall, Thor said, frowning at the end. The man didn't like the threat at all, although he found it amusing that the mortal was threatening him, the man was more outraged at the behavior shown. You insolent. I'm Cronus, your absolute lord, for your arrogance I will quarter you and feed your flesh to your people, while I starve them to death shouted the man, identified as Cronus. Cronus then took a scythe, which was on his robes, attached to a belt, and raised it over his head, ready to kill the mortal in front of him. Last words from you asked Cronus, before being interrupted quickly. Five, said Thor. Bam Thor quickly kicked Cronus, causing the Titan leader to crash through the wall, and throwing him away from the city. Thor then looked at Themis, who had a nervous face covered in sweat after witnessing the action. Why are you still here? Get your ass out, said Thor. Themis soon emitted light and quickly disappeared. During this time all the palace servants looked at the action in shock, their faces sweating, eyes bulging and mouths open. It was then that the priestess named Xenia was the first to come out of shock and shouted excitedly. Hail Eolia! The slayer of evil gods! Cried the priestess. The rest of the servants shouted excitedly in agreement. Thor, however, sweated in response and proceeded to exit through the same hole he'd thrown Cronus into and looked to the horizon, expecting some retaliation. Cronus's answer came shortly after as Thor walked through the hole in the wall, for the sky was covered with thick clouds, and a voice resounded throughout the island. Mortals your king insulted your sovereigns, and now we will have to judge them, don't ask for mercy, for I won't have it, I arg. Shouted Cronus's voice in pain. The reason for the pain was simple. Not long ago, Thor dubbed the bastard version of hockey something else Viljesterk. Basically, the three capabilities were. Archer. That was the hockey of observation. Knight. That was the armament hockey. King. That was the conqueror hockey. Thor had just used the Viljesterk archer to determine Cronus's location, and immediately hurled the javelin spear towards the non-stop talking target. The result was Cronus being hit, with the javelin spear piercing his stomach, resulting in the leader of the titans falling from the sky to the earth, creating a crater. Thor just ran towards Cronus's fall, while ordering his people to take shelter and not leave their house. When the Norse god reached the crater made by the titan's fall, Thor just jumped and fell to the center, as he faced the wounded titan who tried to get up, even though the javelin spear was stuck to his body. Cough what are you cough mortal? How did you get this power? Asked Cronus, as he coughed up blood. Thor didn't answer the questions and just ran towards Cronus, and grabbed the javelin spear again before kicking the titan leader, removing the spear from Cronus's body, while flinging the titan until he hit the crater wall, as the kick was considerably weaker than the first. Cronus then stood up and swinging the scythe in his hand, made a slash in the air, and briefly surprised Thor at the effect. Time seemed to recede in Cronus's body, as the javelin spear wound soon closed. Thor wasted no time and soon ran towards Cronus, ready to pierce the titan's head, however. Before Thor could approach and perform the blow, plant roots with a green glow, sprang up from the ground, and grabbed both Thor and Cronus. While Thor was confused by the action, Cronus looked down at the roots and spat out a name. Mother, said Cronus, with a grimace of disgust. The roots then released Cronus, and the titan looked at Thor who was still trapped by the roots. My mother seems to like you for some reason I think our conversation ends here king of mortals, but know that the moment you leave this island, I will have your head adorning my throne, Cronus said, creating a magical circle. Thor looked at Cronus and did something that surprised the titan. The Norse god just pulled the roots that emitted a green glow and ripped them from the ground, easily freeing himself from the prison, while looking into Cronus's eyes. But how? It has my mother's power I see, the spear gave you power, didn't it? But will not matter in the end said Cronus, looking at the javelin spear. As Cronus disappeared he saw something that made the old titan's blood run cold in fear for just a second. Step in my house again I'll rip and tear you apart until it's done, Thor said with a bloodthirsty smile. Although the threat was usually seen as insolent and, above all, laughable, for some reason the leader of the titans took the word of the mortal in front of him seriously. Location. Mount Othrys. POV. Third person. Mount Othrys. At first glance, it was just an ordinary mountain, located in the center of Greece. But when it comes to the supernatural world, there was a portal at the top of the mountain, which led straight to the abode of the current rulers of ancient mythological Greece. The Titans. 
who came to rule Greece after Cronus's successful rebellion against his father, Uranus. Cronus was the god of harvest and the youngest of the titans, it should be impossible for him to win a fight against Uranus, the primordial of the sky. But he had help. Gaia, the primordial of the earth and mother of Cronus and Uranus. The help was through an object that would become the main responsible for the victory the sickle. With this weapon, Cronus acquired the ability to reap time as well as tear apart space, a feared weapon forged by master blacksmiths who live in secrecy the Talkines. As long as he wielded such a weapon, Cronus believed he was unbeatable. But recent events have proven otherwise arg. A voice rumbled in fury from Castle Othrys. This roar of fury was from Cronus, who was at that moment hurling or destroying anything in his path, inside his quarters. As Cronus destroyed the furniture, someone knocked on the door, awakening the titan of blind rage. My king your people await you, said the voice. It was Themis, and since returning from the island. The goddess of order and justice was quieter than usual. As soon as Themis finished speaking, the door swung open abruptly, with Cronus exiting the room with a scowl that never left his face to the meeting place with their main allies. But as soon as Cronus arrived in the meeting room, where's the rest? Asked Cronus, gritting his teeth, hoping for a good answer. There were only six people in the room, including him and Themis. The first figure was a tall man with long white hair who seemed to have a glowing aura, though his face remained an expression of apathy. This was Hyperion, the titan who represented the personification of light, husband of Thea, who was not present at the time. The second figure was a beautiful woman, with long green hair and emerald eyes who wore an amused smile. This was Phoebe, the titan who represented the moon, and wife of Cus, the titan of intelligence and knowledge who was currently missing, as well as the mother of Asteria, who was also present, and Leto. The third figure was another beautiful woman, with long blonde hair, and the same emerald eyes inherited from her mother. This was Asteria, the titan who represented shooting stars and, to a certain extent, prophecies, as well as being the mother of Hecate. The fourth figure was a muscular man, fully armored, wearing a helmet and black robes, this man exuded a black aura of pure violence and bloodlust. This was Pallas, the titan who represented war. Cronus was upset, for the reason that although he didn't have the support of a few titans, he hoped they all had heeded the king's call. My king, my husband Perseus was following the trail left by our ally, however, it seems Metis and Rey, as well as their sons and daughters, left the island quickly, Asteria said, bowing a little. Atlas refuses to go back to that island, said Hyperion, closing his eyes, as if expecting an outburst from Cronus however, although initially, Cronus was going to complain. The king of the Titans stopped and thought about what had happened on the island a short time ago. Who has had carnal relations with any mortal? asked Cronus, with a tone of demand. No titans in the room raised a hand, but Hyperion scowled. Why do you ask such a question, my king? No one has broken one of your laws, we have always been loyal to you from the moment you took our father's power, said Hyperion. Cronus, however, was not at all pleased. There's a mortal king on the island he's different, Cronus said. Pallas showed disbelief. A mortal? Different? Brother, mortals are all the same, they are weak animals that crawl on the ground and kiss our feet expecting something in return, they are nothing special, you don't expect the palace said. Bam a noise resounded through the meeting hall. That noise was Cronus who pulled the table and shattered it completely, while showing a look of fury. He was everything but weak. If it weren't for Gaia's interference, I would have butchered him as I did my father, and I would starve his people to death, just so they would learn their lesson about any attempt to defy me. Shouted Cronus, roaring in rage as he looked at Pallas, who fell silent after the scream of fury. However, someone had found the explosion amusing. Oh! What's this little brother? I haven't seen so much hate since Ray betrayed us, Phoebe said, with a teasing smile. Don't. Provoke. Me. Phoebe. My patience has limits. Said Cronus, looking at Phoebe. The Lunar Titan only raised her arms in surrender, although she still had a smile on her face. It was then that a new figure entered the room. This figure wore black and purple robes, in addition to wearing a kind of mask with three thorns, one on each side of the face and one on the forehead. This was Perses, husband of Asteria and Titan who represented the personification of destruction. Hail Cronus, said Perses, as he bowed. Cronus looked at Perses with interest not seen since the beginning of the meeting. Where? Is my usurper wife Perses? Asked Cronus, his tone grim as he waited for the Titan of Destruction to respond. Although he wore a mask, Perses looked nervous, I investigated the island almost completely I found tracks that indicated that said Perses, before being interrupted. Wait, almost completely? Why not the whole island? Asked Hyperion, narrowing his eyes. I was not allowed, said Perses, resolutely. The temperature in the room seemed to drop. Not allowed by whom exactly? Asked Cronus, gritting his teeth. Perses seemed ashamed to speak. By Gaia, said Perses. The room remained silent until Cronus asked with a face of disbelief. Gaia? Are you sure? Asked Cronus. 
The Harvest Titan didn't expect Gaia to stop purses from investigating the island, and just thought that Gaia was protecting the king from mortals for some petty reason, but it seemed like there was something more to it. Chromis didn't like his mother's recent behavior, as the Earth Primordial was usually just watching or even sleeping, never taking a more active role. There was only one time that Gaia acted actively in Chromis's rebellion against Uranus. The thought of that possibility made Chromis's blood boil with anger. Do you really think you can discard me as you discarded my father, Gaia? Thought Cronus, darkly. My King A voice woke Cronus from their thoughts. It was Themis, who for the first time had chosen to speak since bringing Cronus into the meeting room. Speak Themis, said Cronus. Themis seemed to consider before responding quickly. Perhaps it would be better to change our approach a little bit towards the rest of our brothers. We can become Gaia's allies again and win the war if we free Hecatonchur Zendak. Themis was interrupted quickly, before even finishing with her proposal. Cronus had grabbed Themis by the neck and lifted her off the ground. The Titan King stared at Themis, eyes blazing with power, those disgusting things are not my brothers, if you dare suggest such an action again you will join them, said Cronus. The Titan King then dropped Themis, who fell to the ground while coughing and rubbing her throat, and Cronus looked at Pallas and Perses. You two get back on the hunt, if Rey isn't on the island, she can't have gone very far without our ally leaving no message, crush any human settlement in search of any trails left behind her information, said Cronus. Pallas and Perses nodded and then quickly left the room, meanwhile Cronus turned his gaze to Phoebe and Asteria. Look for the whereabouts of Hecate and Leto, these two disappeared suddenly, without notifying me of their absence or presenting any justification, it's enough for Kus to have disappeared after going further north, said Cronus. Phoebe and Asteria both looked serious and soon left the room, at last, Cronus glanced briefly at Themis, who was getting up from the floor. Go do something useful, get Atlas, find and bring me the Telkines I want more weapons said Cronus, leaving the room. When Themis noticed that she was alone, she just scowled. I still don't know who's giving them information. But I need to let Rey know anyway as I won't be able to help her for a while, Themis said, whispering as she reflected on her thoughts on the new developments. If Cronus had any spies, Zeus had the Titan Themis as a spy to counterbalance the war, in addition, Themis had decided to help after witnessing Cronus's growing paranoia, who was already looking more and more like her father, Uranus. But there's still something I don't understand, why would Gaia get involved? thought Themis, as she left the room. That was the only question on Themis's mind, and no matter what reason Themis would like to justify her mother's actions, she didn't have a concrete answer. Location. Future Island of Crete Palace of Nassos, aka. Thor's Vacation Colony. POV Thor. This was getting too stressful for my taste I had just returned to the city I found, where I was greeted by my people on their knees as they shouted praises to my name. After a long day and a little discussion with the governing body of the Greek pantheon, I hope to go back to my palace, lie down and get a good night's sleep. But as I opened my bedroom door, I realized I had a guest. A guest who invited himself into my room without my explicit or implicit permission yes, I already started on the wrong foot in this encounter. May I know who you are? I asked. The person, who was a beautiful woman with long green hair and blue eyes, was lying comfortably on my bed and smiling like she wasn't doing anything wrong. Well, I have many names. But if you hear my proposal, you can call me whatever you want, said the woman. That's not what I asked, I said dryly. The woman then sat up and crossed her legs. If you hear my proposal, I can give you the leadership of the deities of this territory, think about it mortal, or should I say immortal? Said the woman with an amused tone at the end. So she knows I'm at least an immortal and therefore a supernatural being, the question is whether she knows I'm a god, how do you know I'm an immortal? I asked innocently. The woman just smiled. It's easy to find remnants of some food of immortality, I assume you fed on the golden apple from the orchard guarded by Leyden, correct? Asked the woman. Thanks. For the useless rule of eating your apples, Iden. Yes, I replied. Well, it's the first time I've seen someone like you, said the woman. The woman then got up from the bed and walked towards me, as she approached she raised her hand, as if she wanted to touch me and not. As soon as I noticed the action, I immediately aimed the javelin spear with the spearhead just a few inches from her direct eye. The woman had stopped the action, but she wore an amused smile. What is it? Are you afraid of me child? I can fulfill all your wishes said the woman. I scoffed internally. Can you give me an infinite supply of wine? I asked. The woman just blinked in confusion but didn't lose her smile. Well no? Said the woman uncertainly. It was a rhetorical question, but I should have known better to ask such a question. So you don't have my curiosity, let alone my attention I suggest you leave this place, I said. It was then that a huge presence suddenly appeared. An aura of white color covered the woman, who no longer wore a smile, and caused her to crack my palace. This is vandalism. Before I could say anything or complain about her breaking into my house, the woman's aura quickly faded, and the woman smiled again. 
The smile might even look cute. But after how had she just acted? Smile with a 99% chance of being fake. With the other 1% being a chance of being a sneer. As I was saying my name is Gaia, and I want you to fight for me, in return, you will have the power to rule and, depending on your taste, any goddess or god in your bed, said the woman, identified as Gaia. Oh. So the same person who usurped the first son husband wants to usurp the son grandson, let's make a bet? I asked. Gaia soon raised an eyebrow. What kind of bet? Gaia asked. It's a simple bet if I win you leave and never set foot on this island again, if you win I'll do whatever you ask for a certain time, I said. Please don't let her notice the obvious, I'm a primordial existence, I don't need to win a bet to have you I can just force you, said Gia, her eyes twinkling slightly. Shit. I soon used a Viljester archer and jumped back before Gaia turned her fingertips into roots in just a blink, and tried to catch me. Oh. Interesting, besides you being able to tear my roots, imbued with my primordial divine power, you can predict my movements, the idea of someone special like you, even being human, by my side sounds more and more tempting, said Gaia, blushing. Well. That wasn't ideal. A mad primordial deity with the sole purpose of bringing me to her side. I can kill her, I was sure of it, but the price would be high, too high if I fought everything from the beginning in the human world, but then I saw Gaia freeze, as if wondering what to do. I just braced myself and waited for some attack by activating the Viljester Archer to predict the movements. But the attack never came. It would be a waste, said Gaia. It was then that the roots returned to being fingers in Gaia's hand, and the Earth Primordial then walked towards me and stopped close in front of me. Think about my proposal human. I can give you everything if you release my children in Tartarus, you would be the greatest king this world has ever seen, Gaia said, before summoning a magic circle, and finally leaving my room. Little did she know I'm not interested in being a king for too long, I have an agenda to complete. Once I find the Telkins and bring them into my pantheon, I will prepare for whatever possible situation the Great Biblical War will bring. But if there was one thing that caught my attention, it was Cronus's sickle it was quite an interesting weapon, after all, if I noticed correctly the cut that tore through space, made the wound made by the javelin spear go back in time. Basically, Cronus's wound goes back in time and healed the wound thanks for the sickle. This is quite useful if you are thinking of using it for other things. And I could suspect that this was not the sickle's only ability. Although I wanted to think more about the sickle, something snapped me out of my thoughts, what made Guy reconsider trying to capture me? POV. Third person. While Thor was lost in thought, he didn't notice that behind his bedroom door were three priestesses, along with two servants, wanting to speak to the king about his recent confrontation against the gods. The mortals had heard the entire conversation and were increasingly concerned if the king chose to leave the people in the Send to Godhood. There was something else they heard. They just found out that their king was immortal. All of you, go back and spread the word, we have to make sure our king Eolia wants to stay, whispered a priestess, assigning orders as she looked at the others, who nodded quickly. As everyone quickly left, the priestess just thought. An immortal king. Our people will only know prosperity, said the priestess, with a happy tone as she walked away from Thor's room. While Thor had a small meeting with Gaia, a small group was heading towards more central Greece. All the people in the group had supernatural appearances that enchanted any mortal who saw them. This group was what would come to be known as the Olympians, who were fleeing the island four years after the appearance of Atlas, all was in constant motion, and never staying in a single moving place. The group consisted of first the gods and goddesses. Zeus, the leader of the rebellion, and a god with an affinity for lightning. Hades, Rey's first male child. Poseidon, Rey's second son. Hestia, Rey's first child and the first to fall into Cronus's stomach. Hera, Rey's second daughter and the one who fought Atlas while going to save Thetis. Demeter, Rey's third daughter. And finally the Titans. Rey, the Titan of fertility and motherhood, mother of the group's gods and goddesses, as well as being a longtime friend of Frigg, the wife of Odin. Metis, the Titan of health, protection, cunning, prudence, and virtues, as well as being the recent first wife of Zeus, and the one who helped Zeus free his brothers and sisters trapped in Cronus's stomach. And finally, Maya, who was one of the seven daughters of Atlas and Pleon, sought to follow Rey in the rebellion. At that moment, the group was heading towards the place that would come to be known as Mount Olympus, and throughout the trip, I already said it, and I will say it again, we need to go back. Said someone, complaining. That was Zeus, who still hasn't forgotten the humiliation he suffered against a human, in an attempt to impress someone by showing off. Also, in the eyes of Zeus, the mortal had the audacity to steal it. He still has my master bolt. A gift given to me by the Cyclops and I want it back. Said Zeus, with a firm tone. Duray, it looked like her youngest son was having a tantrum, for it looked like a kid had just picked up another kid's favorite toy. If Atlas was on the island, we would never be able to stay on it for long. 
only the three of us could face him with the help of our spears, none of the rest of us could win without weapons, said an emotionless voice. This was Hades, who made such a statement while facing Hera, who noticed Hades's gaze. I couldn't just let my friend die. Thetis might have died if I hadn't interfered, said Hera, in revolt. Hades just snorted in response. And then you would simply risk the safety of the rest of your family yes, good idea, Hades said, with a mocking tone. Enough Hades, it wasn't her fault, said Zeus, while looking at Hera with a smile. Hera blushed in response, which annoyed Metis a bit as soon as she saw Zeus's actions, but she soon brushed it off. It was at that moment that Rey spoke. Enough my children, don't argue, said Rey. Forgive me, mother, said Zeus, Hades, and Hera, at the same time. Rey just smiled in amusement, before looking at Hera. So my daughter could you tell me more about the human who helped you and Thetis against Atlas? Asked Rey, with interest. Hera proceeded to tell how a human had easily defeated one of the most powerful titans, and left a good impression on Thetis. In addition to knocking Zeus out with one punch and stealing the javelin spear, known as Master Bolt, which made Zeus a little grumpy. I slipped and hit my head on the floor I was out for only a year, said Zeus, grumbling. Metis then approached Zeus and placed her hand on the god's shoulder, trying to show support, but the action was ignored by Zeus. Poseidon, Maya, Hestia, and Demeter remained silent throughout the journey, though it was possible to detect a small frown of displeasure on the face of someone in the group who stared at Rey in disgust. Someone in the group was betraying Rey's trust, and was passing information to Cronus in exchange for amnesty, there was an imposter in the group. Location. Underworld Devil Capital. Lilithu Lucifer's Castle. Meanwhile, in a place far from Greece, a meeting between the Morning Star and his most loyal confidant was taking place, the discussion was about the preparations for the war, that, if it followed the schedule, would start in less than two millennia and a half. Stolas how is our little project? Lucifer asked. All is going according to plan my king however, I still haven't been able to solve our race's low fertility problem, although Lord Dama is bringing more and more interesting specimens for me to study and find the solution, the searches have proved fruitless said Stolas, lowering his head a little in defeat. Lucifer only showed a frown. Apparently my father has ensured that our race has more birth problems than the rest of supernatural beings, Lucifer said, reflecting on what his father had done. Stolas at this point was a little uncertain to speak, but he chose to ask a question that had been plaguing his mind since the moment he allied with Lucifer. My king, if I may ask you said Stolas, asking permission to speak. Lucifer awoke from his thoughts and looked at Stolas with a raised eyebrow. Say it Stolas what question do you want to ask? Lucifer asked. Stolas, hearing that he was allowed to speak, soon proceeded with the question. My lord why do we wait? We can start the war now, so why are we still pooling resources? Asked Stolas. Ha 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 Lucifer's laughter echoed through the room and made Stolas, even though he was one of the most feared devils in the army, break into a cold sweat, the laughter soon stopped as Lucifer calmed down, and looked with an amused smile at Stolas. Stolas tell me what you think of my father, said Lucifer. Stolas was a little uncertain whether to continue speaking, after all, Lucifer's displeasure with his father was known to the entire devil race. You're your father is someone powerful, said Stolas, before being interrupted quickly. He's a hypocrite, Lucifer said, his tone grim. Stolas was silent and waited for what Lucifer would say. When I was born as an angel, I was perfect. I was the best, Lucifer said, with a melancholy tone. But then when I saw the appreciation he had for the humans he had created I saw the truth, Lucifer said. The king of the underworld, as he spoke, recalled the events that had led him to the rebellion. He defends free will, but he treated us like servants, he bestows mercy, but only for those who suffer by his actions, he wants to impose himself a sovereign or superior, even when he claims freedom and peace, Lucifer said. It was then that the temperature of the room dropped as if the room had been teleported to the middle of the land of Cossidus, the land where the cold reigns. If I am his image and his creation there is nothing fairer than that I ascend equal to him, or ascend even higher than him, but I need more and more resources to invest in my campaign against heaven again, because the first rebellion showed me I need more power to fulfill my ambition, said Lucifer, with a cruel smile. Stolas froze when Lucifer says the next words. I will be God location. Greece future island of Mykonos. POV. Third person. On an island paradise on a beautiful night, an extremely beautiful woman was sitting on the sand with her legs crossed. That woman was Gaia, and at that moment she was waiting for the person who stopped her from capturing the strongest human king she had ever seen. Time seemed to freeze as the space in front of Gaia, over the ocean, seemed to crack. A fissure opened over the sea, and a foot wearing golden armor stepped into the water, which made any wave cease to exist. A figure began to walk on the water, and with each step, it approached the Mother Earth of the Greeks. Once the figure was only a few steps away, Gaia stood up and frowned at the figure. Fatim, said Gaia, in disgust. 
The figure, identified as Fatim, just remained with his eyes closed and showed a calm countenance, even identifying the displeasure visible in Gaia's tone. Daughter of chaos you don't know how close you were to die, or at least to forced eternal sleep, just like Ebsug said Fatim, without emotion. This seemed to surprise Gaia, but soon the Earth primordial scoffed. Do you really think I would be demoted to that extent? Without chaos, I'm the strongest around I'm on the same level as the Brad and Lol, of course, with that sword connected to the raw power of Absug said Gaia, with a confident tone. Fatim remained only a second in silence. I see all realities, so don't doubt my certainty. I assure you that if you had continued with the madness of capturing the King Mortal there would have been only two results, Fatim said. Gaia was silent until curiosity got the better of her. Then tell me illuminated one, what would be my future? Just the best and worst case scenario, please, since if you were to say everything, we would see the life of this world die, and you wouldn't have counted half of the numbers of possible realities, said Gaia, with a smile. Fatim frowned a little but chose to respond. The best case scenario is that you would sleep, like Ebzug, and have your raw power transferred to some object, Fatim said. Gaia was outraged, as this literally broke the primordial image of invincibility. But Fatim's next words were forever etched in Gaia's mind. The worst case scenario, however you would die, and also one fourth of the planet would have been destroyed, Fatim said, with an icy tone. Those words sent a shiver down Gaia's spine. Chaos returned and she interfered directly? Asked Gaia fearfully. Fatim, however, surprised Gaia by shaking his head, as well as surprising Earth's primordial with his next statement. The destruction it was accidental, Fatim said. How's this possible? Asked Gaia in disbelief. For Gaia, no one had that ability except for two beings the two dragon gods, Great Red and Auroboros. It is not necessary for you to know. I only give you a warning Gaia, stay away from the king of mortals, said Fatim. Fatim then turned around and created a new gap that teleported him away, leaving Gaia silent, reflecting on Fatim's statements. Although not what Gaia would have liked, she knows that when Fatim gives a warning, the warning should not be taken lightly. With that in mind, Gaia can only frown, showing that she was upset. I'll have to use Zeus then Gaia said in disgust. The primordial just sank into the earth and disappeared, as if someone was never their location. Greece Nasso's palace, Thor's vacation colony. POV Thor. A few months had passed since my encounter with Gaia, and at that moment I was in my throne room, reviewing maps and legends written about any creature with a dog's face and a fish's body. Unfortunately, my searches were proving fruitless, as the only thing I determined was that the Tulchinius forged Cronus's sickle, and just disappeared into the ocean, supporting neither the current government nor Zeus's rebellion. So basically I was looking for a needle in a haystack. My King A voice snapped me out of my thoughts, and when I looked towards the voice, I saw one of the priestesses wielding a flower. A familiar flower, but unfortunately the name didn't come to mind at the time. What do you want? I asked. My king, the priests ask your opinion about recent visitors to the island, a young woman wearing rags, asks for an audience, said the priestess. Ah? I really don't have anything better to do, as my searches have proved fruitless. She may come in, I said, shrugging. A short time later, a woman wearing a cloak, making her look a bit like a beggar, was in front of me, but the woman was quite familiar. You are the woman from before, I said. The person covered in the robe looked surprised, but took off the robe and showed himself to the people in my throne room. POV. Third person. The woman in front of Thor was Thetis. The Asana came to Nassos to ask Thor for a small favor, as it was the request of Thetis's great friend, the goddess Hera herself. Hello again, said Thetis nodding with a smile. Thor looked even more confused, as after Gaia had left, he hoped that no supernatural being would have the courage to come to him. Why are you here? Asked Thor. Thetis looked a little shy. Ah you see, my friend Hera has a brother, and he's the former owner of the javelin spear you currently wield, and he needs the spear back, said Thetis swiggling her fingers. Thor blinked. Take it, said Thor. Thor then threw the javelin spear he had in his hands to Thetis, who grabbed it after being surprised by the statement, after all, Thetis didn't think it could be that easy, you do not want it. Asked Thetis. No actually, it's more like I don't need it, said Thor, whispering the last part. Thetis smiled happily. Well thanks, it saved me a problem, said Thetis. Thor just waved his hand dismissively. All right if that's all there is to it, I have to go back to sort out some important things, said Thor. Thetis looked like she wanted to ask, but shook her head and thought it wouldn't be appropriate. The Asana just waved once more in thanks and got ready to leave the room. But as Thor turned again to leave the room and head towards the maps again, the Thunder God felt something speeding towards him. As Thor tried to dodge it, he raised his hand in defense and ended up grabbing something it was the javelin spear. Thor then slowly looked at Thetis, who had a shocked look on her face, as she alternated her gaze between her hand and the javelin spear. The Norse god found confused, as he initially thought Thetis had thrown the spear intending to harm him. 
What was this? Asked Thor. Betty seemed to have ignored the question as she began to grumble. Oh no Hera's brother will not like this at all said Thetis, putting both hands to her head in disbelief. Thor just raised an eyebrow and tried to get Thetis's attention again. Hey! Said Thor, in a firmer tone. Thetis seemed to wake up from her thoughts, for she soon looked at Thor. Oh! Sorry! I was surprised, that's all said Thetis shyly. Thor just sighed and asked the same question. What was this that happened now? Why did the spear fly towards me? Asked Thor. Thor was confused, as the lightning javelin spear did not exhibit any consciousness of its own. At least that was what Thor believed. Well Master Bolt has just chosen a new owner, said Thetis, with an uncertain smile. Thor just blinked in confusion and looked at the spear with narrowed eyes. So this thing has a conscience, but not a very advanced conscience, because it only seems to understand the basics thought Thor. Thor then looked at Thetis. So and now? Asked Thor. Just as Thor asked the question, Thetis suddenly appeared in front of Thor, and grabbed the Thunder God's hand. I ask for your help. Free the Hecatonchers. Said Thetis quickly. Zeus's javelin spear along with Hades's bident and Poseidon's trident combined, are the only weapons with the power needed to break the chains forged by the Telkines, who trapped the unwanted children of Uranus. At this time, this was the quest given to Thetis due to Hera testifying that the human king had saved the Asenid from Atlas before and, although he beat Zeus, it was cogitated that he would help the Olympians. No, said Thor. Well every plan has flaws. Because? Asked Thetis. I have no interest in joining your war for power, I'm fine just taking care of these people, said Thor. In fact, Thor didn't even have a duty to care for the people who elected him as king, but that only served as a whim, as the god of thunder grew to like the people also, Thor has invested time on this island, whether it's only four years or not, only a fool would leave it all lying around like that. Well is there something you want? Gold? Whoa women? Divinity? Asked Thetis desperately. Asenid was fully aware that without the support of the Hecatonchers, Zeus's rebellion was likely to end in failure. So Thetis was willing to use it all. You don't have anything that interests me at the moment, said Thor, unconcerned. But then Thor froze. Actually I want something, said Thor. Thetis seemed to have her ears open to the request of the human in front of her. I want the loyalty of the Talkines, wherever I go they must come with me, said Thor. For Thetis, this was a difficult request, but not impossible, as she believed that the Talkines would only live on the outskirts of the island, but for Thor? If coincidentally the King Aeolia moved further north in the world, coincidentally on the coast of Norse territory, the Greeks could not interfere without risking a conflict with the Norse pantheon. So basically Thor was planning to transport the Talkines, with no long-term consequences. I maybe I need you to talk to Mother Ray said Thetis, sweating a little. Thor just shrugged. She can come over here, or you can tell me where she is just know that I'm open to bargain, said Thor, with a smile. Location. Sumeria Babylonian City. On the banks of the Euphrates River, the city of Babylon thrived, with people from various parts of Sumer coming to the city in search of the greatest ziggurat ever built, said to have been built by gods and given to mortals as a sacred place to praise the gods. The ziggurat was called a Temenanki, built by the gods Marduk and, more discreetly, Thoth. Atemenanki had the goal set by Marduk, to unite all peoples in one language, in addition to serving as a bridge between divinity and humanity, attracting more and more believers to the Sumerian pantheon. For this reason, the city of Babylon became very full of life, as could be seen in the streets of the city. Amidst the throngs of the streets, a hooded figure walked around the ziggurat newly built just a few decades ago. The figure just looked at the ziggurat with a melancholy look. You are a long way from home god of the Kemet, a voice sounded from right behind the figure. The figure didn't look frightened, though it was silent at the statement. During this silence, the being who had spoken calmly walked to stand beside the hooded figure. It was Enlal, who glanced briefly at the hooded figure before looking at Marduk's cigarette. Glorious, don't you think? It is Marduk's greatest boast, though his help was needed for the construction, and Marduk denies his presence, said Enlal. The figure just looked at Enlal, revealing the face. It was Thoth, who scowled at the ancient leader of the Sumerians, who had recently relinquished the throne of the gods to Marduk. I don't mind taking credit I'm more concerned about what it might create, said Thoth. This seemed to have caught Enlal's attention. As if you're creating something? Unlikely, this ziggurat only has a few runes to help communicate with Marduk, humans from all over the world come here to ask Marduk for blessings, said Enlal. Exactly, I didn't help build this so that its successor would disrupt my creation, said Thoth. Enlal frowned. What do you mean? Asked Enlal. Enlal, I just enchanted the ziggurat to function as a translator, and for humans to send prayers to Marduk, but Marduk has altered it so much that he now sends divine power down the same path, said Thoth. Before Enlal could answer a new voice spoke before the former leader. I don't see anything special, after all, he used some runes of my own, it was Enki, who wore a confident smile. 
Enlil frowned when he saw his irresponsible twin, while Thoth only wore the same serious countenance. Therefore we must review the ziggurat completely, our runes are of a different nature, as well as created by different methods, we may have on our hands a second failure worse than the first city that housed humans and gods, Cern said Thoth. However, both Enlil and Enki disregarded it. Thoth, I made my runes so they wouldn't interfere with yours, except for the language translation rune. Furthermore, Cern was a failure as humans saw us as equals, said Enki, dismissing Thoth's concerns. Enlil quickly disagreed with the twin. Cern was a failure because you insisted on living alongside humans we are gods, we have our own time and life very different from humans. In fact, humans only live a tiny fraction of our lives, I never understood why we should relate to them whether they dying or not makes no difference to us, said Enlil. Thoth was irritated. Have you forgotten Gilgamesh? Asked Thoth, in a mocking tone. The twin gods were silent. He is already dead, said Enki. Yes, but his blood still lives on, and you know as well as I do that Enkidu is accompanying the rest of the blessed by fate bloodline, with each new reincarnation of Gilgamesh's soul, they are heading north, said Thoth. Gilgamesh may have died a long time ago a happy human, but the king's lineage did not cease to exist, though it left Uruk to a new capable king. While there can only be one descendant for each age that lives to adulthood, Gilgamesh's bloodline is protected by one who had gained the immortality given by Rishkigal and Kidu was closely watching the growth of his deceased best friend's descendants, and protecting them from supernatural beings. You should not have given the sword access to the blood of Gilgamesh, said Enki, looking at Enlil. This information had made Thoth's eyes widen in disbelief at Enlil, who crossed his arms in confidence. You gave a human the power of primordials? Asked Thoth. Enlil only gave Thoth a second glance, as he turned to face his twin brother. With Enkidu watching closely, I'm sure the sword won't fall into the wrong hands. Also I have a wrong feeling when I look at the ziggurat, said Enlil. Thoth looked surprised. But you said before said Thoth before being interrupted. I said it was unlikely, but it's not impossible. I admit that for some reason when I look at Atem and Enki I don't feel blessings. I see only suffering and lamentation, said Enlil, as he looked back at Atem and Enki. Enki soon snorted derision. I forged these runes brother have you forgotten who created the runes that connected the sword of rupture with the absolute power core? I did that, and at no time did I see anything wrong with the ziggurat, said Enki. Enlil soon looked at his brother. My instincts have never failed me, unlike you Enki said Enlil. Enlil's answer made Enki lose his smile and frown in anger. Still we'd better check it out, said Thoth, interrupting the possible argument between the brothers in the middle of the human city. Enlil, however, denied the request. I am no longer the leader, I cannot give you proper authorization. You must speak to Marduk, said Enlil. Thoth didn't like it. If you need to destroy the ziggurat, Marduk will never let you. Not when with each passing day, his minions keep increasing, said Thoth. Enlil only frowned. I'm sorry, God of Kemet, but it's the rules if you can't do that, leave and only come back when you talk to Marduk, said Enlil firmly. Although Enlil wanted to accompany Thoth on the investigation, the former leader of the Sumerians always prioritized the rules, no matter the situation. As Thoth knew that neither Enki nor Marduk would let him investigate the ziggurat fully, the god of wisdom had only one option leave. I only hope I am being paranoid for our own good Enlil, said Thoth, before leaving. Enlil just stared at Thoth's back and frowned in thought, while Eni chose that moment to walk away too. Farewell brothers, see you at the next meeting I'm going to pay Anna a little visit, it's been a while since I've visited her bed said Enki, winking at Enlil, as he walked away looking at any woman with a predatory smile. Although most of the time Enlil disapproved of Enki's behavior, the former Sumerian leader was lost in thought, and ended up ignoring his twin's farewell. Enlil only looked at the ziggurat one last time. At first glance, it looks like it was built with just stones, clay, and wood so why why do I feel like I'm looking at a giant power core? Asked Enlil, to himself, as he stared at the ziggurat with a suspicious frown. With that question lingering in the former leader's mind, Enlil could only leave the place silent, while ignoring the humans. Location deepest place in the cave of the lakes near the future Castria future region of Achia Greece. POV Thor. Although I wanted to get back to my quests, having a free passage for the Telkines to my home in the north, authorized by the future rulers was something that would avoid troublesome situations. So here I was, escorting Thetis to the place where the Hecatonchers were currently being held the Greek underworld. Hecatonchers was someone quite underrated, after all, he was someone in the top 10, even if it's the last position, which was arrested by his father and left behind by his brother. Although his release would mean victory for the Olympians, ironically Hecatonchers would still have a job in Zeus's government, if memory serves me right stand as a guard, and not let any titans escape. Wait. Did that mean he would technically still be trapped in the underworld? After all, he will practically stay in the same place, just without a chain holding him whatever, it's not my priority at the moment. You're quite thoughtful may I know why? Asks Thetis, who was guiding me in this place that was the underworld. 
Not. Really, I'm just admiring the scenery, I said, looking around. I was definitely not lying. After all, even though we were inside a cave, it was something spectacular The main reason for this was that when we went through a kind of obsidian gate that I thought was the end of the cave, I found myself in a completely different place in the Greek underworld. And I must admit, it would be the dream of anyone who wanted to get rich. Precious stones, of all sizes and qualities, are scattered throughout the place. So I see you desire wealth, said Thetis. Not exactly I'm thinking of something to give someone in the future I said with a carefree smile, as I thought about someone. I'm going to need some special metal if I want to convince her mother to accept my proposal from Coster, but I have time for that. Oh. It must be someone special, said Thetis with a smile. I looked at Thetis and nodded. We remained in comfortable silence as we walked deeper. I just carried the javelin spear on my shoulders, while I supported my arms and rested them on the spear nonchalantly, while Thetis glanced at me from time to time while looking around, almost as if do you know where you're going? I asked, raising an eyebrow. My question seemed to gain Thetis's attention as she looked at me blushing in embarrassment. This is a labyrinth of caves. I'm sorry if it looks like we're lost, but I assure you that's not the case said Thetis, as she just walked faster. I only sweated in response but remained silent for the rest of the walk. After some time wandering aimlessly through the cave I felt several presences nearby. One of them was too close. I shot my hand into a place in the cave that seemed to be completely bathed in shadows and grabbed something and pulled, flinging the object I'd grabbed out of the shadows. From the shadows, only the body of a man emerged, holding a bident in one hand, as it hit the wall and created cracks. You have a strange way of offering hospitality, I said, commenting to Thetis. But it seemed that this was not planned, as Thetis wore a nervous face, not at me, but at the man I had thrown at the wall. Hades. What got into you? Ray said she wants to talk to him. Said Thetis, shouting at the man. I just stared listlessly, though the man stood up and looked steadily at Thetis. It was the logical solution, we don't know the origin of this mortal, nor the reason why he wants the Telkin so the solution was to surprise him and take back Zeus's spear, said the man, identified as Hades. I must admit he's practical. But acting this way will end up making this little shit everyone's enemy, enough of that my son. I never expected such behavior from you said a voice, which resounded through the cave. Hades seemed to freeze at the voice, as he soon lowered his head and muttered something I assumed were apologies. It was then that more figures approached us, some I could easily identify, although most I didn't know who they were. The voice seemed to have come from the woman in front of the Greek group. Greetings, I'm Ray, mother of the two rude young men you met, I hope you forgive me for my children's behavior, they rarely interact with mortals, especially Hades said the woman, identified as Ray. Oh. So this was my mother's friend Frig hello, I'm Eolia, king of Nassos I said, answering the greetings. While some didn't seem to mind my lack of presentation and possibly lack of respect for a divine being, others showed a considerable amount of irritation. Hey. Properly introduce yourself to my mother. Said someone, in a somewhat familiar voice. I identified the source of the voice as being Hera, who was looking at me with a frown. I just scoffed, huffing in response. I'm. Not her son-in-law, so I don't see the point, I said, looking around the group. I was inciting irritation with a purpose finding someone who didn't seem to be irritated by my behavior towards Ray. The reason for this was that I knew there was someone who was pretending to be on the side of the Olympians in this war. So I was looking to identify someone suspicious as soon as I got to the group, after all, apart from Zeus, Hera and Thetis I hadn't seen, much less met anyone in the group. Unfortunately everyone showed a slight frown. Apparently, we have a good actor or actress it's okay, calm down, please Ray said, as she looked at the group and made calming hand gestures. But mom cried Demeter, before Ray quickly cutting her off. It's okay don't forget that we're the ones asking for help, so behave yourself and let me handle it, Ray said, her tone firm as she looked at the group with a small frown. I was starting to like her, she reminds me of Frigg a lot, especially when she scolded me, just like my brothers. But it looked like someone was ignoring the request. We don't need it mom after all I have my master bolt back for me, Zeus said as he tried to reach for the javelin spear. It was funny to see Zeus concentrating more and more and creating a frown. Here, let me make it easy for you, I said. I quickly stabbed the spear into the ground and dropped it, crossing my arms shortly thereafter. Zeus showed irritation, only to have his frown replaced with disbelief. I've been replaced, Zeus said, his eyes widening. Zeus's words seemed to have taken most of the group by surprise, except for Thetis, and Ray hmm, it looked like the information was just told to Ray. The reason for this was that maybe Thetis didn't know what to do after realizing I'm the new spear user, so the first person she spoke to was Ray, not Hera. In that case why did Ray deliberately choose to withhold the information? In my mind, there were only two scenarios. The first scenario was to prevent Zeus or anyone else from doing something reckless when he learned of this information. The second scenario. 
she knew there was someone who was betraying her by giving information to the Titans, and she didn't want to risk her group had run out and losing a powerful weapon that changed the course of the war, such as the Javelin Spear or Master Bolt, was one of the three weapons of mass destruction. Of course, there was also the possibility that it could be both scenarios, thief. Shouted Zeus, pointing at me. The first thing you did when you saw me was trying to kill me consider it compensation for your recklessness, I said, shrugging my shoulders. Actually, it was bullshit I didn't care if the spear wanted me as a user or not, although it was a good substitute weapon. However, it appeared that the spear was as fragile as Mjolnir, so I couldn't use my full strength. I did it because you were the only one close to Hera and Thetis in the middle of a broken land. What did you expect? I thought you were one of my father's allies. Shouted Zeus indignantly. Okay that was even more bullshit. You're a terrible liar, I said while looking listlessly at Zeus. While this seemed to infuriate the future ruler of the Olympians, it was at this moment that Rey chose to interrupt again. Enough. Stop it now. Shouted Rey. It really felt like a mother's fury well weirdly, it felt like I was being scolded by my own mother. Although I suppose this is the effect of Rey's presence as a titanus in which one of the aspects she represented was motherhood. Rey seemed to cough in embarrassment, but then she looked at me. So mortal, given recent events, I hope you can lend us your strength, be the javelin spear, in exchange for something you desire, what do you really desire? Asks Ray. I quickly responded without missing a beat. I wish that if I meet the Talkeens, they will be subordinate to me, and follow me wherever I and my lineage want to go, I said. This seemed to bring a frown on some, as I expected some to find my conditions exorbitant, but the important thing was that Ray was the one negotiating, so they didn't exactly have any say. Can you tell me why? Asked Ray, in curiosity. I thought you just wanted to negotiate, not question my terms, I said, briefly. Ray was silent as she considered my request. I couldn't say exactly why I wanted the Talkeens, after all, if the Olympians discovered me as a deity from another pantheon, my very stay would be in question, as well as possibly attracting Chaos's attention, which I wouldn't like one bit. Your conditions are acceptable, we will swear by the sticks, you can have the Telkins as servants in case you meet them, and in return, you will help us three times, Ray said. Now, wait a damn minute. Three I questioned, hoping I'd heard wrong. Ray just smiled innocently. Due to you wanting the Telkins as your servants, wielding the javelin spear, and basically jeopardizing this war by interfering indirectly and directly, I hope there is compensation, Ray said. I just smile in response. Well, she's not wrong on the last one, and it seems that everyone in the group seemed to agree with Ray. Deal, I said, waving lightly. Interestingly, as soon as everyone answered, the sound of a drum resounded throughout the cave. Sticks heard us the deal it's done, Hades said. So it's time for me to fulfill my end of the bargain. Tell me, what should I do? I asked. Ray promptly answered me. You must use the spear you wield and, together with my two sons, must break the bonds of Hecatonchers, Ray said. Well. Sounds easy. With the agreement made, we all headed to the place that would be considered the Hecatonchers' prison. The Greek underworld was initially very similar to the underworld of Arishkal, and the underworld of Hell, cold and wet, but on a certain level, magma began to be seen more often. Besides the fact that a new presence seemed to be watching us all the time. The problem was, even with the Vilgestrick Archer, I was unable to properly locate this presence. It was as if the presence was everywhere, where are we exactly? I asked. The one who answered me was Ray, who was also attentive, although less noticeable than I was. We're inside my uncle, Ray said. That it sounded wrong. I beg your pardon? I questioned once more, this time raising my eyebrows in surprise. This time, it wasn't Ray or anyone else in the group who answered it was another voice. You are invading me, said the voice, with a dark tone. It was then that cracks were created, and then magma floated until it came together and formed a sort of giant spherical body. The sphere was 100 meters long, and when the magma solidified, hundreds of eyes opened, as well as creating tentacles made of unsolidified magma. Uncle, Ray said, bowing in respect. Everyone in the group seemed to follow suit, even me although my definition of bowing was basically a nod. What do you want? Ray said the orb full of eyes. Uncle Tartarus. On behalf of this group, I apologize if I offended you in any way, but I came here in order to free my brother, Ray said. Do you think niece that I would simply give away my power source? Shall I remind you that the more powerful existences I trapped here, the stronger I will be? Asked the eyed orb, identified as Tartarus. Tartarus's own tone showed displeasure, so I closed my grip on the javelin spear in my hand, and began to prepare for any situation the question is how to destroy this guy, since from what it felt like this guy was the place, and the body in front of me was just a representation. If we win the war. We'll bring the titans to occupy this place Ray said, showing a little sadness, after all, it was still her family. POV. Third person. 
Hm agreed. I want at least five titans to replace Hecatonchers. Out of five, some of them must be Cronus. Persis said Tartarus. It was then that the hundreds of eyes were fixed on someone in the group. And him, said Tartarus and raising a tentacle towards someone. The someone had a look of surprise, although he immediately narrowed his eyes, it was Thor. As soon as Rare realized who Tartarus was pointing at, she spoke. Wait uncle, he's not part of the deal. Said Ray firmly. He's strong, I could feel it the moment he stepped on my body, Tartarus said. Because Tartarus was technically where the Olympian group was at the moment, he felt, after a while, a brief fraction of the power that the group's human had Tartarus had to accumulate more powerful beings for him to grow in power, after all, he was not an entity with the god Ra, who constantly grew power according to the sun. It was then that everyone was surprised by Thor's next statement. I stay behind, swear by the sticks you'll leave Ray, and her group can free Hechatonchers and come back whenever they want, in exchange for my being left behind, said Thor. Before Ray could deny Thor's request, Tartarus's voice resounded throughout the place like an echo. Deal! shouted Tartarus. The drumming sound of Styx's oath resounded throughout the place. Beolia! What did you just do? You doomed yourself! cried Thetis in disbelief. Meanwhile, Zeus was thinking that he would finally have his spear back. Though it appeared that Thor wasn't worried about Thetis's statement, go ahead I'll sort things out here, said Thor looking at Tartarus. The group, though with a reluctant minority, continued to the side of Hecatonchers. Leaving Thor behind. You will be a good addition to my source of power, said Tartarus, in a tone that betrayed delight. Thor, however, didn't smile and just watch the Olympian group walk away. Only when the Olympians walked away did Thor finally look at Tartarus seriously. If I demolish this place to the ground will you die? Asked Thor, in an innocent tone. Tartarus was surprised by the question. Aren't you afraid of the deadly Styx curse? You swore by her, remember? Said Tartarus, in an emotionless tone. That didn't seem to shake Thor. I said my group can left me behind, and lo and behold my group just left me behind, said Thor, pointing to the last spot he saw the Olympian group. Tartarus looked displeased, though he seemed to be more amused by the statement. Maybe you're right but do you really expect to get out of here? You are inside my body, here I rule as I please, so you really think you have a chance? Asked Tartarus rhetorically. The voice of the answer that followed seemed to have frozen the abyss primordial. Yes, said Thor, his eyes glowing with power. Time seemed to freeze when no one made a move until magma quickly emerged from the ground, at the same time Thor disappeared from view and reappeared with a javelin spear raised ready to stab the body that represented Tartarus, who had all eyes wide in surprise. Boom the resulting explosion when Thor connected the spearhead with Tartarus's body, would be heard and felt by all beings in the Greek underworld. Meanwhile, with the Olympian group as Thor spoke to Tartarus before the charge, the group looked a little disheartened by the current situation, Tartarus must already have the mortal trap do you already have access to your spear, Zeus? Asked Hades, in an emotionless tone. For Hades, Tartarus was practically doing himself a favor by getting rid of the mortal who had been a nuisance up until this point, Zeus frowned in concentration until he shook his head. No, I still don't feel an answer, said Zeus disappointed. It's only a matter of time said Poseidon, already summoning the trident. It was then that someone spoke. How can you say that? He was left behind because of us, shouted someone indignantly. It was Thetis, who looked at the trio of brothers in disappointment. Hades and Poseidon seemed to shrug their shoulders in disrespect, while Zeus decided to respond while he volunteered, said Zeus. It was then that Demeter chose that moment to speak. Also, thanks to the sacrifice of the human, we don't need to face Tartarus on the way back when we want to leave, Demeter said. To Demeter, the human was just another ant in the vast anthill the anthill didn't care if an ant died or not. I don't like it either, someone said unexpectedly. It was Hera, who was frowning. Have you come to like the human, Hera? Asked Poseidon, with a mocking tone. Zeus frowned. No. No. It's not like this. It's just it's wrong, Hera said. Raven chose to speak. Anyway, if we win the war, I hope this human sacrifice will be remembered, Ray said. Although the human would be imprisoned in Tartarus, Ray hoped that in the future she could convince her uncle to release him. We can take him out of here later if he's not dead at the end of this war mother, Hades said. If there was anyone Hades cared about deeply, it was his mother Ray gave a reassuring smile before answering. Thank you, my son, but boom an explosion that made the ground shake, rudely interrupted Ray's response, resulting in everyone clinging to the nearest thing. When the explosion ended, everyone looked at each other. What was that? Earthquake? Asked Poseidon, confused. Nobody had the slightest idea, so the question remained in the air, we can't risk staying here too long any longer, let's free Hecatonchers and leave Tartarus. Said Zeus, with a tone of command. Only the three spears can break the prison. The chances of me and Poseidon breaking the seals are extremely low without Master Bolt's help, Hades said. 
We don't have much choice now. We've already found Tartarus. I don't want to meet Thanatos or Hypnos, or worse their mother, Zeus said, shuddering. The twin gods, Thanatos and Hypnos, were famous for being quite powerful. Although they had no interest in breaking into the top 10 through conquests, they were content to just stay hidden and do each other's respective jobs. This was something they had copied from their mother Nyx. A primordial that prefers to remain neutral and not participate in anything active, as the nighttime primal seemed to like to relax. Everyone in the group nodded and continued on their way. When they arrived at the place, which was Hecatonchers' cell, everyone saw that what prevented Hecatonchers from seeing the light of day was a colossal door made of obsidian. Poseidon, Hades, get ready. I will help you right away, even without my spear, it should be enough to open even a breach. Shouted Zeus, summoning yellow lightning in his hands. Hades and Poseidon followed the command and prepared to attack with the Bident and Trident respectively. Boom but before anyone could start, a blue bolt passed through everyone and hit the gate breaking it in just one move. The javelin spear rose from the rubble and floated slowly from the ground, and quickly flew away from the group, towards where it was thrown. Everyone knew what that meant although some still remained in disbelief. How the hell did he hit a target he wasn't supposed to see? Asked Maya, eyes wide. No one knew how to answer the question, though Hades looked at the spot where the javelin spear came from as he frowned, he then looked at Ray. Mother is he like Gilgamesh? Asked Hades. Ray knew what her eldest son talked about after all, she told her children stories whenever she was available, and one of them was of a particular human capable of going against gods. Although Hades never took the story seriously, as did his brothers and sisters, seeing the accomplishments of this human in front of him, made the story a little more truthful, as well as established something. Which it is, that among the weak humans there could be a monster. Before Ray could answer, a new voice emerged. Ray the voice seemed to come from 50 heads talking at once who Catachers was free. After rescuing Hecatonchers, the Olympian group quickly returned to the Tartarus exit, while being surprised by signs of struggle everywhere, as if someone was demolishing the entire place. After everyone left, everyone was once again surprised by what they saw. Standing just a step away from entering Tartarus's body was Thor, or Aeolia as they knew it perfectly well. With just some dust, but physically fine. That concludes two aids Ray, said Thor, glancing lazily. This seemed to surprise Ray, while some expressed indignation. To wait a minute, it should be just one. Said Metis. Thor quickly denied it and soon went to explain, but was defeated by Ray. I see one for offering yourself, hold back Tartarus and allowing him to ignore us on the way back and forth, and another for helping to destroy the prison gate as planned before, Ray said. Thor smiled and waved in response. Exactly, you never specified that you necessarily need to ask me for help directly, so my fight with Tartarus was included, you only have one, so use it wisely, said Thor. Thor didn't wait for anyone to respond to the statement and just turned his back on the group, and then started walking out the same way he had come back. I know the way back, so I don't need to be followed. Said Thor, as he briefly waved goodbye. Thor then just placed a javelin spear on his shoulder and rested his arms in boredom, though he was glared at by some of the disgruntled group. Let's go, we must transport Hecatonchers to Olympus, said Ray. As the group was out of Tartarus, Ray soon created a teleportation circle, which transported everyone out of the caverns of the underworld, towards Mount Olympus, a place called by the group their new home. Meanwhile, Thor returned to his people, where he was greeted with curiosity and asked where he had gone. Needless to say, Thor didn't care and just wanted to get some rest before returning to the Telkine quests, so he let slip that he'd gone to the underworld and fought a god. Needless to say, Thor's people built a statue made entirely of rock crystal just a week after Thor's arrival. Thor was unwittingly creating a new religion, as the people of Knossos were assuming that their king, Eolia, had ascended to immortality and become something close to the gods. Years passed, and though Thor was initially concerned that the island's humans would notice his lack of aging, none of the people showed to be displeased, much less distrustful of their king. In fact, it looked like they were even happy with the immortal king. Another thing that changed was that Thor discovered through Thetis, who frequented his island, the victory of the Olympians, and the imprisonment of the defeated who refused to surrender in Tartarus. Although the Titan spy was never discovered, all Olympians were more concerned with establishing the government. When the division was made, Thor was present at Ray's request, to see who would be the leader, the three brothers made the division through a game. Take out the smallest toothpick. Where there were three matchsticks of unequal sizes and whoever drew the smallest would have priority of choice, and Thor saw Zeus steal in the game shamelessly. Location. Tartarus Greek Underworld. While the division between the three brother gods was taking place, a woman arrived in Tartarus brother I need your help, Gia said, her tone somber. She was quite annoyed, due to the fact that more of her children were trapped. What do you want sister? The voice of Tartarus resounded throughout the place. Guy was silent until she gave a cruel smile and answered. Help me have a monster. Bira. 
1832 BC. Age of Thor. 2168 years. Location. Nassos Island of Crete, Greece. POV Thor. I had been on this island for decades without any hint of success in finding the Talkians. I was thinking about giving up at least I tried, although I didn't get the expected results. I was giving up for good reason. My time was running out, and I didn't fully trust the Greeks. The Greek pantheon had just emerged from the civil war, and was supposed to be establishing the government, however they are doing everything in the most random way possible. And they were just focusing their attention on the Helladic people, although I can understand it, seeing as they were the most populous people in Greece today. In addition to doing something completely outrageous Metis was gone, and it didn't take a week for Zeus to have his eyes turning to another goddess who had enchanted him. And just like that, I got word from Thetis that Zeus had married Themis, the spy who worked as an undercover agent in Cronus's domain. I had a pretty good idea where Metis was. I just didn't want to cause a ruckus by blowing a hole in Zeus's head, so I waited for the one that would help Zeus get rid of a nagging headache. Hephaestus. I don't deny that I always wanted to meet such a god unfortunately, I can't exactly bring him into my pantheon for obvious reasons. So far Zeus hasn't shown symptoms of a headache or anything, and even if he did, he wouldn't interfere, because I don't exactly want to get too involved with these people after all, I was waiting for the moment of my destruction to arrive. I just had to wait for some cataclysm, be to flutter an earthquake, and that's it, I would teleport to the Avananma Islands, which were still uninhabited along with my people. Yes, I will steal an entire civilization. What can I say I thought they were pretty cool. Except for the fanaticism part. If I couldn't at least find the Talkins, I'd take something from this place. Also, it would be nice to have more people in the north of the world. I knew that some cataclysm would happen soon, after all, civilizations in the Mediterranean world rise and fall many times due to natural phenomena or supernatural. And at that moment, I was waiting for some. I had just completed my second millennium, and I went out to celebrate like a good Asgardian, both in Asgard and in Nassos getting drunk. At least I didn't destroy anything, and I just stood there screaming while I was drunk according to witnesses, I was screaming for more alcohol, more women, and for some reason, more table. That last one didn't make much sense, but then again, my drunk self not having broken anything, or killed anyone by accident, is already a big step forward for me. Although, I ended up sleeping with a priestess or two who took advantage of my inebriated state. Thankfully, neither of them was very young or married. It also made my people a little happy with my actions for some reason, and they went back to celebrating even more fervently hmm, if I replaced Dionysus, could I bring me to Greece? Hmm, decisions, decisions although I don't think it would do any good, after all I didn't want to meddle further with the new Greek divine pantheon. Also, technically, I had already brought something. And it was the simplest form of toilet paper for my Greek people. In fact, this was the first item I brought when I became king of my people, and the reason for that was quite simple for some reason I never will, nor want to, find out why the ancient Greeks wiped their asses with rocks. Yes, that's right rocks. This was a big no-no for me, and I soon introduced a simpler, low-quality fabric version, and successfully replaced the stones. But back to the important subject after my return from the Big Three Division to my home in Nassos Greece was silent. I knew this island's meant shit was going to hit the fans sometime soon, so I started preparing my people by placing a teleportation and resonance rune on every citizen in my city, and then I contacted Igris and asked him to organize the Avanema Islands, and start building houses for my people to live in. The question is when will the cataclysm occur for me to finally leave this human form? As I was starting to delve into my thoughts, a presence in the room caught my eye. I looked and saw a god who started to visit me more often, but not as often as Thetis. Hello brat, what brings my not so humble home, I said while chuckling a little. I hate you, said the being. It was Hera, and the reason for that was that wherever Thetis went, Hera followed close behind. The two ended up being best friends and inseparable, especially after the war, which only strengthened the bonds of friendship. What I found strange at the time was that Hera came alone it's rare to see you alone what are you doing here? I asked, curious. Hera looked at me and snorted in response. Mother thinks that for us to establish our dominions over you humans, we must relate to the three peoples, who are currently separated, and get involved and influence their cultures, you are the leader of the second largest people in our territory, and I, along with Thetis, we are charged with influencing your people, said Hera. Oh? Do you expect my people to just accept you as the new gods? I asked. Hera just shrugged. The Helladics and Cycladics have accepted us very well. The Helladics mostly, so much so that they've already created paintings and stories about us and our birth and conflict with Cronus. Then finally your people, the Elites, which is definitely the most advanced human settlement said Hera, crossing her arms. I could only stare in disbelief before shrugging my shoulders. 
you are free to try, but without mind control or forcibly, if any of my people want to worship you, they must do so of their own free will, I said. Although they would hardly succeed after all my people didn't like the Helatics very much, and they would hardly accept their same religion. My answer seemed to irritate Hera. But your people already worship you as if you were a god, said Hera, complaining. I just shrugged. Yes, but I never asked to be worshipped as one. In fact, if they decide to start a cult of anyone or anything, as long as it's of their own free will, they have my full support, I said. What can I say humans are complicated? I would never impose religion by the sheer factor of human nature, so I would just let the decision of whom to praise rest with them. But as they didn't have contact with the supernatural very often, and saw how easily I drove Cronus off the island, my people began to praise the most powerful thing they had ever seen me. Ugh fair enough, said Hera. I just got up from the throne and started to leave the room. Since you're staying here, I'll guide you to where you're staying, I said. Hera looked confused. Will I do not stay at the palace? Asked Hera. I look in disbelief before answering. Ha dot 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 no, I said with a smile. Hera looked at me irritated. Because I'm going to tell Zeus about asked Hera, indignantly as she followed me. I soon stopped walking and looked towards Hera and cut her off due to having a brief idea of where the conversation was heading. Let's be clear here, I have no reason to support your government. Although I may have helped you before, I must remember that it was a deal, so I will remind you of one simple fact if you or any deity considers harming me or my people I will retaliate, I said. POV. Third person. The menacing words alerted Hera and reminded her of who the being in front of her was. A human was hailed as a god. A human was wielding the javelin spear, the most powerful weapon in her territory. A human who fought Tartarus and made him run to heal while demolishing Tartarus's body. A human who challenges the titans in a primordial. Hera's mother had warned her about the kind of king and person that Aeolia was. In fact, Rey warned all sons, daughters, acquaintances, and allies about the human king of Greece's largest island, and warned them about threatening him in any way possible, and the possible consequences that threats would lead. I didn't mean to threaten you, said Hera, staring at Thor, trying to convey confidence. Thor just shrugged. Don't get me wrong. I just wanted to establish my position, said Thor, who soon resumed walking as Hera followed closely behind. As Hera leaves the palace along with Thor, you can see the changes on the island, and the love that the people of the island conveyed as they greet Thor. Hera also couldn't help but look at the clothing of the women of the island, and then looked at Thor. Pervert, said Hera. Thor looked apathetically at the accusation. Believe me, I've tried changing their clothes, although I assume I'll be perverted with only my wife, said Thor, in contemplation. That seemed to get Hera's attention. Oh? Don't you have a wife? I thought you were married, Hera said curiously. Thor soon denied it. No, I'm not married yet, said Thor. Hera soon noticed a different tone in Thor's voice. So you already have someone in mind? Hera asked, with a smile. To Hera's surprise, Thor sported something that seemed to lighten the mood a sincere smile. Until the smile turned into a small frown as Thor looked at Hera. Why the growing interest in this? Asked Thor. Hera didn't look embarrassed, quite the contrary, Hera had a longing and dreamy look on her face, although there was a bit of uncertainty in her voice, when she answered Thor's question. As we get older, my relatives and I feel affinities with certain domains mine, I feel certain happiness when it comes to marriage, I feel that this is the domain I want to rule and protect, said Hera. Thor wasn't surprised, after all, most of the divine beings he had contact with said something similar, but with some cases being the exception, the exceptions, most of the time, referred to a realm that some gods dared to rule the death. When a god or goddess assumes the mantle of ruler of the dead, existence itself undergoes both physical and psychological changes. Good examples of this Thor had already known. Hell behaving like a child even after centuries of age, was the result of being mired in the concept of death. Ereshkigal having trust issues. Even Hades, who has recently assumed the mantle of ruler of the dead, has shown a change. The change was more physical, as part of the face, starting on the right side of the face, became just the bone of the skull, with the eye socket showing a blue glow, that reflected the coldness of his presence. Only the Egyptians broke the rule, and Thor knew it was for the simplest of reasons division of work. During Thor's stay in Egypt, Thoth had explained that a split was made shortly after Osiris's death. The reason for the split was the overload of power and souls, which Anubis was no longer able to handle. Then, on Thoth's advice, the division of the concept of death was divided into three beings, Osiris would be the judge. Anubis would be the guide and jury. Amit would be the enforcer. According to Thoth's theory, this was due to the fact that death itself was a different concept, after all, if there is life, there must be death, and vice versa. Besides the fact that death, and three more concepts, were in the top ten of the strongest existences, being represented by the weakest avatar existences the writers. The other exceptions had a simpler explanation. 
beings that challenge concepts, though that didn't mean they were immune to them. According to Thoth, the Trimurti would be one of them, Shiva is the one who boasted to all who challenge him in a fight. When Shiva mastered death, the concept, which was in its avatar form, bowed its head in defeat, and presented the Hindu god with something that symbolized having defeated the very concept of death, an albino snake. And a serpent, even today Shiva wore with pride, around the neck or waist. Knowing about Hera's growing resonance with such mastery, Thor couldn't help but wonder how the other gods were. And your relatives? Have you found their domain yet? Asked Thor, curious. Hera soon denied it. Some yes, others no. After the war, some chose to distance themselves and we didn't see each other anymore, while others remain seated or are still in the rhythm of celebration and party, and others to relieve stress, Hera said, frowning at the end as she lost herself in thought. Thor looked at Hera doubtfully, though he was curious about her current grief. Something wrong? Asked Thor. Hera looked surprised at the question. No. No. It's just my brother Zeus moved quite fast after Metis disappeared, and marrying them is quickly, for me I feel a little said Hera, stopping and thinking about her next words carefully. Uncomfortable? Said Thor. Hera expressed appreciation for Thor speaking such a word. Yay. That's right. I feel a little uncomfortable said Hera with a smile and waving excitedly. It was strange for Thor to see Hera smiling sincerely for the first time at him, given that it only took a walk and conversation that made Hera's mood towards him change so much, but he didn't really care, and just chose to point out the obvious. Must be your domain reacting to the act, don't dwell on it too much. Said Thor. Hera looked thoughtful at the answer, but accepted it due to it being the most likely for the feeling that had been bothering her, since Zeus had remarried, caring little for the still missing first wife. A short time later, Thor and Hera reached the part of the city of Nassos that was home to most of the temples. The priestesses were soon instructed by Thor to take care of Hera, as well as explaining that the city would be hosting divine beings in the near future. In the short time Hera ended up staying, she had marked the people of the temple with her presence. Little did Thor know, that times of peace would change violently in just a few years. As Thor made his way back to Nassos' palace, some fishermen had run towards him screaming about a giant oyster on the beach, and it was impossible for them to open. Thor reacted quickly by shooting towards the beach, not with the intention of fighting, but with the intention of snatching the oyster, and what was valuable inside, which could very well be the biggest pearl he had ever seen, and considering that at the time it was considered the pearl to be the most expensive jewel in the ancient world. Thor would make the pearl the primary medium of exchange for the coster he would propose. As Thor found and opened the giant oyster, he found a golden-colored pearl to hide in width of a car tire. Thor gave a maniacal smile and wanted to scream that he was rich, though, Thor ended up completely ignoring a completely naked blonde woman who was also inside the oyster, and was looking at Thor in confusion. The Norse god just took off the pearl and closed the oyster still ignoring the woman, causing the woman to start screaming inside the oyster in revolt. Thor just ignored the cries for help, nothing could take away his smile as he looked at the giant pearl. A short time later the woman emerged from the oyster alone, outraged, and wandered around the island, looking around as if it was the first time she had looked at the world, while men and women were stunned by the woman's presence. That was the birth of Aphrodite. A few years later, Thor was celebrating with his people the summer solstice, which symbolized the time when Thor arrived to save the people. By this time, Hera had returned to Olympus after finding Aphrodite walking through the forest alone. As soon as Aphrodite arrived at Olympus, she hypnotized most, if not all beings, with the already supernatural beauty she wielded. Which Aphrodite noticed immediately, and grew to enjoy the attention she began to get, although the newly consecrated goddess of Olympus did not venture further for a reason. When she first saw the light, she saw the first man she ever saw, and when the man blatantly ignored her, Aphrodite met rejection and indifference for the first time, not the adoration and unconditional love that was shown by others who came after the man who opened the oyster for the first time. Aphrodite wanted to meet the one who gave her a different and remarkable feeling, so she went in search of just one mission. Invite the man to be the only one worthy of her beauty. In short, Aphrodite had chosen her only husband, Although the husband would probably not even remember their first date, and he didn't even know that he was already considered a husband by a woman he'd never met. In truth, Thor was minding his own business, and he had finally found some clue about the Talkines, although it was vague, the information was only from merchants and fishermen, who claimed to have seen beings with the characteristics of the Talkines, with a fishtail and a dog's head, near the island of Lemnos, one of the northernmost islands of Greece. Thor went immediately to the spot, in just a rowing boat, and with his unending strength and endurance, he ended up arriving on the island the same day. The reason for such a rush was that Thor was getting more and more annoyed at remaining as human king, as a cult of Aeolia was acquiring more and more loyal fanatical followers, so he wanted to get out of there as soon as possible, before the situation came to a head. Got worse and the people wanted to spread the cult to the rest of Greece. 
However, when Thor arrived at the island of Lemnos, he found not the Talkines, but a civilization compassed only of women endowed with supernatural beauty, who stared at him in curiosity and displayed an inviting smile. Thor just took the boat and began rowing quickly towards Nassos, while stopping at the islands closest to Lemnos in search of any sign. As soon as Thor arrived in Nassos, he asked those who told him he had seen the Talkines be summoned. When the merchants and fishermen who told Thor about Lemnos arrived, when questioned, they just gave Thor a perverted smile and said it was a magical island they will never forget. At that moment, everyone would know the wrath of Aeolia, who was annoyed at being sent on a lost journey. In fact, Thor was so angry that as soon as the merchants and fishermen left the room, he ripped the palace throne off and threw it with all his might out the window. Little did Thor know that the throne ended up hitting a yellow canary, who was suspiciously staring with hearts in her eyes at Hera, who was bathing in the waterfall while being accompanied by some priestesses. Rey had been curious when her youngest son ended up returning to Olympus with broken both arms and a leg, Zeus never set foot on the island of the Elites again, and chose to remain in Helladic territory, where the eyes of the King of Olympus began to wander, as he stared at some women who had held his attention. Shortly after this event, one day Hera ended up getting pregnant, confusing the Greek deities a lot. That same day, Thor noticed that the room that was suppressing the Norse divine powers seemed to be volatile and therefore needed to be replaced, because it was already approaching the expiration. A few months later, Hephaestus was born. And to the surprise of Thor who knew the legends well, Hera didn't throw him away in disgust, in fact, Hera had tenderly embraced Hephaestus and introduced him to everyone, as if Hera was proud of Hephaestus' birth. For some reason, when Thor's golden eyes met Hephaestus's amber eyes, he felt a connection he couldn't explain. Surprisingly, Hephaestus liked Thor and always wanted to spend time with him. Thor just shrugged his shoulders and went on to teach a little about the human form of metalworking, which could not be considered weak, given that Thor, after having completed the dwarven blacksmith training centuries ago, could be considered a god of the forge. That alone made Thor or in this case Aeolia, an accomplished blacksmith who enchanted a baby Hephaestus, while Hera just stared in wonder at the interaction between Thor and a baby a few years later, Hephaestus began to grow into an extremely handsome man who enchanted many women and even men, although he only had eyes for his work in the forge he had created on the island of Crete. Hera and Thetis were the only ones who visited Hephaestus, though Thor made a point of visiting at least once a week to see Hephaestus's abilities in the island's volcano forge. The other day, Zeus appeared in Crete complaining of a severe headache, which Thor promptly helped willingly opening a hole in the skull of Zeus, who fell to the ground and was knocked out by the force of the blow. But what caught the attention was that from the hole in Zeus's skull a light appeared, and from the light, a fully armored woman with a spear and shield, dressed in armor, appeared. The woman had introduced herself as Athena. Honestly so didn't even blink, much less question the ways the gods and goddesses were being born in the most ridiculous way he'd ever seen. And so, years passed with new supernatural beings being born left and right, mostly demigods until in 1622, BCE boom and explosion sound resounded throughout Greece, the origin was a volcano that erupted on the island of Terra, one of the colonies of the Elites, but it was no ordinary eruption. From the volcano, a hideous creature began to rise, magma oozing from its body like water. The creature was gigantic, standing 30 meters tall with wings on its back, with the upper body being that of a human and the lower body compassed of tentacles. The creature gave a roar of defiance as it made Greece tremble, and volcanic ash covered the sky and spread beyond the horizon. The roar also caused an earthquake, which resulted in a tsunami of proportions never before seen by the inhabitants of Greece, and that same tsunami, as it approached the island of Crete, a single person could be seen on the beach. That person was Thor, who looked at the tsunami in sadness. So it's about time the Talkines remain in hiding, but it seems my time is up, said Thor. Thor then raised a hand and, for the first time, created a rune with divine power, although the action was unnoticed by any deity, due to the monstrous power of the creature that roared atop the volcano on the island of Terra, plus there was no being. Greek supernatural on the island it was the perfect moment. Thor then said calmly, albeit in the face of a colossal tsunami. X. Jibo, Avananma said Thor, whispering to the rune. And that's how all the Elites inhabitants of the island of Crete disappeared into thin air. The only thing left of Thor was the javelin spear that had been left behind and was soon engulfed by the tsunami waters. Simple as that Thor basically abandoned Greece, though he didn't know he'd be back faster than he thought. After all, Frigg wanted to see her old friend again, and Thor would never approve of his mother standing on the roof of Olympus alone. Era. 1558, BCE, Thor. 2442 years. Location. Island of Crete. POV. Third person. 64 years. 64 years after the awakening of the monster that came to be known as Tiffin, the king of monsters, in the volcano on the island of Terra. Possessing a roar that shook even the most remote parts of Greece. 
Since the awakening of Tiffin, all supernatural beings in Greece officially had only two options run or fight. Most fled and went into hiding, with only Zeus remaining steadfast and facing the king of monsters with Cronus' sickle. Zeus lost and ended up having the tendons removed from his body by Tiffin, with the sickle's help, and Greece was ruled by Tiffin for a long time however, Zeus was eventually rescued by one of his extramarital sons, young Hermes, who turned out to have an innate talent for thievery, managing to steal Zeus's tendons, shortly after Tiffin imprisons him. With Zeus regaining his hamstrings, the king of Olympus decided to think of a plan first, as in the first fight, he had clearly been bested in combat. It was then that fate acted through his agents the Moires. The agents of fate from the Greek pantheon ended up giving a special fruit, which through a plan of Zeus, ended up weakening Tiffin long enough for Zeus to defeat him and imprison him in the deepest place of Tartarus. Although, Zeus was irritated by a few things Hades did not respond to Zeus's call, and because of that, he was expelled from his seat on Olympus. The ruler of the underworld didn't seem to mind the decision, and just stayed secluded in the castle made of oars in the underworld. Another thing was Hephaestus, who had only asked Zeus for a favor, as the young blacksmith god wanted to be closer to his mother, asked Zeus for a place on Olympus in exchange for help. Zeus had readily accepted. But then, 64 years after Tiffin's awakening and just a day after the victory against Tiffin, here was Hephaestus at his birthplace on the island of Crete. Or at least what was left of the island. Hephaestus was at this moment on the beach of Crete, staring at a lone spear on the island's deserted beach. Hephaestus walked calmly to the spear, grabbed it, and then pulled it out of the sands, never failing to look at the spear for a moment. The young god then walked further into the island, still holding the spear in one hand. When the young Hephaestus arrived at the palace of Knossos, the young god froze as he faced what was left of the island civilization, the people of someone close to him. 64 years mother said that because her divinity began to some extent to relate to birth, I was the result. So in theory I shouldn't have a father, but I'm sure the feeling I'm feeling right now, said Hephaestus. It was then that, coincidentally, it started to rain on the island of Crete, but the rain didn't just make the mood darker. The rain served to mask the tears that flowed from Hephaestus's eyes. I will continue to do what you taught me, and I will be recognized for my work. So, thank you for everything father said Hephaestus. The young god then stabbed the javelin spear into the destroyed floor of the ancient citadel of Knossos. After Hephaestus took one last look at the destroyed city, he soon left the place. He didn't notice that the spear vibrated in response, and soon shot up into the sky in a roar that sounded like thunder. Location. Midgard of Anam Islands. POV Thor. Although I couldn't get the Talkines, having an advanced human civilization under my protection was something I gladly did. After all, the humans in Midgard before the arrival of my people hadn't developed something like unity or kingdom, there were basically several people who took care of their own lives, and, to a certain extent, their families. I soon disappeared and dropped my human disguise in front of my people. Although initially, I was going to explain in a more complicated way, thousands of my people soon shouted that their king had ascended to godhood. I couldn't help but raise an eyebrow in disbelief, but I soon joined the game and introduced myself as Thor, a god. Another thing was Igris I found him on his knees as he gestured to the houses I recommended he build. It turns out that he has further increased the number of houses and their size beyond what I expected. When I asked him what so many houses are for, he muttered nonsense things like liege, followers, and worthy houses, until he apathetically replied for future inhabitants. I had the decency to be a little worried. After all, I had a brief fear of turning my back and Igris taking a large number of soldiers, and going on a crusade in my name. To avoid unnecessary things, I suggested that Hell give the priests lessons on the Norse deities and the entire pantheon, and Hell was great at that. In a matter of days, the priests spread the Norse religion to the Elite people, and changes of clothing and some cultural changes took place progressively, leaving no time for the development of any difficulty for the Elite people to adapt to their new home. At least they stopped calling me Iolia. Igri seemed ecstatic with the Elite people, and asked me to actively protect them, which I soon agreed to, as a population of 5,000 and potential warriors needed to be protected. I even asked Hel for a favor to have her be responsible for the souls of the Elites, and transfer them to my home in Asgard, which she readily agreed to. I also protected the city from the supernatural as well as my home, what was missing now was a teacher for runes and magic, and presto, I would have a functioning Nordic army. Anyway, 34 years of hard work, along with another 30 years ensuring the adaptation of my people to the new territory, gave results faster than expected. I soon left the archipelago, which I had left under Igris's watch, and headed towards my home in Midgard, where I spent a good deal of time with Fenrir on guard, and every now and then Hel visited her brother, I just went to my house in Midgard on the night of the winter solstice. As soon as I got to my house and opened the door I was greeted by a confusing sight. 
Freak, my mother, had graced her presence in my living room, with Hell looking at her with a coy gaze, as she held a silver tray that held what I assumed was coffee. Also Fenor was sleeping in my favorite armchair. The audacity. Will you eat? I quickly hissed, catching the attention of the people in the room, and waking Fenrir from his deep sleep, as soon as Fenrir saw me he immediately jumped out of his chair, and started running up the stairs quickly. This isn't over yet, I said, muttering. No way was I going to let him get away, this was a suede fabric recliner. This fabric, while comfortable, attracts animal hair like sugar to ants. Thor. Cousin. The respective voices were Frigg and Hell, who approached me while I was planning a punishment for Fenrir. Although I flashed a smile when I saw that both my cousin and my mother seemed to have gotten along. It took a while for Freak to get back together with Hell, after all, Freak was warned by my paranoid old man and my uncle. But it seemed that the more Freak was alone with Hell, the more Freak returned to bond with her abandoned niece, and Hell returned to the mother figure she once had. Hello you too, I said, with a smile. But it seemed my smile wasn't appropriate for the situation. I need your help, Freak said, looking me in the eye. I must admit, if it was anyone I would say no right away, maybe I could make an exception if I knew the reason, or if the help would benefit me in any way. But if it were my beloved mother, who raised me and taught me many things in my life, who endured the frequent betrayals of my old man, who showed a mother's deepest love, asking for help with a pained look on her face? Yes the answer was kind of obvious. POV. Third person. Who needs to die? Asked Thor apathetically. This seemed to be the wrong answer, as Freak was soon alarmed. Nobody. Nobody needs to die. I just I want you to accompany me along with Baldra on my visit to a close friend in Greece, Frigg said. In the face of Frigg's answer, Thor looked uncertain, after all, he had left there, and he didn't want to come back anytime soon. Why do you want to go to Greece anyway, mom? Asked Thor, curious. Frigg then quickly replied. I haven't seen my old friend Ray in ages, I couldn't visit her freely when her husband came to power, I couldn't visit her during a civil war, I couldn't visit her after the civil war, I couldn't visit her during the times of crisis with Tiffin, said Frigg, as she walked away and sat down on the sofa again. Frigg seemed at this point somewhat melancholy, mainly due to not being able to help her best friend without causing a disturbance in supernatural politics, but with the victory of the Olympians, and the likely period of peace that began, Frigg believed she could finally visit her. I just want to see her again, she was my rock after the Asgardian civil war, and I was her rock when her father imprisoned the rest of her brothers, Frigg said, with a longing tone. Thor remained apathetic, though Hela Snifog Hel's eyes were full of tears, and it looked like she was going to start crying at any moment. Thor didn't even look at Hel, but still placed a hand on the young goddess's head, and caressed her, while Hel tried unsuccessfully to wipe away her tears, trying to show comfort. It was then that Frigg flashed a smile. I hear she has several sons and daughters and even grandsons and granddaughters so I'd like to meet them and introduce her to my sons as well," Frigg said with a smile. That statement froze Thor. Thor's mind began to process the various hypothetical scenarios for the encounter, most scenarios ended up with Zeus or Poseidon flirting with his mother. Thor's face darkened. I'll go with you, said Thor, without hesitation. Frigg just gave an excited smile and thanks. Thank you, my son, just me, you, and Baldur will go, the rest of your brothers won't be able to go due to an important mission on an island further north, said Frigg, getting up from the couch and walking towards Thor. Thor raised an eyebrow and looked pointedly at Hel, who soon realized the meaning. I can't cousin, I have work, if I didn't there wouldn't be souls in Valhalla. After all, souls can't judge each other said Hel. Thor soon nodded in acknowledgement and looked back at Frigg. Isn't it too risky to take Baldur? He's the future ruler maybe it's better if only me accompany you, mom, said Thor. Frigg then responded promptly. You know your brother, he's the one who volunteered. He said he would like to meet the person he became my best friend with, Frigg said with a smile. Thor could only sign response, and it looked like he was going to make a comment in this regard, but stopped, as he was interrupted by something that caught his attention. Did you hear that? Asked Thor, in confusion. The two women in front of Thor denied it, and just looked confused at Thor's reaction, who started to look around in curiosity. Thor had heard a sonic boom. In fact, Thor could still hear the sound as he was getting closer and closer at high speed. Boom earth shook briefly, and Thor looked at the door suspiciously as the sounds had stopped after the tremor. Thor then approached the door and opened it. The first thing Thor saw was the javelin spear in front of him, floating harmlessly the second thing was the crater created in front of his house, where the spear was located exactly in the center. The thunder god just swore in response, and soon left the house and closed the door, preventing Frigg and Hel from seeing the spear in front of his house. Thor then ran to the crater, grabbed the spear, and placed it inside its storage space just in time before Frigg opened the door. Thor, my son, what happened? Frigg asked, looking at the crater. 
Thor just assumed a calm countenance as he left the center of the crater and answered briefly. No big deal mom, just a little mishap no need to worry, let's just get Baldr and go visit this friend of yours, said Thor. Somehow, Thor managed to keep Frigg from commenting on the events at Thor's house, and they just went in search of Baldr in Midgard. Baldr ended up standing in what would come to be known as future Greenland, admiring the view enjoying the stunning scenery that the sun offered. That was one of the few perks of being the sun god. Although Ra is enshrined as the strongest solar deity, the other solar gods should not be underestimated. Baldr was one of those gods. The Norse sun god was already strong and powerful, but in the presence of the sun, Baldr could be described as invincible, as nothing should harm him. There was no doubt that after Thor and Odin, Baldr was the third strongest in the entire Norse pantheon. In fact, it was quite possible that Baldr had already surpassed Odin himself, but the young god didn't hold many achievements, unlike Odin. When Frigg and Thor finally sought out Baldr, the three Norse supernaturals headed for Greece. And they stopped at a specific city, which in the future would be known as Athens. However, at this time, the city didn't even have a name, and it didn't have a name for the territory. Location. Region of future Attica Greece. POV, third person. In the center of town at night, Thor, Frigg, and Baldr strolled carelessly, not caring for the humans who didn't seem surprised by the appearance of the three deities. This was due to the fact that both Thor, Frigg, and Baldr had formed a rune that masked their physical presence to humans, making them invisible to non-supernatural eyes. What a lively place. Very different from our territory, Frigg said, watching the city streets move with interest. Indeed, mother although I find their culture a little strange, said Baldr uncertainly, as he looked at the piles of rocks in front of the houses. Thor only glanced briefly at the piles and shuddered in response, as if he knew what it was for. Weird culture or not, we didn't come here to question this mom, where's your friend? Asked Thor. Frigg looked confused before answering. Ray said someone would come to pick us up here, she won't be coming in person, because she will be preparing a welcome feast for our arrival, Frigg said. It was then that some humans began to crowd together, drawing the attention of the Norse deities. Listen, listen! shouted a voice, which resounded throughout the place. It was just a young man who was putting on a little competition a competition between gods. The gods were Athena, who wore a serious countenance, and Poseidon, who wore a confident smile. Today we will decide the name for our much-loved city, with two great gods vying to sponsor our city offering us gifts. The best gift will win, and our king, Secrops, will be the one who decides the victor said the young man. The audience soon applauded even Frigg and Baldr, who applauded politely only Thor didn't clap, and just stared in disbelief at what he was seeing, and hoped it was an illusion. King Secrops looked like any other human except he had a sea serpent's tail. It was then that Poseidon began the competition. With divine power, Poseidon glowed in a mixture of green and navy blue colors, which briefly blinded the audience. When the glow faded, three thoroughbred horses were at Poseidon's side, who soon gestured with his trident and began to speak. I give you the best horses in the world. They will serve both for work and for war," said Poseidon confidently. Poseidon thought he had managed to win, as according to the established rules, gifts shouldn't be supernatural or powerful, as they would be given to humans. And at that moment a horse's life was worth more than a human's. When it was Athena's turn, the goddess didn't use divine power, she just used her hand to grab something inside the armor. When the goddess reached out her hand, everyone saw what the goddess took a plant with golden leaves. Thor distinguished as being an olive branch. Athena soon let go of the branch and used divine power to make a tree from the branch on the ground. I offer you olive plantations, said Athena. People marveled at the tree that began to grow until it became gigantic. But Poseidon just rolled his eyes and looked at the king, who was the judge and waited for the verdict. King Secrops was silent before approaching both gods. Both gifts are of great importance to our city, however goddess Athena's gift comes out victorious. And therefore our city will be named after her in honor of her victory, said Secrops. The people soon agreed with the decision, because for the people the olive tree was the noblest of trees, being resistant to droughts and providing the fruits with which oil was produced, which was a food fortifying the muscles of athletes and warriors, and fuel for common dwellings and temples. Undoubtedly, planting olive trees around the city was far more valuable than a few horses. The Sidon had obviously been upset by the decision, as it meant a defeat for his niece and his brother's favorite daughter, and soon gripped his trident in anger and stared at Athena, who stared back. It won't stay this way, Poseidon said. Poseidon's power soon roared in response, though only Athena's and Secrop seemed to react to the buildup of power, and they worried that Poseidon might try something, that's what they thought until a new force appeared out of nowhere, knocking out mortals and bringing Greek supernatural beings to their knees. For Secrops, it was as if he was being crushed by an enormous force, and it looked as if he would lose consciousness at any moment. For Athena's it was as if someone was stepping on her body, preventing her from getting up, while she sweated nervously at the new presence. 
For Poseidon it was worse. For the focus of power was actually the god of the seas himself, who by a miracle was still conscious, though he was on his knees and sweating profusely, as he tried to support himself with trembling arms in the face of the overwhelming power. It was then that footsteps were heard. The footsteps seemed to be something like metal connecting with the earth, causing a distinct sound. The three Greek supernatural beings acquired the strength to look towards the source of the sound, and saw something that made them hold their breath. A man with long red hair, wearing a kind of white coat along with black gloves and a golden belt, which had a hammer attached, walked towards them. The man held a gaze that would make anyone freeze in fear, with black scleras and gold eyes gleaming with power. It was Thor. As soon as the Norse god stopped next to Poseidon and Athena, the pressure from before was gone, and the Greek supernatural beings could breathe properly, although they faced Thor in fear. Let's calm down, shall we? Asked Thor, raising his eyebrow. Athena sweated in response. That wasn't the best way to calm us down, whispered the goddess Athena. Thor. Don't cause a scene like that again, you could have accidentally killed someone, said Frigg, who soon followed Thor. Baldr followed Frigg closely and seemed unaffected by what had happened. In fact, neither Frigg nor Baldr were affected, as Thor took aim at those in his line of sight. Thor only smiled an apology. Sorry, mom but I assumed one of those two would be the one who should be leading us to Olympus, said Thor, nonchalantly. Thor actually felt no excuse, after all, for the Norse god of thunder, it was a good way to practice the Vilgister king. Frigg just snorted in response and soon went to scold Thor again, but Baldr soon interfered. Mom, I think it's okay, no damage was done, I think Thor just wanted to get the attention of our future hosts, although I don't really agree with the method, said Baldr, with an uncertain smile and sweating, as he looked at Thor. Thor just shrugged. It worked, said Thor. It was then that Athena's and Poseidon soon knew who was in front of them the guests that Rey had said to fetch, before Poseidon entered a competition against Athena to see who would be the patron of the city newly founded by Secrops. The god of the Greek seas soon took the initiative, in addition to showing a self-seeking look to Frigg. Greetings. Welcome to our territory, I am Poseidon, and I was commissioned by my mother to take you to Olympus, said Poseidon. Poseidon had already risen from the ground, and though he gave Thor a fearful look, he looked at Frigg with some interest. When Frigg held up her hand for Poseidon to shake, the god of the seas surprised not only Frigg but Thor and Baldr, by taking the hand and placing a tender kiss on the calloused knuckles of Frigg's hand. A pop vein could be seen on the forehead of both princes of Asgard. Frigg, however, soon defused the situation by trying to introduce herself to Athena. And you, my young one? How are you? Asked Frigg, releasing her hand from Poseidon's grip and extending it to Athena, who had approached shyly, while she glanced at Thor from time to time. I am Athena, daughter of Zeus greetings to you, Queen of Asgard, said Athena, bowing briefly to Frigg. Poseidon soon took the lead again, while looking only at Frigg. Come on, come on. My mother awaits you at the great feast, Poseidon said, offering an inviting arm. Frigg just gave a polite smile. Fine, you can show us the way, Frigg said, quickly taking Baldr's arm, refusing Poseidon's arm. The god of the seas didn't seem upset, quite the opposite, in fact, there was only one thing going on in his mind I like it better the hard ones. Poseidon thought while licking his lips. The group soon left the newly named city of Athens, and once they were a good distance away, Athena summoned a teleportation circle, which transported them all to the top of Mount Olympus. At the top of the highest mountain in Greece, there was a kind of magic circle carved into the ground. This was the gateway to the abode of the gods. Poseidon soon activated the circle, and then a flash of light soon engulfed all those present and transported them to Olympus. Olympus, or the abode of the Greek gods, was actually a vast city in the clouds, with luxurious houses and temples made entirely of gold. It was then that the group saw a figure running towards them, the figure didn't stop running and just passed the group, just making the wind roar. Hermes is always working, said Poseidon in contemplation. It's natural he's the messenger, so it's quite common for him to be busy, said Athena. The Norse gods only thought of their messenger Hermod. All the Norse, even Frigg, admitted that Hermod was not the busiest being in their pantheon, in fact, he was the opposite Hermod was lazy most of the time. The group then continued to a great hall, which was a giant table that at this point, accommodated all of the high-ranking supernatural beings of Olympus, with the exception of a few deities Frigg. It's so good to see you again, even after so many years Ray said, approaching quickly and hugging Frigg. Frigg just smiled in response and returned the hug. Yes Ray, I'm assuming you look alright after all that happened said Frigg. Ray then pulled out of the hug, still smiling. Come, sit down and I'll introduce you to my family, Ray said, then pulled Frigg to the table. Thor and Baldr just followed their mother closely as they looked around interested in the architecture of the place as well as the people. Meanwhile location. Future Iceland. POV. Third person. Three deities were walking around the island carrying out a reconnaissance mission. 
the three were Vider, Vali and Hermod. And at that moment, they are close to an active volcano on the island. This is worrying said Vali, seriously. Don't tell me genius, this is the 25th active volcano we found this shouldn't be normal, Vali, so of course, it's worrying, Hermod said. Vider remained calm as he looked around. The island they were on was a special island, after all the biggest volcano on the island was the entrance to the kingdom of Sertra Misspelshamer. The mission given to them by Odin was to investigate the island, as it now looked like an increase in activity. For all those Sertra is confirmed to still be sleeping, his children are starting to get restless, according to Odin this in itself caused concern to the Asgardians. It was then that something caught Vider's vision claw marks climbing up the slope of the volcano. You two shut up. We have a situation here, Vider said in a commanding tone as he drew his sword. Hermod and Vali soon drew their weapons and looked around, copying Vider's actions. The three brothers were silent and tried to hear something. I don't hear anything, said Vali, worried. Vali was worried because hearing anything in a place that should have some sign of life, was never a good sign, as it could only mean one thing a predator was nearby. It was then that the ground exploded close to Vali, he soon raised his shield to block the attack, though the young god was hit, and soon flew by the force of the blow, and fell next to Hermod. Vali! shouted Hermod. Hermod! Go home and tell our father! This order is not as a brother, but as a leader of the group. Vali and I will take care of it! said Vider, already positioning himself in front of Hermod. Hermod was silent and soon began to run at a sonic speed, by which time Vali had already got up and stood close to Vider, who watched the cloud of dust carefully. Do you have any plans? Vali asked, seeing two golden eyes emerging from a cloud of dust. Vider just snorted in response. Yes try not to stand in my way to glory, Vider said. Vali gave a short laugh. Ha! Well said I would say the same line for you, brother, said Vali, with a smile. As the dust settled, the brothers saw the monster made purely of rock and molten magma, 15 feet tall, looking at them as if it were seeing new prey. It was one of Serger's children. Serger's child roared in response and soon attacked the brothers, who only smiled in response and charged at the same time the creature attacked. Both of Odin's sons gave a battle cry, as the creature gave a roar of fury that spat magma from its jaws. This was their first contact with one of Serger's offspring, and it would be the first time the Asgardians would witness the power of one of Serger's millions of children. The brothers soon split up one going a different way, trying to confuse the magma creature, but were surprised when spikes made of magma popped out of the creature's skin. The brothers soon blocked the spikes with their shields and tried to dodge the rest. Volley! The legs! shouted Vider. The pair of brothers soon approached the creature, which was still trying to hit them with its claws or magma spikes. When the brothers got close enough, they tried to use their swords and stab where the tendons should be, looking to make the creature fall or lose its balance. However, the sword soon bounced off the creature's hard skin, which roared in response and stomped to the ground, causing a small earthquake and unbalancing the brothers. The creature didn't stay still, and soon it swung one of its arms, which extended as if it were made of water, and soon it hit Vider squarely, who barely had time to raise his shield. Vali didn't just watch and took advantage of the moment when the creature attacked Vider, and threw his sword at one of the creature's eyes, since it was impossible to break through the hard skin, Vali thought the weak points would be the eyes. The god Vali would not prefer to use swords, after all, he was an archer, but Vali's aim was considered lethal, with chances of success with each throw, that means, Vali never missed a target. The creature roared briefly as the sword hit the eye squarely, and just turned its head slowly towards Vali, who looked up in shock when he saw the sword stab in the eye begin to melt. This. It's going to be harder than I thought, said Vali, raising his shield again and running toward the creature. It was then that the creature let out another roar in defiance and began to run, but was soon stopped when a shield slammed into the side of its knee, and sent the creature falling to the ground. The shield then returned to the caster's hands, who turned out to be Vider. Use magic brother. Ice or water? Said Vider, already creating a white magic circle that soon shot a blast of ice towards the creature's legs on the ground. Vali soon obeyed the command and created a blue circle, shooting a jet of water, which was quickly frozen by the ice magic. The brothers noticed that the magma in the creature's body seemed to lose its luster as if cooling, and believed it was working, as the creature also began to roar in what appeared to be pain. Until the creature spat a jet of magma at Vider, who dodged the attack but had to stop the blast of ice in the process, giving it just enough time to reach out a hand and hit the volley squarely, cancelling the jet of water, causing him to spit blood and being thrown away. The creature's magma glowed brighter than ever and began to melt the ice. It was then that Vider gave a final battle cry and jumped towards the creature's head, which then reached out its right arm and grabbed Vider's legs, raising the temperature and burning Vider's clothes and skin, who roared in pain. The creature soon swung its arm and sent Vider crashing to the ground, creating a crater, and causing the young god to choke on blood, along with a scream of pain. 
Vider didn't give up, and soon he lifted the sword and imbued it with his divine power, along with magic circles of ice nature, and then hurled the sword towards one of the creature's eyes. The creature seeing the action used its free arm to defend itself, but was stopped when Vali, who had already stood up, hurled his shield which slammed into the creature's arm, knocking it out of the way of Vider's sword. Vider's sword soon successfully hit the eye, and unlike before, the creature let out a roar of pain that resonated across the island towards the sky, as the glowing magma took on a hue of blue, before starting to fade completely. When the magma was extinguished, the creature remained a statue, until it began to crack and gradually disintegrate. Brother! shouted Vali, choking on blood as he ran towards Vider, though stumbling along the way due to the pain in his body or at least, what was left of Vider's charred legs. Due to the shock of losing most of his legs, Vider began to gradually lose his eyesight, only briefly seeing Vali yelling at him to try to keep him awake. Though the screams fell on deaf ears, for Vider had already lost consciousness by the time Vali arrived POV. Third person. A feast on Olympus was what the Norse gods greeted, with Frigg sitting at the table with Baldur right beside her, and Thor could be seen sitting a little farther away, at a nearby window, as he had decided the conversation was not interest for him. Though Thor always looked at Zeus and Poseidon carefully, most of the deities were present at the banquet hosted by Zeus, but most were just eating and didn't seem to mind the guests. Only Rey showed excitement, which could be clearly seen due to her chatting non-stop with Frigg, choosing to sit next to her. And so that terrible monster was defeated by my son, with his brilliant plan and the sickle's help, Rey said with a proud smile. Frigg looked interested but unimpressed. Well, what about your kids? What feats did they perform to echo through divine eternity? Asked Rey, looking at Frigg expectantly. Frigg looked coy with the question. Well, my kids are a little more troublesome. But the most prominent achievement comes from my son Thor, who annihilated 1000 Jadans while drunk, Frigg said, with a slightly embarrassed smile. Rey looked stunned, but by the end of the answer, she was in disbelief. Drunk? Asked Rey. Very drunk the bloodthirsty drunkard is one of the titles he won from the people, Frigg said, embarrassed. For the Nordic mother, although consumption of meat is a cultural thing, starting to drink alcohol from an early age, she considers her red-haired son to be a little too addicted to meet my brother has his quirks, goddess Ray, but I assure you he is a great example to my Asgardian people, when it comes to their relentless quest to become someone strong, in fact, he's my inspiration, Baldur said, with a gentle smile at Ray. Ray didn't seem so convinced, as the great Greek mother only had contact with a few deities with such an appetite for alcohol. Her grandson, Dionysio, was a good example. To Rey, Dionysus was far from a fighting god. In fact, the most combat-addicted deity would be Ares, the prince of Olympus, son of Zeus and Themis. A being that ended up growing up and living by violence, mainly due to its own volatile birth from the combination of Zeus's nature and Themis's nature. Ares grew up to be considered an aberration that always yearned for combat, so much so that the god began to have the particularity of covering the bed with the skin of warriors fallen by his hand. Themis, devastated by what her son had become, secluded herself in the hidden chamber of the Delphic Temple, where she began advising humans with prophecies when Apollo was not present. Ares, however, cared little about his mother leaving, the young god only cared about one thing fight. So you are the crown prince of Asgard? Asked a voice. The voice belonged to a young man who was sitting across from Baldur. Being described as someone of great beauty, albeit with a bloodthirsty aura, sporting long blonde hair similar to the current king of Olympus, and glowing red eyes that emitted a dangerous glow as if they were flames. The young man was the crown prince of Olympus Ares, god of the violent war. Baldur reacted politely to the question that had an obvious answer. Indeed, said Baldur. Ares just snorted in response. Interesting you seem to be a tough guy, Ares said, with a confident smile. Baldur, however, only needed a second to respond in a way not well understood by most people at the table. That's what she said. Said Baldur with a smile. The silence that followed was caused by the confusion of most of the table's occupants. Baldur, noticing the silence, was uncomfortable and, surprisingly, confused. The young god of light then looked at the only figure he could trust in this uncomfortable moment Thor. Wasn't the time right? Asked Baldur. Thor just smiled. No little shit, the time was perfect, you're just way ahead of your time, Thor said with a small smile. Baldr smiled and waved in response before turning his gaze to Ares, who was looking even more confused. Don't worry too much about my kids they're just a little eccentric, but then again, who isn't? Right? Said Frigg, shrugging her shoulders. Baldr and Thor just smiled at their mother, while Rey gave a knowing smile. I think I understand what it's like, Rey said, looking at a specific spot on the table. The place was occupied by Rey's youngest son and the current ruler and king of Olympus. Zeus. And right now he was doing something that needed his full attention, so tell me do you have other uses for these talented hands? 
asked Zeus, wiggling his brows with a smile as he looked at a nymph, who was pouring wine. The nymph only gave a polite smile, but it was noticeable that she was nervous about being approached by the king of Olympus so blatantly. Ray then looked at Frigg and gave an apologetic smile. Unfortunately, some of my kids are more eccentric than others, Ray said. Oh I see, said Frigg. It was then that Baldr chose to comment on something else, to get out of a possibly embarrassing situation. So what do you guys do to pass the time around here? Asked Baldr curiously. The hall was silent, all the Greek deities stopped to think about an answer, yet nothing came to mind due to a simple fact. They didn't have much to do for fun, mainly because they had just won a war, and the vast majority went into hiding during the Tiffin crisis. Zeus, noticing the scenario, in addition to having the opportunity to impress potential lovers, chose this moment to speak. To celebrate our victory, I propose games. Said Zeus, getting up from the table and saying aloud, his voice like thunder. Everyone was immediately interested, after all, any opportunity a deity has to have fun will get their full attention. Games? Asked Baldur, tilting his head in confusion. Have you never heard of competitions? Ha! Huh. How weird, Ares said. Baldur, however, didn't look offended, and actually wondered if his pantheon had some sort of competition between deities, the answer was kind of obvious. Our people were not created this way. The closest thing to competition is dispute resolution in the Valhalla arena in short, we don't play games, said Thor, who had approached the table. Hera, who was next to Rey, stared at Thor's facial features in silence, as if she saw something familiar. Weird, said Hera, whispering to herself. If Hera didn't know better and wasn't a virgin, she'd say Thor was the father of the only child she ever had, and will have Hephaestus. But while Hera was lost in thought, the god Ares didn't like the statements. Are you saying we play? Ares asked, narrowing his eyes. Thor only raised an eyebrow in confusion, though he soon shrugged. It was a way of speaking, I didn't exactly mean that, said Thor. Zeus, looking for an opportunity, soon approached. So how about we have the first friendly competition between you as guardians and us Olympians in some non-fatal competitions, Zeus said with a smile. Thor looked at Zeus apathetically. I don't see a good reason to Thor said, but stop when he remembered something. Thor then grabbed Baldr, who was confused by the action, and they walked away for just a few seconds when the princes returned, they both had a smile on their faces. If it's a competition, then I suppose there's some prize for the winner, Baldr said with a smile. Zeus frowned. Is there anything more valuable than the glory of victory? Asked Zeus. That didn't make the Asgardian princes lose their smiles. While glory is important, an award for the winner should be a more effective motivation, said Thor. Zeus paused to think, though he glanced briefly at Njolnir, which was attached to the golden belt, the Majingjurd, with a look of interest. I like the hammer, Zeus said, commenting on the weapon. Thor just shrugged, but an even bigger smile on his face. It's all yours Therises, said Thor, pulling Njolnir from his belt. As soon as Thor said the command word Therissa's Mjolnir expanded, changing in size to giant size. Thor then placed Mjolnir on the pristine ground of Olympus. You just need to lift it, said Thor. Zeus, who flashed a confident and arrogant smile, thinking he got a new weapon for free, soon stepped forward and grabbed Mjolnir's hilt, and made a move to lift it up just Mjolnir didn't move off the ground. Zeus, frowning, gripped the hilt with both hands, and tried to lift Mjolnir again, only to fail spectacularly. Erg what kind of magic is this? Questioned Zeus, sweating, while still trying to lift Mjolnir off the ground. Thor only had a smile on his face, but it was Baldr who answered. My brother's hammer, Mjolnir, is undoubtedly a rather peculiar divine weapon, this is due to the fact that, unlike most weapons, Mjolnir does not choose the wielder, in fact, anyone can wield it, as long as they have enough strength, said Baldr. Athena, who approached, soon questioned. What do you mean, just be strong enough? Are you referring to willpower? Asked Athena. Baldr, however, surprised most by shaking his head. No physical strength, said Baldr. This seemed to stun most of the Greek pantheon. How primitive, said Athena, frowning as she looked at Mjolnir. Now Zeus and Poseidon were trying to lift Mjolnir with all their might. Come on brothers. You can do it, said a female voice, with an inspiring tone. The voice was Hestia, who was cheering for Zeus and Poseidon, with two flags that had their symbol respectively in her hands. It may be primitive, but no one has been able to lift Mjolnir apart from my brother so far said Baldr. Athena soon raised an eyebrow. Then how does he manage to accomplish such a feat? Asked Athena in disbelief. Baldr just smiled and pointed at Thor, but before Baldr could answer Athena's question, Thor chose that moment to speak. Thanks to my gauntlets, Jarngreeper, and my belt, Majingjurd, I can safely hold Mjolnir, said Thor. This, however, was misunderstood by all who were unfamiliar with Thor's plight, it is wrong to think that Thor is the one who needs gauntlets and a magical belt to hold Mjolnir. The truth was the complete opposite. 
It was Njolar that needed Thor to use two limiters simultaneously, so there was no risk of Thor breaking it by accident. This, however, was not known to anyone but a few deities, Baldr being one of them. Most, even most Asgardians, thought that Thor used his gauntlets and belt to be strong enough to lift Mjolnir. Then let's do the following, two competitions, in case of your victory, I will gladly give my gauntlets and belt, in order to gain possession of Mjolnir. However, in the case of the Asgardian victory, the rewards for us might be Cronus's sickle, and do you want something Baldr? Asked Thor, looking at his younger brother. Baldr paused to consider consideration for a few seconds before answering. I heard of a blacksmith god who is absent. I don't want to insult you brother, but I would like something made by the hands of a different culture than ours, maybe because the forging method is different, the result is as unique as the technique used, said Baldr, giving Thor an apologetic smile. Thor didn't look insulted, in fact, he had a knowing smile on his face as he looked at Baldr. Nana? Asked Thor. Baldr, surprisingly, blushed in response. Yes, said Baldr. Thor even patted Baldr on the back in acknowledgement. So we have a deal? Asked Thor, looking at Zeus. Zeus, Ares, and Poseidon looked at Thor. Deal. Said the Greek gods. And so, a few minutes later, in an arena made of gold and filled with Greek supernatural beings such as nymphs, satyrs, centaurs, harpies, sirens, and impuses, cheering for the competitors. Several Greek deities also attended the site, one of them was Hephaestus, who was in a bad mood due to being forced out of the forge. I don't understand, why am I here? I won't even compete. I just created some materials for the competition, said Hephaestus, complaining to his mother who was sitting next to him. Hera gave a knowing smile. I understand you don't like to come out of your forge, my son, but I ask you to remember the promise you made to me about participating in important events, said Hera. Hephaestus just grumbled. The king, Zeus, just created this event, said Hephaestus. Hera went to answer her son's dissatisfied grumbles, but a voice ended up interrupting. Excuse me, Hera, said the voice. When Hera looked at the source of the voice, she saw a deity who ended up becoming her and her son's best friend, due to coincidences Aphrodite. The goddess of love ended up being the target of many male Olympian gods, even Zeus, though the goddess firmly refuses on the grounds that she would be exclusive to her future husband Aeolia. The problem is that when Aphrodite learned of the destruction of Knossos, she soon went to the underworld with the biggest smile in the world, and demanded Aeolia's soul from Hades. The problem is, the god of the underworld claimed that the soul of no one named Aeolia, was to be found in the underworld. This resulted in Aphrodite's wrath which shook the Greek underworld to its foundations, and only stopped with the intervention of Hades. The goddess then believed that Aeolia was very much alive, just in another location. During that time of searching, she met Hephaestus, who claimed to consider Aeolia a father figure, this caused Aphrodite to get so close to Hephaestus, and they became friends. Aphrodite also met Hera, and considered her a close friend, although the two always argued over a specific title, that both goddesses aspired to the most beautiful goddess. When the two argued about this title, Hephaestus soon walked away claiming he had a headache, may I sit here? Asked Aphrodite, pointing to the vacant seat. Hera just smiled in response. But of course. Sit down. At least I will have someone to talk to other than my son who's quite upset at the moment said Hera, looking at Hephaestus with a teasing smile. Hephaestus just grumbled even more, while Aphrodite cracked a smile. It was then that the entire audience looked towards the center of the arena when they noticed an impusa that appeared on the spot. Greetings. To honor the victory over the Titans and the terrible Tiffin, our king decreed a celebration. Welcome to the Olympics. Shouted the impusa. Hephaestus soon scoffed. What a creative name, as expected of the king, said Hephaestus. Aphrodite gave a small laugh, while Hera lightly scolded her son. Hephaestus, don't mock your king. Said Hera, frowning in rebuke. Meanwhile, the impusa has spoken again. For champions to serve as an example to be followed by future generations, competitors must compete naked. Shouted the impusa. This, of course, led to the screams of most female supernatural beings, some male beings also started screaming in response. When the impusa declared, from one of the gates of the arena, Zeus and Ares soon came out completely naked. People of Olympus. I give you your champions. The king and his heir. Zeus and Ares said the impusa. The audience cried out in response, and at the same time, the impusa didn't stop, and soon introduced the duo that was leaving the other gate, and the challengers. The Asgardians. The crown prince and his brother. Baldr and Thor. Shouted the impusa. As they both walked out of the gates, they both looked around and remained, surprisingly, a little ashamed of their naked state. Why are we doing this naked anyway? Asked Thor, whispering to Baldr. Baldr just forced a smile. They say it's tradition, and they claim that nudity shows the beauty of the contestants' bodies, and should be something to be proud of. 
Also, they claim that the clothes get in the way of the athletes' movements, especially because, if you've noticed, the weather here is quite hot, said Balder, waving politely with a smile. Thor also nodded politely, though he had noticed that most of the women, and even men, looked at him in shock. What the hell is wrong with them? Asked Thor, in confusion. Balder only smiled in response, but he already knew why. After all, due to Thor's height, most women, and even some men, were staring at one extremely big particular member, which resulted in most women looking at Thor in interest, and men looking at him in envy. If the Asgardian is willing, I might be quite interested. Said the Impusa in the center of the arena, winking at Thor. Thor just disregarded the flirtation and approached the center of the arena, along with Balder, heading towards Zeus, Ares, and the Impusa, and then crossed his arms. Let's get on with it, I want my sickle besides, it's weird to be naked like this the wind is annoying, said Thor, muttering the last part. Meanwhile, Ray and Freak were watching the interaction from one of the reserved seats in the arena. Looks like your sons were sculpted for war, Ray said, looking at Thor and Baldur's physiques. The Greek mother goddess noted that Thor's physique was more powerful than Baldur's, although the god of light was not far behind in terms of muscular definition. Why are they doing this without any clothes on? Frigg asked, looking confused. Ray just smiled in response. There is nothing more beautiful than the body my friend we have a culture of appreciating the body a lot, naked turns out not to be a big deal said Ray. Frigg didn't seem to agree. This sounds more like something perverted created by your children Frigg muttered under her breath, making Ray not hear. Meanwhile, with Aphrodite, Hera and Hephaestus Hephaestus do you have any twins? Asked Aphrodite, looking at Thor in amazement. If you didn't consider the exposed golden veins, the black sclera, and the giant musculature Thor would be a carbon copy of Hephaestus. No well, no that I knew of, said Hephaestus, slowly, as he faced Thor. To Hephaestus, he felt something familiar, while Hera was silent and just stared at Thor with a frown, showing the goddess's confusion and curiosity. It was then that the impusa that was presenting the game spoke again. Very well, by order of Zeus, there will only be two modalities. The first one will start now, and due to the draw made earlier, the contestants will be the crown princes. Said the Impusa. Ares and Balder were soon face to face, and then, with a small glow emerging from the arena, a kind of ring was created from the ground, with only Balder and Ares in the center, with both hands, covered by leather straps called Hemantes. Which basically would be something like boxing gloves. The first modality is the famous Pancracio. The rules are simple, except sticking your fingers in the eyes, attacking the genital area, scratching or biting, everything is allowed. The fight ends when one of the fighters is unable to continue or has given up. Said the Impusa. Baldur then raised his fists towards Ares, who copied the gesture, and clapped his fists together. Both crown princes then quickly backed away and assumed a fighting stance. Thor looked quite relaxed, which couldn't be missed by Zeus, who was standing next to the Asgardian. You seem confident of your brother, Zeus said, approaching Thor. Thor looked at the King of Olympus and gave a small smile. Of course I am after all, Baldr is the second strongest of all the Asgardians, said Thor. Zeus frowned briefly and looked back at the ring. At this moment, Ares chose to attack, quickly lifting his foot and kicking Baldr's abdomen hard. However, while the kick had the effect of pushing Baldr away a bit, Asgard's God of Light was completely fine. Ares didn't seem to want to stop the charge, so he soon ran towards Baldr, and soon started punching the young God of Light, who raised his arms in a defensive stance, each blow from Ares hit Baldr, shaking the arena as if it were an earthquake. The arena screamed for each successful strike by Ares, and to the audience, Baldr was on the defensive as he was losing. The war god of Greece only laughed in response and looked displeased with Baldr tin so defensive. Ha 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 ha! What is this Asgardian? Show me what you're capable of! Don't embarrass me that way! Ares said, still punching Baldr with his fists. It was then Ares had a brief glimpse of Baldr's eyes shining like two suns. The war god's fighting instinct screamed in response, and then Ares jerked his head to the side, just in time to dodge a lightning-fast punch from Baldr. However, Baldr soon bent his outstretched arm quickly, and elbowed Ares right in the side of the head, resulting in the god of war backing away. When Ares lifted his head and looked at Baldr, you could see the excited smile on his face. Now this is interesting! shouted Ares. The god of war then ran towards Baldr. Ares's increase in speed and strength was noticeable due to the fact that the longer a conflict goes on, Ares's physical capabilities will always constantly increase until Ares's body reaches the limit. The two princes then punched each other in the face at the same time, both with an outstretched arm, though Ares was the only one to bleed again, while Baldr just stared at Ares with a look of apathy. Baldr didn't stop and soon approached Ares at lightning speed, surprising him, and punched the god of war in the face with all his might, sending Ares's body crashing into the ground, destroying the ring, and cracking the arena, causing an earthquake. 
When the dust settled, Ares could be found knocked out in the center of the ring, while Baldr was standing unharmed. The audience politely applauded the Asgardians' victory, while Thor briefly glanced at Zeus, and was surprised that the King of Olympus did not appear to be angered by the defeat. You don't look upset, said Thor. Zeus only glanced briefly, before giving him a bored look. Ares is young, he still has a lot to fight for and a lot to learn. After all, he is a deity of the sixth generation of rulers, Zeus said with a shrug. Thor raised an eyebrow. Sixth generation? Asked Thor, curious. Zeus nodded briefly. Well, yes. The first ruler was Chaos, the second was Gaia, the third was Uranus, the fourth was my father, and I am the fifth ruler, said Zeus. Thor only nodded at the answer, as he was of the fifth divine generation, as the Norse primordial of the void, Janungagap, was the first ruler, with Buri being the second, Bor being the third, and Odin being the fourth ruler of Asgard. Though Janungagap could hardly consider a ruler, for at the time of his existence, there was nothing to rule over, and with his death, Ymir was born first, then at Humbla, and finally Buri. As Thor thought for a while about Janungagap, the Impusin interrupted his thoughts by drawing the attention of the Arena audience. The Asgardian victory is indisputable, now we will move on to the next modality. Now with our king, Zeus, competing against the brother of the crown prince of Asgard, said the Impusa. The arena then glowed and turned into a sort of throwing combo, with several discs made of celestial bronze next to an inscribed circle in the middle of the arena. The next competition will be discos, the contestants will throw a very resistant bronze disc as hard as they can, the arena will mark the distance with samadas made of energy, and the arena itself will measure the distance from the disc's exit from the area of throwing, which is the circle, and will show us the result. Said the Impusa. Such an arena capability was created by Hephaestus, who had nothing better to do and wanted to come up with some great innovative project. Zeus flashed a confident smile and grabbed one of the discs, and soon began to spin his body at high speed. It was noticeable that some lightning appeared out of nowhere, further increasing Zeus's turning speed. After a few seconds, and when Zeus was about to create a hurricane in the middle of the arena, the King of Olympus threw the disc into the sky. The disc came out of Zeus's hand looking like a meteor, causing the sound of an explosion as it was thrown. A few seconds passed until the arena glowed again, and a number could be seen as a hologram in the center of the arena, for all to see. As expected of our king. 20,247, Stadion is amazing. Shouted the Impusa. The audience applauded as Zeus nodded with a confident smile. Meanwhile, with Rey and Frigg, the Greek motherhood goddess wore a confident smile. Are you confident of your son's victory my friend? Asked Rey, looking at Frigg. But then the goddess Rey was confused by Frigg's actions. Frigg had strapped herself to the chair. What are you doing? Asked Rey, in confusion. Frigg just smiled sheepishly. My son Thor has a tendency to exaggerate a little I suggest you hold on to something, Frigg said. Meanwhile, Thor started towards the pile of throwing discs, but as he passed Baldr, the god of light soon asked with a smile. Going to overdo it again, won't you? Asked Baldr, with a nervous smile. Thor responded with a smile. You can be sure of that, said Thor. Thor then walked away. When the Asgardian thunder god approached the circle and picked up one of the discs, which unfortunately for Thor, were too small to be thrown by traditional methods. Thor then smiled and assumed a baseball pitching stance. The Thunder God soon assumed the stance, and the world seemed to freeze as Thor was about to throw the disc. It's worth remembering that Thor was doing it completely naked, which means one thing he didn't have any of the strength limiters. As Thor released the disc, the air seemed to tremble as if it were made of glass, bending space with the force behind the throw, crushing any resistance, as if space itself were a sheet of paper. Boom the result was the sound of an explosion, resulting from a shock wave, which shook all of Olympus, bouncing the audience off their seats, and cracking not only the floor, but all the buildings of Olympus, some gave way to damage and fell, while others they were barely standing. When the dust cloud from the arena settled down, only a single number could be seen in the center of the arena, which surprised everyone present. Zero. It made Thor look in shock. What the does that mean I lost? Said Thor, looking at the impusa that presented the Divine Olympics. The Impusa was lying on the floor, her eyes showing a state of confusion, while it was possible to see that she was so pale, that it was possible to see her soul trying to leave her body. Meanwhile, the only one standing in the arena, who although he fell like the others, was the only one to recover and get up quickly was the creator god of the arena system Hephaestus. And at that moment, the blacksmith god was looking at Thor in shock. Zero? That means the disc never came out of the circle, said Hephaestus, starting to sweat at the meaning of it. Another person from the arena who also thought about this was Athena, who already feared Thor due to her first encounter with him, but now. For Athena, Thor was possibly a great ally or, in the worst case scenario an enemy worse than Tiffin. He may not have enough achievements, but he's already in the top 10 of the strongest existences, said Athena, worried.
A few minutes passed, and while the arena was being repaired, the impusa in charge of the event decreed the winner. Well, although there are disagreements. According to the established rules, the winner was decided by the longest distance traveled by the disc meaning Zeus's victory. Told Impusa, who was still in a state of recovery. Thor could be seen mumbling in a corner, while Balder, who was nearby, smiled nervously at his brother. With the tie, a new competition has been set to break the tie, said the Impusa. It was then that someone emerged from the gate of the Greek deities of the arena. A race from the human world, from the entrance to Olympus to the pillar's end of the world, located on the western edge of Greek territory. And the one chosen by Zeus was his son who helped our king to free himself from the clutches of Tiffin. The great Hermes, said the Impusa, gesturing to a young man. The young man, identified as Hermes, had a confident smile, although he looked like a child. The one who will compete for the Asgardians will be the brother of the Aragon, Thor. Impusa said, but there was uncertainty in her tone. Thor then took a step forward, and then the arena glowed again, this time with a portal at the exact opposite end of Thor and Hermes, showing Mount Olympus's entrance into the human world. Thor and Hermes took their positions and prepared as the countdown began. The air danced through the body of Hermes, flapping the wings on the helm and sandals, which began to flutter and cheer. Meanwhile, several lightning bolts began to erupt from Thor's body, enveloping the Asgardian thunder god in a kind of armor. When the countdown ended, time froze, and then hell derailed. Hermes and Thor shot towards the portal as if they were two comets, Thor being blue and Hermes being green. For humans, the sky was split in two by two meteors who were assumed to be the displeasure of the gods. The race had only lasted a few seconds. And the victory was overwhelming. And the winner of the race and, by extension, of the first divine Olympics, was began the Impusa. The Impusa then gestured to the first comment that had returned. Thor! shouted the Impusa. The audience cheered in response to the result, even Zeus cheering excitedly. We must do this again. It was kind of fun to pass the time, said Zeus, looking at Balder. The Asgardian god of light smiled. Maybe in the future, king of Olympus, but now it would be nice to deliver our promised prizes, said Balder, extending his hand to Zeus with a smile on his face. When Zeus remembered that he lost, and now had to hand over Cronus's sickle plus the services of the best blacksmith on Olympus, he stopped smiling and clapping, and showed a resigned face as he grumbled. Damn it, Zeus said, with a scowl of displeasure. Location. Olympus. POV. Third person. You seem restless. Something wrong brother? Asked Balder. At this moment, both the Asgardian princes were leaving the Olympus arena, having both dressed in clothes, the two were now heading to the hall, where they would get the winner's prizes. However, as they walked, Balder, being quite sensitive to negative emotions, noticed that Thor was a little uncomfortable about something. Thor answered Balder's question with a frown on his face. Yeah. It's nothing, let's get the prizes said Thor. Since the end of the first Divine Olympics, Thor was having an uneasy feeling from the moment he was in the arena. The reason for Thor's discomfort was that at the end of the Olympics, Thor briefly used the Vilgestrick Archer, and felt and saw every entity in the arena, so Thor would have a brief idea of who witnessed the Asgardian victory, and what was witnessed his and Baldur's power. Thor, however, was surprised when he sensed someone with a god power similar to himself. This divine energy signature, while small and weakened, was identified by the use of the Vilgestrick Archer. Thor recognized the entity, after all, it was not the first time he saw it. Although it was the first time he identified his weakened divine power, after all, Thor thought that this entity was born from the will of a goddess, and the emergence of affinity to the realm of birth. But after the Vilgestrick Archer, Thor knew it was far more complex than that for that reason, Thor just wanted to take Cronus's sickle, and just go towards the source of divine power similar to his own. Hey! Wait! shouted a voice from behind. Both his guardians looked towards the voice and saw someone who left them a little surprised by its presence. In the end, the man looked a lot like Thor. It was Hephaestus. Brother, who is dot 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 said Balder, looking to Thor for answers. However, Balder was surprised when he saw that Thor was not showing any emotion. Balder, can you go meet our mother? Asked Thor, looking at Hephaestus. Balder was silent as he switched his gaze between Thor and Hephaestus, but just a few seconds later, Balder looked seriously at Thor and waved, and then the young god of light of Asgard soon left in search of his mother. The entire time, both Thor and Hephaestus just stared at each other. Neither of them dared to say anything, which resulted in Hephaestus looking at Thor in curiosity, while Thor showed no visible expression, even though Thor's mind was working and processing the recent discoveries, it was at that moment that someone else chose to show up. Hephaestus! There you are! Why did you leave so fast? Nor did you say goodbye to me or Aphrodite? Asked someone. That someone was Hera, who had followed her son after the Olympics. Hera, however, froze briefly when she looked at Thor, and quickly changed her demeanor from a mother to a diplomat. 
Greetings Prince Thor, I see you've met my son Hephaestus, said Hera, waving briefly at Thor. Although Hera was confused about Thor's similarities to Hephaestus, the goddess couldn't be as straightforward with the questions due to the simple fact that Thor's show of strength left most, if not all, of the denizens of Olympus in a state of wariness. Thor, however, only briefly waved at Hera, but soon returned to face Hephaestus. I heard you were a good blacksmith. Mind if you show your talent? Asked Thor. Hephaestus just thought for a few seconds, before nodding briefly. I don't mind, but as long as you don't get in my way come on, I'll guide you to my forge said Hephaestus, starting to walk in a certain direction, towards the forge. Thor then followed the young blacksmith god. Meanwhile, Hera, confused about Hephaestus's behavior of inviting anyone other than her to his forge, soon followed the pair. A short time later, in the main forge of Olympus, Hera and Thor just watched Hephaestus work on an armor. However, the silence didn't last long, as Hera was a little uneasy at being so close to Thor, although the Norse god hadn't looked at Hera once since he entered the forge. Is this the armor Zeus asked you to make Hephaestus? Asked Hera, in curiosity. Hephaestus replied to his mother, though he didn't look away from the armor while he was working. Yes mother, the king asked for a specific set with enchanted armor and shield, said Hephaestus. So this armor is for Zeus? Asked Hera. Hephaestus, however, denied it. No mother, although Zeus asked me to forge it, it was the Mori who asked Zeus for the armor and shield, said Hephaestus. Hera was briefly confused, as the Mori are strange and reclusive entities, being mainly due to them being the agents of fate in the Greek world. It was then that at that moment, Thor chose to speak when he saw that Hephaestus was ending, only enchantment was lacking. How do you put the enchantments? asked Thor, curious. Hephaestus looked briefly at Thor, and then picked up a specific hammer and hit the armor and shield twice each, with each hit resulting in gold-colored sparks. Done, said Hephaestus. This should surprise any god who didn't know Hephaestus, after all, Hephaestus always surprised anyone with the simplicity of incantations. However, it was Hephaestus who was surprised when he saw that Thor showed no expression. You just hit it twice with a hammer, said Thor. Hephaestus froze. The reason for this was because Hephaestus had heard it before, but from someone else but still, Hephaestus remained calm and didn't show a visible reaction, and then continued with the dialogue. Indeed, said Hephaestus. Thor then quickly responded. I know enchantments for objects, and you haven't put anything I know in the armor or shield, said Thor. Do I look like a mage? Let me tell you that I am the god of the forge, not the god of magic, said Hephaestus. It was possible to see for a brief moment a look of sadness and apprehension on Hephaestus's face, as he said that as if he had been waiting for Thor's next words. Don't fuck with me, said Thor, with a brief smile. Those words made Hephaestus drop the hammer, as this dialogue was said only once when he was growing up. A dialogue between him and someone he considered the closest thing to a father figure. Eolia? Asked Hephaestus uncertainly. This made Hera freeze and turn away from Thor with a look of shock. Thor, however, just remained standing where he was, albeit still with a small smile on his face. In a way yes, said Thor. This answer somewhat confused both Hera and Hephaestus. I don't understand are you really Eolia, or not? Asked Hera. Thor looked at the goddess. Eolia was part of me. Simply put, I think you are all familiar with the avatar of the Hindus, well Eolia was my own project, however, there were still some errors in that body, a good example is that when I was Eolia, I didn't remember it was an Asgardian god, said Thor. That was a complete lie. But it was the simplest and unsuspecting solution to explain Thor's relationship with Eolia. Through the avatar. Avatars are basically incarnations of powerful deities, so that they can interact with weaker beings peacefully without causing any problems, this is due to the fact that the god's divine power is extremely reduced. With Thor's show of strength during the Olympics being at a higher level than Eolia's show of strength, it would be ideal for Thor to have him say that Eolia was just an avatar created by him. And as the first avatar, any mistakes would be attributed to the flaw in the body created with Thor's divine power. An avatar. I thought only Hindus had such a desire to incarnate with a different and weaker body than the original, said Hera, whispering to herself. But Hera's thoughts were interrupted when she noticed that her son, Hephaestus, soon approached Thor and hugged him. I thought you died in the awakening of Tiffin, said Hephaestus, his voice muffled by his coat. For Hephaestus, it didn't matter if he was an adult god, after all after a long time he had found someone who helped him and guided him from a young age, to do what he liked most be the best blacksmith. Thor seeing Hephaestus's actions didn't miss the small smile, but as soon as he felt the area of the coat where Hephaestus's face was starting to get wet, he just hugged Hephaestus with one arm, while looking briefly at Hera and extending the other arm. Free, inviting the goddess to join in the embrace to comfort Hephaestus. Hera, sensing Hephaestus's feelings soon approached quickly and began hugging Hephaestus, with Thor soon encircling Hera with his arm. And so the three stayed for some time. 
Thor patiently waited for Hephaestus to stop crying, no matter how long it lasted, as did Hera, who looked at Hephaestus with love and at Thor with uncertainty. When Hephaestus calmed down, he soon asked to withdraw from the forge quickly, Thor, knowing the roller coaster of feelings that Hephaestus went through in just a short time, accepted the request, and was soon supported by Hera. But before Hephaestus left the forge hey, boy, said Thor. Hephaestus soon looked at Thor, when he caught his attention. Although I know that at this moment you need space I'll be here when you need me, said Thor, with a smile. Thor said this to ensure that whenever Hephaestus wanted to talk he would be willing to listen, Hephaestus gave one last smile before leaving the forge. It was then that at this very moment, only Thor and Hera were present at the forge. There's something you're not saying, right? Asked Hera, frowning at Thor. Thor looked at Hera and softened his gaze. Somehow, or by chance, my avatar emitted some divine power that soon resonated with your power at some point, which coincidentally was already shaping for the birth of Hephaestus, said Thor. Hera soon froze at the answer. So does that mean that in a way you are the father? Asked Hera. Thor soon realized that Hera's tone was wary, as the goddess Hera, although she is the goddess associated with marriage, was not married, in fact, Hera was technically considered a virgin. Technically yes, said Thor. The forge's silence was instantaneous right after Thor's response, with Hera looking away and backing away a little. Your avatar. It was a great example to Hephaestus, for although I am his mother, our domains were nothing alike, in fact, I'll admit I was at some point worried about raising Hephaestus, I was worried at times if I'm a good mother, Hera said. Thor remained silent, for he knew that Hera was currently undergoing an ordeal in her vision. I never wanted any of this, but I can't deprive Hephaestus of his father figure, so can we work together? For the sake of Hephaestus? Asked Hera, fearful of the answer. Thor waited only a few seconds while looking at an apprehensive goddess, and the spot where Hephaestus had left until he made up his mind. I don't need to think too much when it comes to family. He's my son, so count on me for anything, said Thor, extending a hand to Hera. Hera looked at Thor's giant hand, and then gave a sincere smile as she shook Thor's hand. At that moment, a sort of agreement was made. Thor's avatar would be information known to few, and Thor would discreetly interact with Hephaestus and Hera at times during his stay, with the excuse that Thor was interested in Hephaestus' forging techniques, as Thor was also considered a god of blacksmiths. Nonetheless there was a small variable. At the forge doors, having just witnessed the interaction between Hephaestus, Hera, and Thor, was someone who initially came to speak with Hera, but who witnessed an interesting revelation about the three gods. Finally so it was always you said the voice. The voice was distinctly female, and right now she was looking at Thor in surprise, and most of all desire. My husband the voice turned out to be Aphrodite, who had witnessed everything from Aeolia's revelation of being Thor's avatar to Hera's silent contract. The goddess of love, daughter of Uranus, and consequently one of the most powerful goddesses on Olympus, had just found her target. Location. Future Russia Future Primorsky Territory. POV. Third person. What a Lucifer's name is she? And why is she after us? shouted someone in a panic. At this moment, a pair of devils were flying at high speed through the dense forest of the human world, fleeing from the thing they found on the edge of Shinto territory, and as soon as they saw them began a hunt that seemed to be endless. Concentrate on getting as far out of this territory as possible. When we're far enough away, we'll teleport back to the underworld and we'll be safe, said the other devil. Lucifer won't be pleased to hear that we've failed to bring one of the four fiends back, said the first devil in apprehension, already expecting Lucifer's possible punishment. Well, we at least found it. And we know now that not everyone is sealed as we were told, said the second devil. It was then that a sound was heard throughout the forest. When both devils looked towards the source of the sound bam a kind of meteor hit the first devil at high speed, full on, pushing the devil to the forest floor and making a crater. The other devil was forced back by the shockwave, beyond the cloud of dust that covered much of the forest. When the dust cloud dissipated it was possible to see the center of the crater, now with the body of the first devil hitting, in the center of the crater, and the meteor revealing to be in fact, someone. The figure turned out to be a tall, red-horned woman of the Oni race. But the horns were the only thing that reminded the Anas, as the woman's long hair is white and held back with orange spikes and a ponytail, the shade of the strands changes to aquamarine, and then blue, as the hair descends to her back. Wearing red Hakama pants and Hakama sandals and a large purple and white Neo Dasuki behind her back. Her top robe was a white sleeveless blouse with diamond-shaped designs on both sides, and a blue wave pattern on the bottom. The woman, identified as Oni, wore a confident smile as she stepped on the inert body of the first devil. The woman then pointed the weapon, which turned out to be a staff made of metal studded with metal spikes, at the second devil who was still floating in the sky, and who was looking at her with a fear never seen before. Bat! Get ready for a reckoning! Said the woman. The devil only stayed for a few seconds before starting to fly away while screaming desperately. I've never seen you before. I never did anything to you. 
Leave me alone! Shouted the devil. But then something happened the air seemed to be sucked in, pulling the devil against his will. When the devil looked back, being the origin of the strange phenomenon, he was in shock when he realized that the Oni from before was pulling air with her mouth, as if she was eating the concept that was the wind. The devil still tried to get away from her, but unfortunately for him, it was no use. When the devil got close enough the Oni swung the canum, which was the peculiar staff made of metal, and hit the devil squarely, breaking his ribs in the process, resulting in a punctured lung and heart, causing the second devil's immediate death. When silence in the forest settled, the Oni just watched what she had done, and gave a satisfied nod. It's getting a lot easier murmured the Oni. Although she appeared to be alone technically that wasn't the case. I already warned you about how too much confidence turns into arrogance, Yamato said a voice. The interesting thing was that the voice as soon as the voice spoke, the eyes of the young Oni, identified as Yamato, seemed to shine in response as if reacting to the voice. The reason for this was that the voice came from inside the young Oni's mind. You should relax more Taddy, you taught me well, it's just that. I miss a challenge because thanks to your teachings I feel like I'm strong enough to fulfill my ambition said Yamato, with a dark tone in her voice. Taddy was silent for only a few seconds, but then answered. I see you are still determined to fulfill that goal of killing them, all said Taddy. Yamato only showed a scowl of hatred. They deserve. After all, they do what they want as long as they don't have anyone to stand up against them, well now they have me said Yamato. Yamato don't put all your hate on an entire race, I've been talking about this since we merged a long time, a go Taddy said, with a warning tone. I'm sorry Taddy I can't do that, no one one of them had fun killing my family. If it wasn't for my brother's sacrifice, I would have died too said Yamato. I just hope you know what you're doing Taddy said. Yamato then broke into a smile. Be more confident you old monkey, I'll be in the top 10 of the strongest existences faster than you think, and when I do, I'll finally be able to go to the underworld, said Yamato. The young Oni then began to leave the forest, but not before burning the bodies and repairing the destroyed forest environment with magic. If they can have fun killing I'll do the same with them, said Yamato. Although Taddy didn't show or speak, he was concerned about the young Oni from many centuries ago, who helped him escape, not only had her appearance changed, but her personality had also changed drastically. Taddy just hoped that the young Oni, who became the first user of his spirit, would be okay. Because, against all odds, the most powerful of the four fiends ended up caring too much about his user location. A land islands, Avananma. POV. Third person. In a small archipelago located in the north of the world, a refuge had been built for an ancient people of Greek origin, who ended up fleeing a catastrophe. The people called themselves Eolites. And after they fled and settled down safely, thank the god they came to worship the Eolites were, more than ever, determined to spread the glory of their god. For Eolia. All hail Thor. Roared an Eolite, in full armor. Hail, Thor! Shouted several voices. The voices belonged to an army of approximately 3,000 men, all armored in armor, similar to the men who had roared first. They were all in a vast field, in the midst of the storm brewing in the sky, and what they were doing now was a soul vow, at the head of the army was Zygris, and though he couldn't be seen, he had a satisfied look in his eyes. This was due to the fact that his teaching efforts on how to fight and how to forge were not in vain. It was then that an Eolite soldier, dressed in slightly different armor, was soon at the head of the army, alongside Igris. Eolites. We once praised their own gods, but we were saved by the true one. So I'll make this promise maybe not today, not tomorrow, but we will never rest until other peoples behold the greatness of our god. Roared the soldier beside Igris. The 3,000-man army soon brandished their weapons in the air and roared in approval. It was then that Igris unsheathed his sword and raised it to the sky, before reciting two words that would be spoken with the force of thunder by the army Thor once. Roared Igris. The army looked more determined than ever. Thor. Once. Roared the army. Location. Mount Olympus Greece. I don't want, said Thor, looking at the deity in front of him. The deity in front of Thor was the god known as Dionysus, a god well known for his addiction to wine and partying. Are you sure? The orgy is something quite unforgettable on Olympus, the impuses and nymphs always surprised, said Dionysus. Dionysus's face was flushed, but not out of shame or anything like that. Turns out the wine god was already drunk. In fact it was quite rare to see Dionysus when he was not drunk or partying. Faced with Dionysus's answer, the Norse god of thunder just frowned and started to walk away. No thanks, said Thor. Dionysus soon tried to follow. Come on my friend, I'm sure said Dionysus, before being abruptly interrupted by Thor. No. Thanks, said Thor, looking at Dionysus. Dionysus seemed to understand Thor's mood, and soon turned away from the thunder god, accepting Thor's refusal to join the festivities. Thor only saw Dionysus walk away, and then shook his head in denial, as he resumed walking towards a specific place on Olympus that he started to go to more often. The Forge of Hephaestus. 
As Thor reached the forge, he saw Hera, cross-legged and sitting on an anvil. When Hera noticed Thor's presence, she waved a smile at the Thunder God of the North. Hello Thor. I thought you wouldn't come today, everyone talks about you after the Olympics, so I thought you'd attend some festivity, said Hera. Thor only responded with a smile. Festivities and I don't get along. It usually never ends well for the others, said Thor, whispering the last part. Hera, however, heard the whisper and was soon confused, until a few seconds later she looked at Thor with a knowing gaze. Drinking problems? Asked Hera. Thor had the decency to look a little embarrassed. Yes, said Thor. Hera showed no disappointment, as she had seen many deities with similar, even worse, tastes to alcohol than Thor. So how's his little project going? Asked Thor, with a smile. Hera soon became excited. I've never seen him so inspired before, that autonomous armor project you showed him moved him so much that he hasn't come out of the forge in days, he must be finishing it already, said Hera. Hera soon got up and stood by Thor's side, and then grabbed the Thunder God's hand, and soon guided him through the Great Forge, leading Thor to the spot where Hephaestus was building a design inspired by the stand that Thor created for Hydra years ago. The name Hephaestus gave the project was Simple Talos, the Guardian. I'm glad he liked his gift, said Thor. For Thor, he had gone years without having recognized Hephaestus as a son. This resulted in a small need for Thor to deliver some gifts that he was sure Hephaestus would appreciate. Thor would make a point of participating more in Hephaestus's life. Hera glanced at Thor's smile before her smile widened as the goddess blushed a little. For Hera, she was feeling at that moment a very comforting sensation, and she didn't want that feeling to end, but she knew better everything good doesn't usually last forever. By the way how long do you plan on staying? Asked Hera, in a disinterested tone, though internally that wasn't the case. Thor glanced at Hera briefly, before considering his next words. It was at that moment, both gods found the young Hephaestus anxiously working on a kind of giant armor. It was enough for Thor to see the smile on Hephaestus's face to make a decision. Well I was initially going to return with my mother and brother, however I see no reason not to extend my stay if permitted, said Thor. This made Hera happy right away. Hephaestus, who noticed the presence of his mother and the one he considered a father, soon showed a big smile. Eo I mean, Thor. The design you gave me is unique, I've never seen anything like that autonomous guardian armor. The closest thing was the Gugulana, the Anunnaki's second most powerful weapon, said Hephaestus. Before, Hephaestus believed that the pinnacle of the forge's creation was Gugulana, but when Hephaestus saw Thor's designs, he knew how wrong he was. To be the best blacksmith wasn't just about being able to succeed in crafting it was about thinking outside the box, it all boiled down to Hephaestus in one word innovation. A word that contains the inventor's curiosity, more dedication, and, above all, a lot of creativity. Well it's up to you to improve, said Thor, smiling at Hephaestus. Hephaestus could only laugh in response before heading back to work, at which time Hera looked at Hephaestus and Thor with a look of satisfaction. A few days later, Frigg decided to return to Asgard along with Baldur, Thor on the other hand, was allowed to stay on Olympus. So years passed and Thor didn't leave Olympus much, and chose to stay in the forge or the room he was given. In the meantime, countless attempts were made to get the Thunder God's attention, from flowers to nymphs in the room, to serve as servants. These attempts were attributed to a secret admirer. However, Thor just kept the gifts and went on with his life on Olympus. Until one day Thor got bored and chose to leave Olympus and go to the city that had chosen Athena as its protective goddess. And here was Thor, in the middle of the city of Athens, using runes to hide from the eyes of mortals. Just strolling around and enjoying the old times life could provide. Until something caught Thor's attention. Attention everyone. It is time for us to praise our patron goddess, asking for wisdom and prosperity for our beloved city said a voice. The voice turned out to be that of a priest, who was in front of a great temple, the main temple in the city, and completely dedicated to the goddess Athena. A group of humans began to gather around the temple, waiting for the ritual to begin. But that's not what caught Thor's attention, it was the fact that the goddess Athena was in the crowd looking at the people anxiously. Thor was confused by Athena's presence, for while rare gods interacted with humans, it was even rarer for a god to just anxiously await the actions of a mortal. It was then that the audience began to whisper vehemently, especially the men. Look at her, so beautiful, such a beauty is she really immortal? Her hair is perhaps more beautiful than the goddess Athena herself. These comments, as well as several that followed, only served to cause a frown to arise and grow on the face of the goddess Athena herself, who was present Athena could be described as many things Zeus's favorite daughter. Goddess of wisdom and strategic war. The patron goddess of the city of Athens. But if there was something that few knew, it was a small flaw in the perfect daughter of Zeus, this was due to the fact that Athena was always praised, in fact, she was the most praised goddess by her own father, but when she found someone who was praised more than her a feeling of envy clouded the wisdom goddess's mind. 
and that feeling once again arose, this time through the comments of mortals who were staring at one priestess in particular, who didn't mind the attention, and just focused on finishing the ritual. Thor just raised an eyebrow towards Athena, who hadn't noticed his presence, showing to be a little interested in the reaction Athena will give. However, he was surprised when Athena just turned and walked away from the throng of worshippers, and while it was noticeable that the frown had lessened, it was still clear Athena's displeasure towards the priestess. The Norse god of thunder could only sign disapproval, though he had a look of understanding on his face. Although, humans and gods are different in terms of power and longevity, we are very similar in terms of behavior, said Thor, still looking at Athena's exit. It was then that Thor felt, through the Viljestrick archer, the presence of another supernatural being. When Thor recognized the presence he only raised his eyebrows in surprise and a hint of confusion. Stupid. Fish, said Thor, looking at someone away from the crowd who was looking at Athena's exit. At that very moment, the ritual that was taking place was over, and most of the people dispersed, with only a few men staying behind and trying, but failing miserably, to convince the prettiest young priestess in the temple to leave with them. The priestess was the youngest in the temple and had dedicated her entire life, from birth until now, to the goddess Athena. Despite all the care with her skin, hair, and bolder clothes than the other priestesses, the young woman never failed to follow the principle of Athena's chastity, and never once failed in temptation. A few hours later, after having turned down numerous marriage proposals, the young priestess was heading towards a small river with a pitcher in her hand. When the priestess reached the river and began to fill the jug, the waters of the river began to move, it seemed that the river had created life, and from the bottom of the river, the most beautiful man that the young priestess had appeared on the surface. That man was Poseidon, and at that moment he was looking at the priestess with a seductive smile and a gaze of lust. Greetings, beautiful young one am I pleased to know your name? Said Poseidon. The young priestess was ecstatic, after all, she knew that the being in front of her was a god, and if the presentation with the waters of the river and the trident in his hands, it was a little obvious who this god was in the humble priestess's vision. Greetings, Lord Poseidon my. Name is Medusa, said the young priestess, identified as Medusa, bowing a little. The name brought a smile to Poseidon's face. Guardian, protector, is an apt name I suppose, you are the guardian bearer of such beauty that defies the principles of creation of humanity, and awake the deepest desire of men, Poseidon said, approaching the young Medusa. Medusa was shocked by the sea god's obvious flirtation, and while his flirtation over her beauty was appreciated, the young priestess knew this could be the start of something, something she didn't like because of her priestess duty, and her vow of chastity. I, I appreciate the compliment, my lord. But I must go, the ritual at the time of the wolf is important, as I will be the one leading said Medusa, quickly moving away from Poseidon. That statement was proven not to have the effect that Medusa wanted on Poseidon for the god just licked his lips. There are other more pleasurable things to do in the hour of the wolf. Leave the rituals to others, after all, priests have a lot, come with me, and I will teach you the pleasures of the body, said Poseidon. It was then that Medusa looked up in horror and threw the jar full of water at Poseidon and started running. Poseidon just grinned in amusement as the jar broke as it collided with his body harmlessly, and watched the young Medusa flee. How cute. I just wish you were watching this Athena, but again, the news gets around, so I'll probably still see that smile fall from your face, said Poseidon, who soon started following Medusa. Although a direct confrontation between gods was frowned upon by Zeus's order, nothing stood in the way of an indirect confrontation. Help. Help. Somebody help me. Shouted Medusa, as she passed the houses of the city. But when the curious eyes realized who was after the young Medusa, they just gave the young priestess pitying looks and ran to their houses and locked themselves up. Although the act could be considered cruel, who in their right mind would stand in the way of a god? They are just men and, above all, they want to live for a few more years of an already short life, avoiding bringing the wrath of a god or goddess. When Medusa realized she wouldn't get help from mortals, only one alternative crossed her mind. If humans won't help, maybe gods will grant her request. And then Medusa ran towards the temple of Athena, still insisting on screaming for help on the way. When the young priestess arrived at the temple and fell to her knees, resulting in cuts that made her knee bleed, in front of the statue of Athena, the young woman began to pray with tears in her eyes. Oh, goddess Athena, in this moment of great risk to my life, I, a soul dedicated to you, ask for your help, so that the pain does not fall on me, please, I beg you I, who has dedicated my life to you, implore for your help in this time of dire need, said Medusa. The silence was the answer to Medusa. When Medusa realized that nothing, not even a sign, had happened, she tried more fervently. Please someone anyone at least answer me. Said Medusa, tears falling freely from her eyes. It was then that a hand grabbed Medusa's hair, she was so distracted trying to make contact with some deity, that she didn't notice the sound of footsteps and pulled hard, pulling Medusa off her knees on the floor, cutting even more the already injured knees. It was Poseidon, with a mocking smile. What was that priestess? 
Do you think we're going to waste our time helping one of you humans? Ha ha ha. You humans reproduce fast. What's one more death? Asked Poseidon. The sea god soon threw the priestess away from the statue of Athena. Let's have some fun, shall we? I'm sure after a while you might even start to like it said Poseidon. The sea god soon stabbed the trident into the immaculate floor of the temple and began approaching Medusa with a look of desire. During all this time, Medusa didn't stop whispering for help, although the look already showed that she had already given up and just accepted what was going to happen. But then something happened that neither Medusa nor Poseidon had foreseen. The white hammer with gold and black accents soon flew past the priestess and slammed into Poseidon, hurling the sea god towards the statue of Athena, which shattered in the process, and the rubble buried Poseidon. The hammer was easily distinguishable as the Mjolnir, in its Uris form, which basically made Mjolnir similar in size to Marvel's Mjolnir, only with a shorter grip. Mjolnir just floated, until it flew back, into the wielder's hand Thor stood at the entrance to the temple, sporting a boring look. When Poseidon stood up and saw that it was Thor, a frown could be seen on the face of the Greek sea god. Have you lost your mind as guardian no one can interfere in the affairs of other gods from different territories? Do you want war beyond enmity with the top ten beings? Asked Poseidon screaming in a fury. Thor, however, didn't seem to mind. What if I said I already had my eye on her, and you were taking what was mine? Also, my hammer spontaneously slipped out of my hand, and coincidentally met you in his path, and, for convenience, stopped your actions that I was unaware of, said Thor, with a mocking smile. A vein could be seen pop on Poseidon's forehead. You bastard do you think this is a joke? Asked Poseidon. It was then that pressure fell on Poseidon's shoulders, who soon fell to the ground on his knees and began to sweat profusely. Thor had used the Vilgister King, again, and was now walking towards Poseidon. I don't make jokes, my uncle does. I make promises king of the Greek seas, and my current promise is simple, get out of my sight, or I'll put Mjolnir on your chest and look into your eyes when you scream in agony, as Mjolnir crushes your bones slowly due to its weight, said Thor, listlessly. The pressure in the air stopped, and when Poseidon realized it, he didn't think twice and just grabbed the trident and teleported away from the temple. Although Poseidon was annoyed, there was no way he could assert dominance against Thor, after having witnessed the Norse Thunder God display at the Divine Olympics, as well as knowing the insane weight of Mjolnir. With Poseidon's departure, the priestess for the first time spoke looks at Thor. Thank you who are you? Asked Medusa, still in shock. Thor just looked at the priestess and flashed a smile, resulting in Medusa blushing a little. Officially, I'm just someone willing to lend a hand. Unofficially, I'd like you to help me find some missing sea dogs, I'm a thunder god, unlike Zeus, I'm an Asgardian, a god from the north my name is Thor, said Thor, with a small smile. Medusa was still silent as Thor continued to introduce himself, although Medusa's silence was interpreted by Thor, that the young woman wanted something in exchange for help. If you feel threatened, I promise to help you as best I can here, take this said Thor, taking a special ring from the storage space of his necklace, and handing it to Medusa, still in shock. This ring will help you in the best way possible you can live your life in peace. Your life will be extended, unfortunately, as I didn't know how to remove this effect without a harmful side effect, but it won't be an age in divine parameters, but it will be many years yet, said Thor, with a welcoming smile. That simple welcoming smile in the middle of the night changed Medusa forever, and that could be noticed a few months later. On a road that took travelers to Athens, a group of merchants was heading towards it for the purpose of exchanging goods in the great city, until they were approached by the young Medusa, who appeared out of nowhere. Greetings. Excuse me, gentlemen, excuse me. Do you happen to have time to talk about our lord and savior Thor Odinson? Asked Medusa, looking excitedly at the merchants who were startled by the look of the attractive young priestess a look that bordered on madness and fanaticism. The merchants soon began to run, only for Medusa to run after them quickly. Hey! Don't run from the lord! Shouted Medusa. And just like that, another overly devoted, crazy, began to spread the word about a protective god of humans. And so, years passed, until years turned into decades, and decades turned into centuries. Zeus's lineage among humans was expanded, and there was a great deal of interference from the gods in the lives of mankind in the Greek world. A good example was a particular demigod Perseus, son of Zeus, and Cyclops's bane. The ambitious young man eventually became the leader of a Hellenic people, mainly due to his incredible leadership skills, prowess in combat, and most of all, the desire to be a leader. Zeus presented the young man with a private magic shield, which had the face of a woman with serpent-like hair, embedded in the face of the bronze shield. Young Perseus gives the shield the name of Algol, the demon's head, a mythical weapon capable of transforming living beings that look into the woman's eyes and the shield into stone. With this weapon, young Perseus threatened the Cyclops to build the walls and houses of the city, in which Perseus declared himself the first ruler. The city was called Mycenae, the city of the twin lion gates. 
several cities eventually evolved from existing human settlements through someone ambitious, with determination and, above all, power to back the claim. Most of the time, they were demigods. Persephone's birth and her disappearance also marked an entire year of drought in the mortal world, due to the fact that the crops were directly influenced by the mood of her mother, Demeter, who went looking for her, until she found Persephone in the arms of Hades, who had fallen in love for his niece. And so on, Greece lived and evolved under the direct influence of demigods assuming power by the right of conquest. Decades passed and the gods only commented on the conquest of their half-blood descendants, especially Zeus who always rejoiced in the deeds of his sons and descendants. Although, some still question the way Zeus presented himself to human women with a mere trick of illusion to make him look like anything, like an ant. Another thing that happened was Zeus's confrontation with Thor again, being the reason for Thor's interruption in the Poseidon subject, and his attempt to sleep with a mortal. Thor had claimed to Zeus that he had his eye on the priestess, and had wanted to sleep with her for ages, because he was enchanted by her beauty. This was obviously a complete lie on Thor's part. But the Norse god just shrugged off Poseidon's complaints, and Zeus saw this as an opportunity to humiliate his brother a little, and drop the Medusa's subject. Unfortunately for Thor, two goddesses showed displeasure with Thor's claims. Hera played dumb and asked Thor directly after the meeting was over, and the thunder god explained in detail what happened, as well as the truth except for the part that wanted Medusa's help to find the Telkines. Thor's motive for helping Medusa was simple, if the Telkines turned out not to hear the gods, then maybe, just maybe, they would hear the voices of mortals, and with a devoted priestess that was Medusa, he hoped the Telkines would at least hear the request. The other goddess who showed displeasure was Aphrodite, but it was something more childish, pouting angrily in envy of the mortal woman who was helped by her alleged future husband. Aphrodite, however, still tried to cast a feet on Medusa when she found her, trying to make the young woman fall in love with someone else, and forget about Thor. Unfortunately for Aphrodite, Thor's ring always protected young Medusa from any deed cast. The result was that Medusa just lived carefree while spreading the word about Thor, and Aphrodite slipped into a state of depression from the spell's constant failures. Thor, on the other hand, stayed in Greece for quite some time, and just a few years later he was inside a cave in central Greece, where thousands of mortals claimed the place was cursed, and the cave was filled with silk threads. The Norse god of thunder believed it was the home of the Moris. Unfortunately that wasn't the case. So how do you weave, anyway? Asked Thor, interested. In front of Thor was a giant spider. The spider responded with actions, not words, due to the lack of lips and tongue, raising its front legs. Thor just blinked and looked around, noting the amount of embroidery and fabric, all made of silk, around the cave. As Thor watched the cave, the giant spider quickly got back to work on embroidery, using four front legs, while at the same time producing silk threads. The Norse god, noticing the spider's talent for craftsmanship and the state of the cave, which demonstrated abandonment and isolation, soon broke into a smile. Hey would you like to become a goddess? Said Thor. The giant spider stopped what it was doing and looks at Thor, but unfortunately for Thor, started waving its paws quickly. Thor, not knowing what the spider was talking about, soon lost his temper and approached, making a simple rune, which while it couldn't break a curse completely, could alter a little. The giant spider glowed, and as the glow faded, an attractive young girl with short lavender hair with bangs covering the right side of her face, possessing six red monochromatic with no pupil's eyes, and sharp teeth, stood in front of Thor. However, the most notable physical feature is that the lower half of her body was still that of an enormous spider. It is worth noting that the upper half, which was human, was naked. But the young woman didn't seem to mind the state of her dress and just raised her hands, which looked more like claws and looked at them in curiosity. At the same time, Thor looked at the woman in confusion. Strange, I thought it would only be the eyes, not the entire half of the spider body tell me, do you enjoy being a spider? Asked Thor, curious and approaching the young woman. The young woman awoke from her thoughts and then nodded to Thor. It was easier to weave being a spider, but I think it's even better now. Said the young woman, looking at the body excitedly. Thor had found the young woman's excitement about her new body funny, but then he asked a question that made the young woman pay attention to him again. I'm glad you like the new body, but you still haven't answered me. I asked if you would like to be a goddess, so what your answer is? Asked Thor. Thor was interested in the young woman and her talent, after all, if a talented young woman were abandoned here, then it wouldn't hurt to take her in and take her into his pantheon. With a talent for weaving, she could give new meaning to weaving and crafting, roles that, to Thor, would be of utmost importance to the mortals of Midgard now and in the future. Are you are you a god? Asked the young woman. Thor noticed the young woman had a slight frown, so he assumed she didn't have a good experience with deities. Yes. But not the gods you hail before, I'm Thor, a god from a distant land, in the north of the world, and I have taken an interest in your talent, if you want it to be appreciated, I offer you this opportunity said Thor, holding out his hand to the young woman. 
The young woman looked at Thor's hand and thought about the day she ended up becoming a giant spider. It turns out that the young girl was just an ordinary mortal girl with a talent for weaving. A talent that ended up drawing the attention of supernatural beings for the works of art she made. Unfortunately for the young girl, this ended up resulting in a competition between her and Athena a competition she won fairly. But she ended up being cursed by Athena, turning her into a giant monster, and forcing her to run away from home, and isolate herself in a cave. If there was one thing the young woman missed, it was the praise of others for her work, crafting works of art so beautiful they could draw the attention of gods. And now, after years, the opportunity to be praised and recognized again by others was being offered in front of her. Also become a goddess? Becoming a goddess you say, what goddess? Asked the curious young woman. Thor just grinned wider. Goddess of crafts and weaving, what does that sound like to you? Obviously, I have to notify my brother, due to him being the next leader, but I know him well, so I'm sure he will probably accept my request. But what is your answer? Asked Thor. The young woman thought for just a few seconds before grabbing Thor's outstretched hand and shaking it. I accept my name is Arach and said the young woman, with a bright smile. POV Thor. Staying in Greece, although not my main objective, proved to be quite opportune, Arach and served well as a new goddess. After Baldr approved, I placed a rune on Arachin's body, so the northern cold wouldn't bother her, and sent her straight to the Eolites to have Igris take care of her. According to Igris's most recent message, the Eolites worshipped her. Mainly due to the fact that a weaver and artisan goddess was quite useful due to the cold climate of the north. I met with Medusa once every seven days for information or if she was successful with the Telkines. I was right or at least half right. The Telkines hear the prayers of mortals. Unfortunately, it seems they only respond if it's about advice, not requests. This, on the other hand, did not shake or discourage me, after all, it was the closest contact I had with the Telkines in all the years I stayed in Greece. Speaking of Greece things have changed more than I thought. For starters, I ended up partying a little in a moment of weakness, though not enough to get completely drunk. This was due to the fact that I found party mates. They were triplets daughters of Zeus, they called themselves the Cherites. Aglia. Euphrosyne. Thalia. I must say they knew how to make excellent parties and feasts. However, I liked one of them better Aglia, the youngest and most radiant of the three. I got a good impression of her and soon introduced her to Hera and Hephaestus. This resulted in a hypnotized forge god midway through the dialogue, something I noticed immediately, and soon walked away along with Hera, who had noticed Hephaestus's behavior. It ended with me and Hera just watching our son have his first crush, while I was happy that Hephaestus might have found someone who wants to spend the rest of his life with him, I was apprehensive at the same time. I thought about things like what if she's not good, what if she breaks my son's heart, and if Hephaestus is not really happy after a few years lots of what ifs lots of possibilities. So I just decided to let Hephaestus live his life, whether, in happiness or sadness, I should trust him more and support him only when extremely necessary. Although. If she ended up breaking my son's heart, I would possibly end up breaking her hair. On the other hand, grabbed my robe and she cried uncontrollably, I just patted her back comfortingly until she calmed down. Another thing was Aphrodite's behavior over the last few centuries. The goddess of love would appear out of nowhere in front of me, and would end up offering me ambrosia, along with a seductive smile. Hera, who was often around, would just pull me away from Aphrodite without any explanation. It was kind of obvious that Aphrodite had something to do with me, but what she want I had no idea, after all, the first time I interacted with her was during a banquet, and at that same banquet, she already treated me differently so I didn't know her reasons for the behavior, so I ended up choosing the most sensible choice to stay away from her. It wasn't an irrational decision, after all, from what I remember from the Greek mythology of my previous life, Aphrodite could be described as a temperamental cunning flirtatious woman, free as the wind, disloyal and, above all, crazy for attention. Obviously, she could be different, after all, this was a different universe. But would I risk it? Hell no. I was happy as I was. Back to my goal, Medusa's constant information has brought me to an island the island of Lemnos. I came here years ago, but what I only found was the same thing I found years later. Hundreds of women. However, my suspicions turned out to be true when I went down to the island. The cave system, with a combination of runes and magic circles, basically blocked my view of the Viljestrick archer, making me believe that the island only housed hundreds of women. When I found myself in the main cave I had finally found them the Talkines. All of them were the same, but they had distinct and unique names, although each of them was an expert in a certain art of forge and dark magic. Male Talkines were called Demonax, Lycus, Entius, Megalesius, Horminius, Denomenius, Skelmus, Mylas, Edibirius, Mimon, Nikon, Argerin, Chalcon, and Chrysan. The female Telkines, on the other hand, were fewer in number and were called Dexithia, Halia, Michalo, and Lysagora. 
There was no fucking way for me to know who was who, after all, they were all the same in appearance hell, even the male and female genders were hard to tell, how the hell would I know the names? Anyway, I offered them up to be taken in by the Norse pantheon, even if they chose to stay in secret in the lands of Midgard. They refused. When I asked why the answer was somewhat understandable, the last time they helped someone and allied themselves with this being, a war of catastrophic proportions took place in the heart of Greece, and they didn't want history to repeat itself. They just wanted to live and forge simple things, no longer fight or work for war. This was something I could to some extent accept, however, I wouldn't want to go back empty-handed, so I further explained my proposal and how beneficial it was to them. I tried everything, anonymity, and security, rare materials, a secret place for them to live with dignity and independence from the Asgardian government. With much insistence, I ended up convincing them to come with me. I then created several underwater caves that would serve as homes on the main island where the Eelite settlement lived. Speaking of Eelite, the armor designs intended for the city's militia were being forged and distributed to the Eelite men real fast too fucking fast, although I wanted to investigate this further, I didn't stay on the island long and soon returned to Greece. And so, years later I witnessed Hephaestus marry Aglia. And here I was, in the midst of a celebratory feast. The feast was primarily sponsored by Zeus, due to the king of Olympus, determining that Hephaestus deserved a grand celebration after numerous services to the Olympians, I obviously kept an eye on the charity of the god, who was famous for sleeping with married women. Fortunately, Zeus didn't make a single attempt. Although, in the midst of the feast full of deities, Greek supernatural beings, and even humans, something happened. A golden apple fell into the middle of the table, and that apple bore a simple inscription. Destined for the most attractive one of all time. That's vague, I said, looking at the apple with an odd look. Hera who was sitting next to me just looked at the apple with stars in her eyes. Oh. An apple like that must be juicy. I will be sure to thank the one who gave me such a gift, said Hera, licking her lips and reaching for the golden apple. The action was soon copied by two more beings. Athena and Aphrodite. The three goddesses had their hands holding the single apple. And both were frowning at each other. It's mine. Said the three goddesses firmly. When they noticed that they said the same thing at the same time, the frown seemed to increase. That doesn't say it's going to end well, the apple has an inscription that it is destined for the most beautiful, so it's me. Said Aphrodite. Athena and Hera soon scoffed. The apple does not have its name Aphrodite, if it did I would be silent. The apple only exposes that it is for the fairest, I am described as the fairest, even among mortals, my hair is said to be the fairest of all deities, so the apple is for me said Athena, crossing her arms. Now wait a minute. I am the most beautiful since before you even existed. So obviously it's for me. Since the inscription says of all time that includes before you were even born. Said Hera, with a pout. I honestly found the argument amusing, and soon went back to drinking some ambrosia as I watched the fight unfold. In the meantime, I noticed a beautiful woman with purple hair, who was sitting next to me, laughing at the exchange of words between the three goddesses. Having fun? I asked a woman with long purple hair. The woman stopped laughing and looked in my direction as she answered. What's a good party without a little discord? Said the woman, with a smile on her face. I just raised an eyebrow. Are you the blame for this? I asked, pointing to the trio of Greek goddesses, now standing and arguing heatedly. The woman just shrugged. It's just an innocent joke. Hera and Aphrodite have been arguing about who was the most beautiful goddess on Olympus for a while now, although this is the first time I've seen Athena get involved, I just made the argument resurface again with a little push, said the woman, still smiling. Well I'm sure this woman would be the female version of Uncle Loki, I'm Thor, I'm just passing through Olympus for a while. Who exactly are you? I asked, introducing myself to the strange woman as she held out her hand. The woman only glanced briefly at my hand until she shook it with a smile. Greetings Asgardian I'm Eris said the woman, now called Eris, while winking at me. Oh. And to think that Nyx's daughter was on my side where is your mother? I asked. Eris just raised an eyebrow and then dropped my hand. Don't tell me you're another one who wants to sleep with my mother, this is getting too intrusive, said Eris, arms crossed. What? Honestly, having your mother in my bed wasn't something I considered I said. This seemed to interest Eris. Oh. So why the interest? Asked Eris. How to say that without being too obvious? Well, fuck it. I heard that your birth was special, after all, you, in addition to several of your brothers and sisters, were born from Nyx alone, this is something that took my interest a little bit, as you have a little different domain from each other, I can only assume that your mother, to some degree, is connected to the eyes set, before being interrupted. Stop. Please stop. Ugh. Keep it simple, you don't need to dictate a text bigger than Zeus's ego, said Eris. I don't see how to explain what I wanted in fewer words. Never mind, I said, sweating a little. POV. Third person. 
As soon as Thor concluded the conversation with Eris, he was soon interrupted by someone who quickly approached the Norse god of thunder. Thor! shouted a voice rushing towards Thor quickly. When Thor looked to the source of the voice he saw Hera, who quickly grabbed Thor's hand and tried to pull the thunder god out of his chair. Thor found Hera's action amusing, but he was also intrigued by the reason for such an action by the goddess, who was known as a goddess of compass behavior. The thunder god briefly said goodbye to Eris, who was looking strangely with a smile at the pair of deities, and soon got up and started following Hera. It was then that Hera brought Thor closer to Aphrodite and Athena. Aphrodite had a look of approval, while Athena had a look of apprehension that bordered to fear. I nominate you, said Hera, pointing at Thor. Thor just blinked back an apathetic look, and then faced Hera. Me? For what exactly? Asked Thor. Aphrodite soon replied. I approve, Aphrodite said quickly. Thor frowned as he realized he was blatantly ignored. But luckily, Athena sensed Thor's mood, and to avoid any misunderstanding of the goddess she responded quickly. We are competing to see who is the fairest, we took some mortal who was part of the family of the cupbearer and my father's lover, but it seems that the mortal preferred Aphrodite when the goddess promised to give the mortal the power to hypnotize the fairest beautiful woman that he finds and makes her his lover, said Athena. Thor only raised an eyebrow. And what do I have to do with it? Asked Thor, confused. For Thor, the competition was over and there was no more need to contest, as it basically just showed that Athena and Hera didn't know how to lose well. I brought up that the mortal would only be interested in the gifts and not our beauty itself, basically we would be competing for the prize of whoever gives the best gift, not the most beautiful goddess. It was then that I had another idea said Athena. In the meantime, Hera and Aphrodite began to guide Thor to an isolated part, while Athena followed closely behind. What idea? Asked Thor suspiciously. It was then that Thor ended up sitting on a rock, and the three goddesses stood in front of him, all smiling. With a mortal, this method wouldn't work for the simple fact that the three of us would enchant them. This method, however, works on other deities, and Hera argued that you would be the fairest judge, due to you not being from Olympus, and therefore not prone to seeking favors or bribery, Athena said. The answer that Athena gave to Thor did not calm the Norse god in the least, and only served to increase suspicions even more, it was then that Thor's eyes widened briefly, as the three goddesses undressed at the same time, and were left completely naked. A few seconds passed, and then Aphrodite held out the golden apple she had in her hand, due to having managed to get elected by the mortal's vote earlier, to Thor, and asked a question with a seductive smile. And then who among us is the most attractive? Asked Aphrodite. Thor looked at the apple and then at the three goddesses, who began striking poses in an attempt to attract Thor's attention. Thor, however, remained apathetic. It was then that Thor surprised everyone when he took a small, shiny gold-colored pill from the storage necklace. No way can I do this soberly. Also, it's a great time to test the effectiveness of the soldier's pill. Said Thor, looking at the pill. Without hesitation, Thor then popped the pill into his mouth. Soldier's pill modly version of meat and ambrosia, said Thor, whispering the last part. It was then that Thor swallowed the pill. Two seconds later, two things happened Thor's face flushed a little. Hick and the god started to have a fit of hiccups at random, while displaying a happy smile, which showed tranquility. Thor then looked at the apple and at the naked goddesses, who were looking at Thor strangely. Do you want to know who is the most attractive? Hick all right then, here's my answer. Hick, said Thor. The Norse god then did something unthinkable. NA, for the reference meme click this link, https colon slash slash www.youtube.com slash watch question mark v equals underscore g e z m l 1 d x r 8, he undressed shamelessly, and began striking poses, while flexing his muscles, which drew the looks of shock on the part of the goddesses and interest on the part of the nymphs who were watching from afar. Hick, it's me, said Thor brazenly. Thor then proceeded to devour the golden apple in front of the three goddesses, who awoke from shock when they saw that Thor was shamelessly eating the reason for the competition. Nuo! shouted the three goddesses. Hera, Aphrodite, and Athena then soon launched themselves toward Thor, and tried to take the apple from Thor's hand, needless to say, the attempt was in vain. The nymphs, who witnessed the actions of the four deities naked, ran in search of more supernatural beings for a simple reason the nymphs liked to gossip. The years that followed were somewhat troubled, due to the fact that the mortal who received Aphrodite's favor, ended up craving the love of a married woman. Married to the king of one of the most important city-states of the Achaeans, and brother to the king of the city of Mycenae, a city founded by the hero Perseus himself. When such an action was done by the mortal, Olympus ended up being divided, as sons and daughters, or at the very least descendants, of several gods were involved. The split ended up happening, while some were displeased by the choice of the mortal favored by Aphrodite. Others supported the choice of the mortal due to being fair, moreover, in their eyes, it was just another stolen mortal woman.
The problem is that just one moon later, the most important war in all of Greek history would take place in such a chaotic way. Thor, at that moment, was not present for a simple reason Shiva had contacted Thor seeking a favor. The god of destruction asked Thor to welcome a young demigod son of Surya, a sun god. The reason for such a request was that Shiva saw that the young demigod, although he was allied with the enemies of Vishnu's chosen hero, life that the demigod had was not fair at all. Shiva had felt pity for the young demigod The young demigod was Karna. And his story was full of twists He meets his birth mother, who had abandoned him in a basket on the river Ganges, and then discovers that he is the older half-brother of those he is fighting, named Arjuna. Young Karna ended up becoming a symbol of someone who is rejected by those who were supposed to love him, but it didn't happen due to extenuating circumstances, but even so, he still grows up to be a man of exceptional abilities, willing to give his love and life as a loyal friend. Although Vishnu found Karna's life a tragedy, for the preserver it was something necessary. Shiva disagreed, and although he could not act directly, he asked a favor of someone he considered a close friend, it was there that Thor entered and resurrected Karna, bringing the young warrior to the Elite city, where he would be welcomed by the people with open arms. That day, Karna ended up crying for the reciprocal love he received. When Thor returned from Midgard again, he found the Greek pantheon in the midst of an indirect civil war indirect by the fact that the Olympians only chose the champions and sides of the war, being the Achaean and Trojan sides, and only bet on who would win. In the midst of this confusion, Thor had discovered that the youngest son of Thetis, a demigod, was participating in winning titles of best-born warrior left and right by both armies. Apollo, who had chosen the Trojan side, didn't like the son of Thetis at all, since the demigod had desecrated the temple of the Greek god of Light, which turned out to be the most important temple of Apollo. Zeus had remained neutral for two simple reasons, the first was that he was indebted to Troy when he kidnapped one of the city's princes in the past named Ganymede, and made him his personal cupbearer and lover in his spare time. The other reason was that Zeus's most prized son, Alcides, or as Zeus liked to call him, Heracles, named after his sister in a futile attempt to get Hera's attention, had already sacked Troy in the past as well. For these two reasons, Zeus assumed he should remain neutral. Hades also demonstrated neutrality, for the god of the underworld doesn't care if the Achaeans or Trojans won. Souls would have abundance in the underworld. At this moment, Thor was somewhere in what would come to be called Turkey, sitting in a chair eating and drinking some as he watched a bloody battle unfolded right in front of him. A curious fact, all the Greek city-states had the same amount of soldiers, about 10,000 men, while the city of Troy had a much smaller amount of soldiers than the hometown of the mortal who caused this war, for a woman had an advantage the structure of the city. So they had a moat just in front of the wall, to make it look bigger and avoid siege weapons. Fascinating, said Thor, as he watched the onslaught of soldiers. While Thor was unhappy with how this war came about, he assumed this war would happen sooner or later. After all, it was a fact that the king of Mycenae, Agamemnon, was a man with desires for conquest and glory, this was proven when he sacrificed his own daughter Iphigenia in a ritual, so Thor knew it was only a matter of time before the war happens as such, Thor chose not to interfere directly, nor would he choose sides. But even so, Thor had his eye on three people who had caught his attention. The first was the chosen champion of Athens, a king subordinate to Agamemnon, and extremely gifted with intelligence and battle strategy, in the way he led the army. The second was the son of Thetis, who went around killing Trojan soldiers left and right, without any difficulty, and displaying an almost divine speed in the eyes of mortals. The third it was a mortal, without any divine blood in his veins, who wound up wounding Ares in the middle of the confrontation, with a little help from Athena, who guided the spear through the confusion. Odysseus, Achilles and Diamonds which one should I recruit? Asked Thor, lost in thought. Thor quickly discarded Athena's champion, but the other two? Thor knew that Achilles would die, moreover, Thor was friends with Thetis, and during Thor's stay, he witnessed Thetis's marriage to a mortal named Peleus, while Diomed's no deity would miss a mere mortal, so the Norse god knew the choice would be between these two Achilles, the champion of the Achaeans. Diomed's, the mortal who wounded a god. Thinking about who would be the best option, as well as the easiest to recruit, Thor soon made the decision well, I'm sure if he had the opportunity, he could also hurt a god, said Thor, getting up from his chair, which soon disappeared. The Norse god then began to walk away from the battlefield, but somewhere in the midst of the confusion, there was a young man with green, almost blonde hair, with golden eyes, who enjoyed himself while swiveling his spear and stabbing or cutting whoever approached him. The youth roared for some opponent, as he mercilessly mowed down any enemy within reach of his spear, and fought with a speed never seen before. This young man was a demigod, son of Thetis, holder of a name that is still spoken even in modern times, though it is proverbially referred to as weakness considered the greatest warrior ever born. Achilles. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day.
See you in the next one.